Knowledge Lab present. This is audiobook. These Violet Delights. By Chloe Gong. Narrated by Booktube. Introduction. The year is 1926, and Shanghai hums to the tune of debauchery. A blood feud between two gangs runs the streets red, leaving the city helpless in the grip of chaos. At the heart of it all is 18-year-old Juliet Kai, a former flapper, who has returned to assume her role as the proud heir of the Scarlet Gang, a network of criminals far above the law. Their only rivals in power are the White Flowers, who have fought the Scarlets for generations. And behind every move is their heir, Roma Montagov, Juliet's first love and first betrayal. But when gangsters on both sides show signs of instability culminating in clawing their own throats out, the people start to whisper. Of a contagion, a madness. Of a monster in the shadows. As the deaths stack up, Juliet and Roma must set their guns and grudges aside and work together, for if they can't stop this mayhem, then there will be no city left for either to rule. Perfect for fans of The Last Magician and Descendant of the Crane, this heart-stopping debut is an imaginative Romeo and Juliet retelling set in 1920s Shanghai with rival gangs and a monster in the depths of the Huangpu River. Part 1 For you, dearest reader, these violent delights have violent ends, and in their triumph die, like fire and powder, which, as they kiss, consume. Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet Prologue in glittering Shanghai, a monster awakens. Its eyes snap open in the belly of the Huangpu River, jaws unhinging at once to taste the foul blood seeping into the waters. Lines of red slither through this ancient city's modern streets, lines that draw webs in the cobblestones like a network of veins, and drip by drip these veins surge into the waters, pouring the city's life essence into the mouth of another. As the night grows dark, the monster pushes itself up, eventually emerging from the waves with the leisure of a forgotten god. When it turns its head up, all that can be seen is the low-hanging, plump moon. It breathes in. It slinks closer. Its first breath transforms into a cold breeze, hurtling into the streets and brushing the ankles of those unfortunate enough to be stumbling home during the devil's hour. This place hums to the tune of debauchery. This city is filthy and deep in the thrall of unending sin, so saturated with the kiss of decadence that the sky threatens to buckle and crush all those living vivaciously beneath it in punishment. But no punishment comes, not yet. The decade is loose and the morals are looser. As the West throws its arms up in unending party, as the rest of the Middle Kingdom remains splintered among aging warlords and the remnants of imperial rule, Shanghai sits in its own little bubble of power, the Paris of the East, the New York of the West, Despite the toxin trickling from every dead-ended alleyway, this place is so, so very alive. And the monster, too, is birthed anew. Unknowingly, the people of this divided city carry on. Two men stumble out from their favorite brothel's open doors, their laughter piercing and loud. The silence of the late hour stands in sudden contrast to the roaring activity they have emerged from, and their ears struggle to adjust, ringing loudly with the transition. One is short and stout, as if he could lie on the ground and begin rolling down the sidewalk in the manner of a marble. The other is tall and gawky, his limbs drawn in right angles. With their arms swung around each other's shoulders, they stumble toward the waterfront, toward the river that runs in from the sea where merchants arrive with commodities, day in, day out. The two men are familiar with these ports, after all, when they're not frequenting jazz clubs or downing the newest shipments of wine from some foreign country. They run messages here, guard merchants here, haul stock back and forth here, all for the Scarlet Gang. They know this boardwalk like the back of their hands, even when it is presently quiet of the usual thousand different languages hollered under a thousand different flags. At this hour, there is only the muffled music from nearby bars, and the large shop banners overhead ruffling with every gust of wind, and the five white flowers talking animatedly in Russian. It is the fault of the two scarlet men for not hearing the racket sooner, but their brains are clogged with alcohol and their senses are buzzing pleasantly. By the time the white flowers are in sight, by the time the men see their rivals standing around one of the ports, passing a bottle, shoving shoulders with uproarious laughter, 
neither party can back away without losing face. The white flowers straighten up, heads tilting into the wind. We should continue walking, the short scarlet man whispers to his companion. You know what Lord Kai said about getting into another fight with the white flowers. The gawkier one only bites down on the inside of his cheeks, sucking his face in until he looks like a smug, drunk ghoul. He said we shouldn't initiate anything. He never said we couldn't get into a fight. The scarlet men speak in the dialect of their city, their tongues laid flat, and their sounds pressed tight. Even as they raise their voices with the confidence of being on home turf, they are uneasy, because it is rare now for a white flower to not know the language, sometimes their accents are indistinguishable from a Shanghai native. A fact that proves correct when one of the white flowers, grinning, bellows, well, are you trying to pick a fight? The taller scarlet man makes a low sound at the base of his throat, and aims a wad of spit at the white flowers. It lands by the shoe of the nearest. In a blink, guns upon guns, each arm raised and steady and trigger happy, ready to pull. This is a scene that no soul bats an eye toward any longer. This is a scene that is more commonplace in heady Shanghai than the smoke of opium wafting from a thick pipe. Hey! Hey! A whistle blows into the terse silence. The policeman who runs on sight only expresses annoyance at the standstill before him. He has seen this exact scene three times already within the week. He has forced rivals into jail cells and called for cleanup when the members left one another dead and pierced with bullets instead. Weary with the day, all he wants to do is go home, soak his feet in hot water, and eat the meal his wife would have left cold on the table. His hand is already itching for his baton, itching to beat some sense into these men, itching to remind these people that they have no personal grudge against the other. All that fuels them is reckless, baseless loyalty to the Kais and the Montagovs, and it would be their ruin. Do we want to break this up and go home? the policeman asks. Or do we want to come with me in? He stops abruptly. A growl is echoing from the waters. The warning that radiates from such a sound is not a deniable sensation. It is not the sort of paranoia one feels when they think they are being followed down an abandoned junction, nor is it the sort of panic that ensues when a floorboard creaks in a house thought empty. It is solid, tangible, it almost exudes a moisture into the air, a weight pressing down on bare skin. It is a threat as obvious as a gun to the face, and yet there is a moment of inaction, a moment of hesitation. The short and stout scarlet man wavers first, his eyes darting to the edge of the boardwalk. He ducks his head, peering into the murky depths, squinting to follow the choppy, rolling motions of the water's small ripples. He is just at the right height for his companion to scream and knock him down with a brutal elbow to the temple when something bursts from the river. Little black specks. As the short man falls to the ground and slams down hard, the world is raining down on him in dots, strange things he cannot quite see as his vision spins and his throat gags in nausea. He can only feel pinpricks landing on him, itching his arms, his legs, his neck, he hears his companion screaming, the white flowers roaring at one another in indecipherable Russian, then finally, the policeman shrieking in English, get it off. Get them off. The man on the ground has a thudding, thunderous heartbeat. With his forehead pressed to the boardwalk, unwilling to behold whatever is causing these terrible howls, his own pulse consumes him. It overtakes every one of his senses, and only when something thick and wet splashes against his leg does he scramble upright in horror, flailing so extremely that he kicks free a shoe and doesn't bother to fetch it. He doesn't look back as he runs. He scrubs himself free of the debris that had rained down on him, hiccuping in his desperation to breathe in, breathe in, breathe in. He doesn't look back to check what had been lurking in the waters. He doesn't look back to see if his companion needs help and he certainly doesn't look back to determine what had landed on his leg with a viscous, sticky sensation. The man only runs and runs, past the neon delight of the theaters as the last of their lights wink off, past the whispers crawling under the front doors of brothels, past the sweet dreams of merchants who sleep with piles of money underneath their mattresses. And he is long gone by the time there are only dead men lying along the ports of Shanghai, their throats torn out, and their eyes staring up at the night sky, glassy with the reflection of the moon. 1. 
September 1926. In the heart of Scarlet Gang territory, a burlesque club was the place to be. The calendar was rolling closer and closer to the end of the season, the pages of each date ripping free and blowing away quicker than the browning tree leaves. Time was both hurried and unhurried at once, the days becoming scarce yet dragging on for far too long. Workers were always hurrying somewhere, never mind whether they truly had a destination to pursue. There was always a whistle blowing in the background, there was always the constant chugging noise of trams dragging themselves along the worn tracks grooved into the streets, there was always the stench of resentment stinking up the neighborhoods and burrowing deep into the laundry that waved with the wind, like shop banners outside cramped apartment windows. Today was an exception. The clock had paused on the mid-autumn festival, the 22nd of the month, according to Western methods of daykeeping this year. Once, it was customary to light lanterns and whisper tales of tragedy, to worship what the ancestors revered with moonlight cupped in their palms. Now it was a new age, one that thought itself above its ancestors. Regardless of which territory they stood upon, the people of Shanghai had been bustling about with the spirit of modern celebration since sunrise, and at present, with the bells ringing nine times for the hour, the festivities were only getting started. Juliet Kai was surveying the club, her eyes searching for the first signs of trouble. It was dimly lit despite the abundance of twinkling chandeliers hanging from the ceiling, the atmosphere dark and murky, and wet. There was also a strange, sodden smell wafting under Juliet's nose and waves, but the poor renovations seemed not to bother the mood of those seated at various round tables scattered throughout the club. The people here would hardly take notice of a small leak in the corner when constant activity consumed their attention instead. Couples were whispering over decks of tarot cards, men were shaking one another with vigor, women were inclining their heads to gasp and shriek in recollection of whatever story was being told over the flickering gaslight. You look rather woeful. Juliet didn't immediately turn in haste to identify the voice. She didn't have to. There were very few people who would approach her speaking English to begin with, never mind English with the flat tones of a Chinese mother tongue and the accent of a French upbringing. I am. I am perpetually filled with woe. Only then did she crane her head, her lips curling up and her eyes narrowing at her cousin. Aren't you supposed to be on stage next? Rosalind Lang shrugged and crossed her arms, the jade bangles on her slender brown wrists clinking together. They cannot begin the show without me, Rosalind scoffed, so I am not worried. Juliet scanned the crowd again, this time with a target in mind. She found Kathleen, Rosalind's fraternal twin, near a table at the back of the club. Her other cousin was patiently balancing a tray full of plates, staring at a British merchant while he tried to order a drink with exaggerated gesticulations. Rosalind was under contract here to dance, Kathleen showed up to wait tables when she got bored, and took a measly wage for the fun of it. Sighing, Juliet dug out a lighter to keep her hands occupied, releasing the flame, then quenching it to the rhythm of the music gliding around the room. She waved the small silver rectangle under her cousin's nose. Want. Rosalind responded by pulling out a cigarette tucked within the folds of her clothing. You don't even smoke, she said as Juliet angled the lighter down. Why do you carry that thing around? Straight-faced, Juliet replied, you know me. Running around. Living life. Committing arson. Rosalind inhaled her first puff of smoke, then rolled her eyes. Right. A better mystery would have been where Juliet even kept the lighter. Most girls in the burlesque club, dancer or patron alike, were dressed as Rosalind was, in the fashionable cheap house sweeping through Shanghai like a wildfire. With the outrageous slit down the side revealing ankle to thigh and the high collar acting like a choke hold, the design was a blend of western flamboyance with eastern roots, and in a city of divided worlds, the women were walking metaphors. But Juliet, Juliet had been transformed through and through, the little beads of her pocketless flapper dress swishing with every movement. She stood out here, that much was certain. She was a bright, burning star, a symbolic figurehead for the vitality of the Scarlet Gang. Juliet and Rosalind both quietly turned their attention to the stage, where a woman was crooning a song in a language that neither were familiar with. The singer's voice was lovely, her dress shimmering against dark skin, 
but this was not the sort of show that this sort of cabaret was known for, and so no one save the two girls at the back was listening. You didn't tell me you would be here tonight, Rosalind said after a while, smoke escaping her mouth in a quick stream. There was betrayal in her voice, like the omission of information was out of character. The Juliet who had returned last week was not the same Juliet that her cousins had waved goodbye to four years ago, but the changes were mutual. Upon Juliet's return, before she had even set foot back into the house, she had heard talk of Rosalind's honey-coated tongue and effortless class. After four years away, Juliet's memories of the people she had left behind no longer aligned with who they had become. Nothing of her memory had withstood the test of time. This city had reshaped itself and everyone in it had continued moving forward without her, especially Rosalind. It was very last minute. Over at the back of the club, the British merchant had started pantomiming to Kathleen. Juliet gestured toward the scene with her chin. Baba is getting tired of some merchant called Walter Dexter pushing for a meeting, so I'm to hear what he wants. Sounds boring, Rosalind intoned. Her cousin always had a bite to her words, even when speaking with the driest intonation. A small smile perked at Juliet's lips. At the very least, even if Rosalind felt like a stranger, albeit a familiar one, she would always sound the same. Juliet could close her eyes and pretend they were children again, sniping at each other about the most offensive topics. She sniffed haughtily, feigning offense. We can't all be Parisian trained dancers. Tell you what, you take over my routine, and I'll be the heir to this city's underground empire. A laugh burst from Juliet, short and loud in her amusement. Her cousin was different. Everything was different. But Juliet was a fast learner. With a soft sigh, she pushed away from the wall she was leaning upon. All right, she said, her gaze latched on Kathleen. Duty calls. I'll see you at home. Rosalind let her leave with a wave, dropping the cigarette to the ground and crushing it under her high-heeled shoe. Juliet really ought to have admonished her for doing so, but the floor couldn't have gotten any dirtier than its current state, so what was the point? From the moment she stepped into this place, five different sorts of opium had probably smeared into her sols. All she could do was push through the club as gingerly as possible, hoping the maids wouldn't damage the leather of her shoes when they scrubbed them clean later tonight. I'll take it from here. Kathleen's chin jerked up in surprise, the jade pendant at her throat gleaming under the light. Rosalind used to tell her that someone was going to snatch such a precious stone if she wore it so obviously, but Kathleen liked it there. If people were to stare her throat, she always said she would rather it be because of the pendant than the bump of her Adam's apple underneath. Her startled expression quickly smoothed into a smile realizing it was Juliet sliding into the seat opposite the British merchant. Let me know if I can get anything for you, Kathleen said sweetly, in perfect, French-accented English. As she walked away, Walter Dexter's jaw dropped slack. She could understand me this whole time. You'll learn, Mr. Dexter, Juliet began, swiping the candle from the center of the table, and taking a sniff of the scented wax, that when you assume someone cannot speak English right off the bat, they tend to make fun of you. Walter blinked at her, then cocked his head. He took in her dress, her American accent, and her knowledge of his name. Juliet Kai, he concluded. I was expecting your father. The Scarlet Gang called itself a family business, but it did not stop there. The Kais were the pulsing heart, but the gang itself was a network of gangsters and smugglers and merchants and middlemen of all sorts each and every single one of them answering to Lord Kai. Less enthused foreigners would call the Scarlets a secret society. My father has no time for merchants with no credible history, Juliet replied. If it's important, I will pass along the message. Unfortunately, it appeared that Walter Dexter was far more interested in small talk than actual business. Last I heard, you had moved to become a New Yorker. Juliet dropped the candle back onto the table. The flame flickered, casting eerie shadows over the middle-aged merchant. The lighting only deepened the wrinkles in his perpetually scrunched forehead. I was only sent to the West for education, regrettably, Juliet said, leaning back into the curved couch seat. 
now I'm old enough to start contributing to the family business and whatnot, so they dragged me back kicking and screaming. The merchant didn't laugh along to her joke, as Juliet had intended. Instead, he tapped his temple, ruffling his silver patched hair. Hadn't you also returned for a brief period of time a few years ago? Juliet stiffened, her grin faltering. Behind her, a table of patrons erupted with uproarious laughter, collapsing in mirth over some comment made among themselves. The sound prickled at her neck, sweeping a hot sweat over her skin. She waited for the noise to die down, using the interruption to think fast and scramble hard. Just once, Juliet replied carefully. New York City wasn't too safe during the Great War. My family was worried. The merchant still didn't drop the subject. He made a noise of consideration. The war ended eight years ago. You were here a mere four previous. Juliet's smile dropped entirely. She pushed her bobbed hair back. Mr. Dexter, are we here to discuss your extensive knowledge of my personal life, or did this meeting actually have a purpose? Walter blanched. I apologize, Miss Kai. My son, he's your age, so I happen to know. He cut himself off upon noting Juliet's glare. He cleared his throat. I requested to meet with your father regarding a new product. Immediately, despite the vague word choice, it was quite clear what Walter Dexter was referring to. The Scarlet Gang was, first and foremost, a network of gangsters, and there was seldom a time when gangsters weren't heavily involved with the black market. If the Scarlets dominated Shanghai, it was hardly surprising that they dominated the black market, too, decided the comings and goings, decided the men who were allowed to thrive and the men who needed to drop dead. In the parts of the city that still belonged to the Chinese, the Scarlet Gang was not simply above the law, they were the law. Without the gangsters, the merchants were unprotected. Without the merchants, the gangsters would have little purpose or work. It was an ideal partnership, and one being threatened continually by the growing power of the White Flowers, the one other gang in Shanghai that actually had a chance at defeating the Scarlets in black market monopoly. After all, they had been working at it for generations. A product, um. Juliet repeated. Her eyes swiveled up absently. The performers had switched, the spotlight dimming as the first opening notes from a saxophone played. Adorned in a brilliant new costume, Rosalind sashayed into view. Remember what happened the last time the British wanted to introduce a new product into Shanghai? Walter frowned. Are you referring to the Opium Wars? Juliet examined her fingernails. Am I? You cannot possibly blame me for something that was the fault of my country. Oh, that's not how it works. It was Walter's turn to look unimpressed. He folded his hands together, as skirts swished and skin flashed on the stage behind him. Nevertheless, I require the help of the Scarlet Gang. I have bulk amounts of lernacrum to be rid of, and it is certain to be the next most desired opiate on the market. Walter cleared his throat. I believe you are seeking an upper hand right now. Juliet leaned forward. In that sudden motion, the beads on her dress clinked together frantically, clashing with the jazz in the background. And do you really think you can give us an upper hand? The constant grappling between the Scarlet Gang and the White Flowers wasn't a secret. Far from it, in fact, because the blood feud was not something that raged only between those with Kai and Montagov to their name. It was a cause that ordinary members loyal to either faction took on personally, with a fervor that could almost be supernatural. Foreigners arriving in Shanghai to do business for the first time received one warning before learning of anything else, pick a side and pick it fast. If they traded once with the Scarlet Gang, they were a Scarlet through and through. They would be embraced in Scarlet territory, and killed if they wandered into the areas where the white flowers reigned. I think, Walter said softly, that the Scarlet Gang is losing control of its own city. Juliet sat back. Underneath the table, her fists tightened until the skin over her knuckles became bloodless. For years ago, she had looked at Shanghai with glitter in her eyes, blinking at the Scarlet Gang with hope. She hadn't understood that Shanghai was a foreign city in its own country. Now she did. The British ruled a chunk. The French ruled a chunk. 
the Russian white flowers were taking over the only parts that technically remained under Chinese governance. This loss of control was a long time coming, but Juliet would rather bite off her own tongue than admit it freely to a merchant who understood nothing. We will get back to you regarding your product, Mr. Dexter, she said after a long moment, flashing an easy smile. She let out her exhale imperceptibly, releasing the tension that had tightened her stomach to the point of pain. Now, if you'll excuse me. The entire club fell into a hush, and suddenly Juliet was speaking too loudly. Walter's eyes bugged, latching onto a sight over Juliet's shoulder. I'll be, he remarked. If it isn't one of the bullshies. At the merchant's words, Juliet felt herself go ice cold. Slowly, ever so slowly, she turned around to seek Walter Dexter's line of sight, searching through the smoke and shadows dancing at the entranceway of the burlesque club. Please, don't let it be, she pleaded. Anyone but. Her vision turned hazy. For a terrifying second, the world was tilting on its axis and Juliet was barely clinging to its edge, moments away from taking a tumble. Then the floor righted itself and Juliet could breathe again. She stood and cleared her throat, concentrating all her might on sounding as bored as possible when she stated, the Montagovs emigrated far before the Bolshevik Revolution, Mr. Dexter. Before anybody could take note of her, Juliet slinked into the shadows, where the dark walls dimmed the sparkling of her dress and the soggy floorboards muffled the clicking of her heels. Her precautions were unnecessary. Everyone's gaze was firmly latched on Roma Montagov as he wound his way through the club. For once Rosalind was carrying out a performance that not a soul was paying attention to. At first glance it could have seemed like the shock emanating from the round tables was because a foreigner had walked in. But this club had many foreigners scattered throughout the crowd, and Roma, with his dark hair, dark eyes, and pale skin could have blended in among the Chinese as naturally as a white rose painted red amid poppies. It wasn't because Roma Montagov was a foreigner. It was because the air of the white flowers was wholly recognizable as an enemy on Scarlet Gang territory. From the corner of her eye, Juliet was already catching sight of movement, guns pulled from pockets and knives pointed outward, bodies stirring with animosity. Juliet stepped out of the shadows and lifted a hand to the closest table. The motion was simple, wait. The gangsters stilled, each group watching those nearby an example. They waited, pretending to go on with their conversations while Roma Montagov passed table after table, his eyes narrowed in concentration. Juliet started to creep closer. She pressed a hand to her throat and forced the lump there down, forced her breath to become even until she wasn't on the verge of panic, until she could wipe on a dazzling smile. Once, Roma would have been able to see right through her. But four years had gone by now. He had changed. So had she. Juliet reached out and touched the back of his suit jacket. Hello, stranger. Roma turned around. For a moment it seemed as if he hadn't registered the sight before him. He stared, his gaze as blank as clear glass, utterly uncomprehending. Then the sight of the scarlet heiress washed over him like a bucket of ice. Roma's lips parted with a small puff of air. The last time he'd seen her, they had been fifteen. Juliet he exclaimed automatically, but they were no longer familiar enough to use each other's first names. They hadn't been for a long while. Roma cleared his throat. Miss Kai. When did you return to Shanghai? I never left, Juliet wanted to say, but that wasn't true. Her mind had remained here, her thoughts had constantly revolved around the chaos and the injustice and the burning fury that broiled in these streets but her physical body had been shipped across the ocean a second time for safekeeping. She had hated it, hated being away so intensely that she felt the force of it burn into a fever each night when she left the parties and speakeasies. The weight of Shanghai was a steel crown nailed to her head. In another world, if she had been given a choice, perhaps she would have walked away, rejected herself as the heir to an empire of mobsters and merchants. But she never had a choice. This was her life, this was her city, these were her people, and because she loved them, she had sworn to herself a long time ago that she would do a damn good job of being who she was because she could be no one else. It's all your fault, she wanted to say. 
you're the reason I was forced away from my city. My people. My blood. I returned a while ago, Juliet lied easily, checking her hip against the vacant table to her left. Mr. Montagov, you'll have to forgive me for asking, but what are you doing here? She watched Roma move his hand ever so slightly and guessed that he was checking for the presence of his hidden weapons. She watched him take her in, slow to form words. Juliet had had time to brace herself, seven days and seven nights to enter this city and scrub her mind free of everything that had happened here between them. But whatever Roma had expected to find in this club when he walked in tonight, it certainly hadn't been Juliet. I need to speak to Lord Kai, Roma finally said, placing his hands behind his back. It's important. Juliet took a step closer. Her fingers had happened upon the lighter from within the folds of her dress again, thumbing the spark wheel while she hummed and thought. Roma said Kai like a foreign merchant, his mouth pulled wide. The Chinese and the Russians shared the same sound for Kai, Sai, like the sound of a match being struck. His butchering was intentional, an observation of the situation. She was fluent in Russian, he was fluent in Shanghai's unique dialect, and yet here they were, both speaking English with different accents like a couple of casual merchants. Switching to either of their native tongues would have been like taking a side, so they settled for a middle ground. I imagine it must be important, if you've come all the way here. Juliet shrugged, letting go of the lighter. Speak to me instead and I'll pass along the message. One heir to another, Mr. Montagov. You can trust me, can't you? It was a laughable question. Her words said one thing, but her cold, flat stare said another, one misstep while you're in my territory, and I'll kill you with my bare hands. She was the last person he would trust, and the same went the other way. But whatever it was that Roma needed, it must have been serious. He didn't argue. Can we? He gestured to the side, into the shadows and the dim corners, where there would be less of an audience turned toward them like a second show, waiting for the moment Juliet walked away so they could pounce. Thinning her lips, Juliet pivoted and waved him along to the back of the club instead. He was fast to follow, his measured steps coming closely enough that the beads of Juliet's dress clinked angrily in disturbance. She didn't know why she was bothering. She should have thrown him to the Scarlets, let them deal with him. No, she decided. He is mine to deal with. He is mine to destroy. Juliet stopped. Now it was just her and Roma Montagov in the shadows, other sounds muffled, and other sights dimmed. She rubbed her wrist, demanding her pulse slow down, as if that were within her control. Jump to it, then, she said. Roma looked around. He ducked his head before speaking, lowering his voice until Juliet had to strain to hear him. And indeed she strained, she refused to lean any closer to him than she had to. Last night, five white flowers died at the ports. Their throats had been torn out. Juliet blinked at him. And? She didn't mean to be callous, but members of both their gangs killed each other on the weekly. Juliet herself had already added to the death toll. If he was going to put the blame on her scarlets, then he was wasting his time. And, Roma said tightly, clearly biting back if you would let me finish, one of yours. As well as a municipal police officer. British. Now Juliet frowned a little, trying to recall if she had overheard anyone in the household last night muttering about a scarlet death. It was strange for both gangs to have victims on scene, given that larger killings usually happened in ambushes and stranger still for a police officer to have been pulled down too, but she wouldn't go so far as to say it was bizarre. She only raised an eyebrow at Roma, disinterested. Until, continuing onward, he said, all their wounds were self-inflicted. This wasn't a territory dispute. Juliet shook her head repeatedly to one side, making sure she hadn't misheard him. When she was certain there was nothing jammed in her ear, she exclaimed, seven dead bodies with self-inflicted wounds. Roma nodded. He placed another look over his shoulder, as if merely keeping an eye on the gangsters around the tables would prevent them from attacking him. Or perhaps he didn't care to keep an eye on them at all. Perhaps he was trying to avoid looking straight ahead at Juliet. 
I'm here to find an explanation. Does your father know anything of this? Juliet scoffed, the noise deep and resentful. Did he mean to tell her that five white flowers, one scarlet, and a police officer had met up at the ports, then torn out their own throats? It sounded like the setup of a terrible joke without a punchline. We cannot help you, Juliet stated. Any information could be crucial to discovering what happened, Miss Kai, Roma persisted. A little notch between his eyebrows always appeared like a crescent moon whenever he was irritated. It was present now. There was more to these deaths than he was letting on, he wouldn't get this worked up for an ordinary ambush. One of the dead was yours. We're not going to cooperate with the white flowers, Juliet cut in. Any false humor on her face had long disappeared. Let me make that clear before you proceed. Regardless of whether my father knows anything about last night's deaths, we will not be sharing it with you, and we will not be furthering any contact that could endanger our own business endeavors. Now, good day, sir. Roma had clearly been dismissed, and yet he remained where he stood, glaring at Juliet like there was a sour taste in his mouth. She had already turned on her heel, preparing to make her exit, when she heard Roma whisper viciously, What happened to you? She could have said anything in response. She could have chosen her words with the deathly venom she had acquired in her years away, and spat it all out. She could have reminded him of what he did four years ago, pushed the blade of guilt in until he was bleeding. But before she could open her mouth, a scream was piercing through the club, interrupting every other noise as if it operated on another frequency. The dancers on stage froze, the music was brought to a halt. What's going on? Juliet muttered. Just as she moved to investigate, Roma hissed out sharply and caught her elbow. Juliet, don't. His touch seared through her skin like a painful burn. Juliet jerked her arm away faster than if she had truly been set alight, her eyes blazing. He didn't have the right. He had lost the right to pretend he had ever wanted to protect her. Juliet marched toward the other end of the club, ignoring Roma as he followed after her. Rumbles of panic grew louder and louder, though she couldn't comprehend what was inciting such a reaction until she nudged aside the gathering crowd with an assertive push. Then she saw the man thrashing on the ground, his own fingers clawing at his thick neck. What is he doing? Juliet shrieked, lunging forward. Somebody stop him. But most of his nails were already buried deep into muscle. The man was digging with an animal-like intensity, as if there was something there something no one else could see crawling under his skin. Deeper, 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 until his fingers were wholly buried and he was pulling free tendons and veins and arteries. In the next second, the club had fallen silent completely. Nothing was audible save the labored breathing of the short and stout man who had collapsed on the floor, his throat torn into pieces, and his hands dripping with blood. 2. The silence turned to screams, the screams turned to chaos, and Juliet rolled up her shiny sleeves, her lips thinned and her brow furrowed. Mr. Montagov, she said over the uproar, you need to leave. Juliet marched forward, waving for two nearby scarlet men to come close. They obliged, but not without a strange expression, which Juliet almost took offense at, until two beats later, she blinked and looked over her shoulder to find Roma still standing there, very much not leaving. Instead, he surged past her, acting like he owned the place, then dropped to a crouch near the dying man, squinting at the man's shoes, of all things. For crying out loud, Juliet muttered under her breath. She pointed the two scarlets at Roma escort him out. It was what they had been waiting for. One of the scarlets immediately pushed the air of the white flowers roughly, forcing Roma to spring to his feet with a hiss so he wouldn't tumble onto the bloody floor. I said escort him. Juliet snapped at the scarlet. It's the mid-autumn festival. Don't be a brute. But, Miss Kai. Don't you see? Roma cut in coldly, pointing a finger at the dying man. He turned to face Juliet, his jaw tight, eyes level on her, only her. He acted like nobody else was present in his line of sight save for Juliet, like the two men weren't glaring daggers at him, like the whole club wasn't screaming in havoc running in circles about the growing puddle of blood. 
this is exactly what happened last night. It is not a one-off incident, it is madness. Juliet sighed, waving a floppy wrist. The two scarlet men took a proper hold of Roma's shoulders, and Roma swallowed his words with an audible snap from his jaw. He wouldn't make a scene in scarlet territory. He was already lucky to be leaving without a bullet hole in his back. He knew this. It was the only reason why he tolerated being manhandled by men he might have killed on the streets. Thank you for being so understanding, she simpered. Roma said nothing as he was hauled from her sight. Juliet watched him, eyes narrowed, and only when she was certain he had been pushed out the door of the burlesque club did she focus on the mess in front of her, stepping forward with a sigh and kneeling gingerly beside the dying man. There was no saving with a wound like this. It was still spurting blood, pulsating red puddles onto the floor. Blood was certainly seeping into the fabric of her dress, but Juliet hardly felt it. The man was trying to say something. Juliet couldn't hear what. You'd do well to put him out of his misery. Walter Dexter had found his way near the scene, and was now peering over Juliet's shoulder with an almost quizzical expression. He remained unmoving even when the waitresses started pushing the crowd back and cordoning the area off, yelling for the onlookers to scatter. Irritatingly, none of the scarlet men bothered to haul Walter away, he had a look to him that made it seem like he needed to be here. Juliet had met plenty of men like him in America, men who assumed they had the right to go wherever they wished, because the world had been built to favor their civilized etiquette. That sort of confidence knew no bounds. Hush, Juliet snapped, leaning her ear closer to the dying man. If he had last words, he deserved to be heard. I've seen this before, it's the lunacy of an addict. Perhaps methamphetamine or... Hush. Juliet focused until she could hear the sounds coming from the dying man's mouth, focused until the hysteria around her faded to background noise. Gwai. 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 Head spinning, Juliet ran through every word that resembled what the man was chanting. The only one that made sense was. Monster, she asked him, gripping his shoulder. Is that what you mean to say? The man stilled. His gaze was startlingly clear for the briefest second. Then, in a fast garble, he said, Hua be you dan Xing. After that one breath, one exhale, one warning, his eyes glazed over. Juliet reached out, numb, and brushed his eyelids closed. Before she could quite register the dead man's words, Kathleen had already stepped forward to cover him with a tablecloth. Only his feet were sticking out, in those tattered shoes that Roma had been staring at. They're mismatched, Juliet noted suddenly. One shoe was sleek and shined, still glinting with its last polish, the other was far too small, and a different color entirely, the fabric held together by a thin piece of string wrapped thrice around the toes. Strange. What was that? What did he say? Walter was still lurking at her elbow. He didn't seem to understand that this was his cue to remove himself. He didn't seem to care that Juliet was staring forward in a state of stupefaction, wondering how Roma had timed his visit to coincide with this death. Misfortunes tend to come all at once, Juliet translated when she finally jolted back to the frenzy of the situation. Walter Dexter only looked at her blankly, trying to understand why a dying man would say something so convoluted. He didn't understand the Chinese and their love for proverbs. His mouth was opening, likely to give another spiel about his extensive knowledge regarding the world of drugs, another plug about the dangers of purchasing products from those he deemed untrustworthy, but Juliet held up a finger to stop him. If she was certain of anything, it was that these weren't the last words of a man who took too many drugs. This was the final warning of a man who had seen something he shouldn't have. Let me correct myself. You British already have an appropriate translation, she said. When it rains, it pours. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. High above the leaky pipes and moldy carpeting of the white flower house, Elisa Montagova was perched upon a wooden beam in the ceiling rafters, her chin pressed against the flat of her knees as she eavesdropped on the meeting below. The Montagovs didn't live in a big, flashy residence like their money bags could afford. They preferred to stay in the heart of it all one and the same with the dirt-smeared faces picking up trash on the streets. 
From the outside, their living space looked identical to the row of apartments along this bustling city street. On the inside, they had transformed what used to be an apartment complex into one big jigsaw puzzle of rooms and offices and staircases, maintaining the place not with servants or maids, but with hierarchy. It wasn't just the Montagovs who lived here, but any white flower who held some role in the gang, and among the assortment of people coming and going in this house, within the walls and outside them, there was an order. Lord Montagov reigned at the top and Roma, at least in name, stood second, but below, roles were constantly changing, determined by will rather than blood. Where the Scarlet Gang depended on relationships, on which family went the farthest back before this country crumbled from its imperial throne, the white flowers operated on chaos, on constant movement. But the climb to power was one of choice, and those who remained low within the gang did so by their own desire. The point of becoming a white flower wasn't power and riches. It was the knowing that they could walk at any point if they didn't like the orders given by the Montagovs. It was a fist to the chest, a lock of eyes, a nod of understanding, like that. The Russian refugees filing into Shanghai would do anything to join the ranks of the white flowers, anything to reunite with the sense of belonging they had left behind when the Bolsheviks came knocking. For the men, at least. The Russian women unfortunate enough not to be born into the white flowers picked up jobs as dancers and mistresses. Just last week, Elisa had overheard a British woman crying about a state of emergency in the international settlement of families being broken up by pretty faces from Siberia who had no fortune, only face and figure, and a will to live. The refugees had to do what they must. Moral compasses meant nothing in the face of starvation. Elisa jolted. The man she had been eavesdropping on had suddenly started whispering. The abrupt change in volume drew her attention back to the meeting below. The political factions have made one too many snide remarks, a gruff voice muttered. It is almost certain that the politicians are engineering the madness, but it's hard to say at this point in time whether the Kuomintang or the communists are responsible. Many sources say Zhang Gutai, though, well, I hesitate to believe it. Another voice added wryly, please, Zhang Gutai is so bad at being secretary general of the Communist Party that he printed the wrong date on one of their meeting posters. Elisa could see three men seated opposite her father through the thin mesh that lined the ceiling space. Without risking a fall from the rafters, she couldn't quite pick out their features, but the accented Russian gave away enough. They were Chinese spies. What do we know of their methods? How does this madness spread? That was her father now, his slow voice as distinctive as nails against a chalkboard. Lord Montagov spoke in such a commandeering manner that it felt like a sin to deny him your full attention. One of the Chinese men cleared his throat. He was wringing his hands on his shirt so aggressively that Elisa leaned forward into the rafters, squinting through the mesh to see if she was mistaking the motion. A monster. Elisa almost toppled over. Her hands came down on the bean just in time to right herself, letting out a small exhale in relief. I beg your pardon? We cannot confirm anything regarding the source of the madness except for one thing, the third and final man said. It is linked to sightings of a monster. I saw it myself. I saw silver eyes in the Huangpu River, blinking in a way no man could. Enough, enough, Lord Montagov interrupted. His tone was rough impatient with the turn this information briefing had taken. I have no interest in hearing nonsense on a monster. If that is all, I look forward to reconvening at our next meeting. Frowning, Elisa scuttled along the beams, following the men as they left. She was already twelve years old, but she was tiny, always darting from shadow to shadow in the manner of a wild rodent. As the door shut below, she hopped from one ceiling beam to another until she was pressed flat directly above the men. He looked afraid, one remarked quietly. The man in the middle hushed him, except the words had already been said and birthed into the world, becoming sharp arrows tearing through the room with no target in mind, only destruction. The men pulled their coats tightly around their bodies and left the broiling, chaotic mess of the Montagov house behind them. Elisa, however, remained in her little nook up in the ceiling. Fear. That was something she didn't think her father knew how to feel anymore. 
fear was a concept for the men without guns. Fear was reserved for people like Elisa, small and slight, and always looking over her shoulder. If Lord Montagov was afraid, the rules were changing. Elisa leaped from the ceiling and sprinted off. 3. The moment Juliet barreled into the hallway, shoving the last pin into her hair, she already knew she was too late. It was partly the maid's fault for not waking her when she was supposed to and partly Juliet's own fault for failing to get up with the sunrise, as she had been attempting since her arrival back in Shanghai. Those sparse moments just as the sky was brightening, and before the rest of the household rumbled to life, were the most peaceful few minutes one could get in this house. The day she started early enough to snatch a breath of cold air, and a gulp of utter, complete silence on her balcony were her favorites. She could trail through the house with no one to bother her, skipping into the kitchen, and snatching whatever she liked from the cooks, then taking whichever seat she pleased on the empty dining table. Depending on how fast she chewed, she might even have a while to spend in the living room, the windows thrown open to let in the tunes of early birdsong. The days when she failed to scramble out of her covers fast enough, on other the hand, meant grumpily sitting through the morning meals with the rest of the household. Juliet stopped outside her father's office door now, cursing under her breath. Today hadn't only been a matter of avoiding her distant relatives. She had wanted to poke her nose into one of Lord Kai's meetings. The door opened swiftly. Juliet took a step back, trying to look natural. Definitely too late. Juliet. Lord Kai peered at her, frowning. It's so early. Why are you awake? Juliet placed her hands under her chin, the picture of innocence. I heard we had an esteemed visitor. I thought I'd come offer my greetings. The aforementioned visitor raised a eyebrow. He was a nationalist, but whether or not he was truly esteemed was hard to determine when he was dressed merely in a western suit, void of the decorations his Kuomintang military uniform might bear on the collar. The Scarlet Gang had been friendly with the nationalists, the Kuomintang ever since the Kuomintang's founding as a political party. Of late, relations had become even friendlier to combat the rise of their communist allies. Juliet had been home for only a week, and she had already watched her father take at least five different meetings with the harried nationalists who wanted gangster support. Each time she had been just too late to slip in without acting like an embarrassment, and settled for idling outside the door instead to catch whatever bits and pieces she could. The nationalists were afraid, that much she knew. The budding Communist Party of China was encouraging its members to join the Kuomintang in a show of cooperation with the nationalists, only instead of demonstrating cooperation, the growing influence of communist numbers within the Kuomintang was starting to threaten the nationalists. Such scandal was the talk of the country, but especially in Shanghai, a lawless place where governments came both to be born and to die. That's very kind of you, Juliet but Mr. Chiao has another meeting to hurry to. Lord Kai gestured for a servant to lead the nationalist out. Mr. Chiao politely tipped his hat, and Juliet smiled tightly, swallowing back her sigh. It wouldn't hurt to let me sit in on one meeting, Baba, she said as soon as Mr. Chiao was out of sight. You're supposed to be teaching me. I can teach you slowly, Lord Kai replied, shaking his head. You don't want to get involved in politics yet. It's boring business. But it was relevant business, especially if the Scarlet Gang spent so much damn time entertaining these factions. Especially if Lord Kai had hardly blinked an eye last night, when Juliet told him the heir of the White Flowers had pranced into their most central burlesque club, telling her that he had been made aware already, and they would speak of it in the morning. Let's go to the breakfast table, hm, her father said. He placed his hand on the back of Juliet's neck guiding her down the stairs as if she were at risk of running off. We can talk about last night, too. Breakfast would be delightful, Juliet muttered. In truth, the clamor of morning meals gave her a headache. There was something about mornings in this household particularly that made Juliet uneasy. No matter what it was that her relatives discussed, no matter how mundane, like their speculation on the rising prices of rice, their words dripped with scheming and relentless wit. Everything they discussed seemed more fitting for the late night, when the maids retired to their rooms and the dark crawled in on the polished wood floors. 
Juliet, darling, an aunt crowed the moment she and her father approached the table. Did you sleep well? Yes, a eh, Juliet replied tightly, taking a seat. I slept very well. Did you cut your hair again? You must have. I don't remember it being this short. As if her relatives weren't vexing enough, there were also so many of them coming in and out of the Kai household for Juliet to care very much about any of them. Rosalind and Kathleen were duly her closest cousins and only friends, and that was all she needed. Everybody else was merely a name, and a relation she had to remember in case she needed something from them one day. This aunt jabbering in her ear now was far too distant to be useful at any point in the future, so distant that Juliet had to stop for a second to wonder why she was even at the breakfast table. Did Gia, for God's sake, let the kid breathe? Juliet's head jerked up, grinning at the voice who had chimed in from the end of the table. On second thought, there was only one exception to her apathy, Mr. Lee, her favorite uncle. Sia Sia, she mouthed. Mr. Lee merely raised his teacup to her thanks, a twinkle in his eye. Her aunt huffed, but she ceased talking. Juliet turned in her father's direction. So, Baba, last night, she started. If talk is to be believed, one of our men met up with five white flowers at the ports, then ripped his own throat out. What do you make of it? Lord Kai made a thoughtful noise from the head of the long rectangular table, then rubbed the bridge of his nose, sighing deeply. Juliet wondered when her father had last gotten a full night's sleep, uninterrupted by worrying and meetings. His exhaustion was invisible to the untrained eye, but Juliet knew. Juliet always knew. Or maybe he was just tired of having to sit at the head of this table, hearing everyone's gossip first thing in the morning. Before Juliet left, their dining table had been round, as Chinese tables rightfully should be. She suspected they had switched it up only to appeal to the Western visitors who came through the Kai house for meetings, but the result was messy, family members unable to talk to who they wished, as they could if everybody was seated around a circle. Baba, Juliet prompted, though she knew he was still thinking. It was only that her father was a man of few words and Juliet was a girl, who couldn't stand silence. Even while it was hectic all around them, with staff bustling in and out of the kitchen, a meal underway, and the table accommodating various conversations at oscillating volumes, she couldn't stand it when her father let her question draw out in lieu of answering immediately. The matter was, even if he indulged her now, Lord Kai was only pretending to be concerned about an alleged madness. Juliet could tell, this was child's play atop the already monstrous list plaguing her father's attention. After all, who would care for rumors of strange creatures rising from the waters of this city when the nationalists and communists were rising too, guns poised and armies ready to march? And that was all Roma Montagov revealed. Lord Kai finally asked. Juliet flinched. She couldn't help it. She had spent four years recoiling at the mere thought of Roma that hearing his name aloud, spoken from her own father, no less, felt like something improper. Yes. Her father tapped his fingers on the table slowly. I suspect he knows more, Juliet continued, but he was careful. Lord Kai fell into silence once again, allowing the noise around him to lull and pick up and fall. Juliet wondered whether his mind was elsewhere at this very moment. He had been terribly blasé at news of the white flower air on their territory, after all. Given how important the blood feud was to the Scarlet Gang, it only showed how much more consequential politics had become if Lord Kai was barely giving Roma Montagov's infraction any serious consideration. Before her father had the chance to resume speaking, however, the swinging doors to the kitchen slammed open, the sound ricocheting so loudly that the aunt seated next to Juliet knocked her cup of tea over. If we suspect the white flowers have more information than we do, what are we doing sitting around discussing it? Juliet gritted her teeth, mopping the tea from her dress. It was only Tyler Kai who entered, the most irritating among her first cousins. Despite their shared age, in her four years away, it was as if he hadn't grown up at all. He still made crude jokes and expected others to kneel before him. If he could, he would demand the globe turn in the other direction simply because he thought it was a more efficient way to turn, no matter how unrealistic. 
Do you make a habit out of eavesdropping at doors instead of coming in? Juliet sneered, but her scathing remark went unappreciated. Their relatives jumped to their feet at the sight of Tyler, hurrying to fetch a chair, to fetch more tea, to fetch another plate, probably one engraved with gold and crusted with crystal. Despite Juliet's position as the heir to the Scarlet Gang, they would never simper after her in such a manner. She was a girl. In their eyes, no matter how legitimate, she would never be good enough. It seemed simple to me, Tyler continued. He slid into a seat, leaning back like it was a throne. It's about time we show the white flowers who really holds the power in this city. Let's demand they hand over what they know. We have the numbers, the weaponry, an obscure uncle chimed in, nodding and stroking his beard. The politicians will side with us, the aunt beside Juliet added. They have to. They cannot tolerate the white flowers. A territory battle is not wise. Finally, Juliet thought, turning toward the older second cousin who had spoken up, a sensible voice at this table. But with your expertise, Tyler, who knows how much farther we could advance our turf lines. Juliet's fists tightened. Never mind. Here is what we shall do, Tyler started excitedly. Juliet cast a glance at her father, but he seemed content to merely consume his food. Since her return, Tyler had been finding every opportunity to upstage her, whether in conversation or through sidelong remarks. But each time, Lord Kai had stepped in to shut him down, to remind these aunts and uncles in as few words as possible to remember who the true heir was, to remember that this favoritism they were showing for Tyler would take them nowhere. Only this time Lord Kai remained silent. Juliet didn't know if he was abstaining because he found his nephew's tactics to be laughable, or because he was actually taking Tyler seriously. Her stomach twisted, broiling with acid at the thought. And it's not as if the foreign powers can complain, Tyler was saying. If these deaths have been self-inflicted, it is a matter that could affect anyone. It is a matter of our people, who require our help to defend them. If we do not act now and take back the city for their sake, then what good are we? Are we to suffer another century of humiliation? The voices at the table sounded their approval. Runts of praise, wrinkled, scarred thumbs stuck into the air, claps of esteem against Tyler's shoulder. Only Mr. Lee and her father were quiet, their faces held neutral, but that wasn't enough. Juliet threw her utensils down, shattering her fine porcelain chopsticks into four pieces. You want to deliver yourself into white flower territory? She stood up, smoothed down her dress. Be my guest. I'll have a maid untangle your guts when they send them back in a box. With her relatives too shocked to protest, Juliet marched out of the kitchen. Her heart was thudding despite her calm demeanor, afraid that maybe this time she really had pushed it too far. As soon as she was in the hallway, she paused and glanced over her shoulder, watching the kitchen doors settle. The wood of those doors, imported from some distant nation, was carved with traditional Chinese calligraphy, poems that Juliet had memorized a long time ago. This house was a mirror of their city. It was a fusion of East and West, unable to let go of the old, but desperate to mimic the new, and just like the city, the architecture of this house didn't quite meld well with itself. The beautiful but ill-fitted kitchen doors flew open again. Juliet barely flinched. She had expected this. Juliet. A word. It was only Tyler who had followed her out, a frown etched onto his face. He had the same pointed chin that Juliet had, the same single dimple at the lower left corner of his lip that appeared in times of distress. How they looked so alike was beyond her. In every family portrait, Juliet and Tyler were always placed together, cooted as if they were twins instead of cousins. But Juliet and Tyler had never gotten along. Not even in the cot, when they played with toy guns instead of real ones, and Tyler never missed a single wooden pellet aimed at Juliet's head. What is it? Tyler stopped. He folded his arms. What is your problem? Juliet rolled her eyes. My problem? Yes, your problem. It's not amusing when you shut down my every idea. You're not stupid, Tyler, so stop acting like it, Juliet interrupted. 
I hate the Montagovs just as you do. We all hate them, so much that we bleed from it. But now is not the time to be waging a territory war. Not with our city already carved up by the foreigners. A beat passed. Stupid. Tyler had missed the point entirely, and yet he was offended. Her cousin was a boy with steel skin and a heart of glass. Ever since he lost both his parents too young, he had become this faux scarlet anarchist, pretentious for the sake of it, wild within the gang for no reason, and because like called to like, his only friends were those who hung around hoping to shortcut a connection with the Kais. Everyone tiptoed around him, happy to throw choreographed punches, and let him think himself powerful when each hit bounced off, but give him one sudden kick down his middle, and he would shatter. I hardly think defending our livelihood is stupid, Tyler went on. I hardly think that reclaiming our country from those Russians. The problem was that Tyler thought his way was the only correct way. She wished she could find it in herself to not fault him. After all, Tyler was just like her, he wanted what was best for the Scarlet Gang. Only in his mind, he was what was best for the Scarlet Gang. Juliet didn't want to continue listening. She turned on her heel and started to leave. Until her cousin snagged her by the wrist. What kind of an heir are you? Quick as a flash, Tyler slammed her into the wall. He kept one hand scrunched against her left sleeve, and the rest of his arm splayed against her clavicle, pushing just enough to make a threat. Let me go, Juliet hissed, jerking against his hold, right now. Tyler did not. The Scarlet Gang is supposed to be your first priority. Our people should be your first priority. Watch yourself. You know what I think it is? Tyler breathed in, his nostrils flaring, deep wrinkles marring his face into absolute disgust. I've heard the rumors. I don't think you hate the Montagovs at all. I think you're trying to protect Roma Montagov. Juliet became utterly still. It was not fear that overtook her, nor any sort of intimidation that Tyler had sought to incite. It was indignation, and then hot, hot anger. She would tear Roma Montagov apart before she ever protected him again. Her right hand jerked up, fist clenched, wrist hard, knuckles braced, and made centered, perfect contact with her cousin's cheek. There was a moment when he could not react. A moment when Tyler was only blinking, the lines of his pale face trembling in shock. Then he stumbled, letting go of Juliet, and whipping his head to look at her, hatred stamped into the hollows of his eyes. A red slash bruised the line of his cheekbone, the result of Juliet's glittering ring scraping through skin. It wasn't enough. Protecting Roma Montagov, she echoed. Tyler froze. He hadn't had a chance to move, hardly had a chance to take the slightest step back, before Juliet had pulled forth a knife from her pocket. She pressed it right to his cut and hissed, We are not kids anymore, Tyler and if you are to threaten me with outrageous accusations, then you will answer for them. A soft laugh. How so? Tyler rasped. Will you kill me right here in the hallway? Ten paces away from the breakfast table? Juliet pressed the knife in deeper. A stream of blood started down her cousin's cheek, trailed into the lines of her palm, dripped along her arm. Tyler had stopped laughing. I am the heir of the Scarlet Gang. Juliet said. Her voice had grown just as sharp as her weapon. And believe me, Tongdi, I will kill you before I let you take it from me. She shoved Tyler off the blade of her knife then, the metal flashing red. He said nothing more, offered no response save a blank stare. Juliet turned, her heeled shoes twisting grooves into the carpeting, and walked off. Four. There's nothing here. Bristling. Roma Montagov continued his search, prodding his fingers into the cracks along the boardwalk. Shut up. Keep looking. They had yet to find anything of note, that much was true, but the sun was still high in the sky. White hot rays reflected off the waves quietly knocking against the boardwalk, blinding anyone who looked out for too long. Roma kept his back turned to the murky, green-yellow waters. While it was easy to keep the bright sun out of his field of vision, it was much harder to keep at bay the incessant, annoying voice jabbering on behind him. Roma Roma. Roma. 
By God, Mudak. What? What is it? The hours left in the day were aplenty, and Roma wasn't particularly fond of stepping foot back into his house without finding something for his father. He shuddered at the thought, imagining the thunderous disappointment that would pockmark his father's every word. You can take care of this one, can't you? Lord Montagoff had asked this morning, clapping a hand over Roma's shoulder. To a casual observer, it may have looked like Lord Montagoff had applied a fatherly gesture of reassurance. In reality, the clap had been so forceful that Roma still bore a red mark on his shoulder. Don't let me down this time, son, Lord Montagov whispered. It was always that word. Son. As if it even meant anything. As if Roma hadn't been replaced by Dmitri Voronin, not in name, but in favoritism, relegated to the roles that Dmitri was too busy to take. Roma hadn't been given this task because his father trusted him greatly. He was given it because the Scarlet Gang was no longer the only problem plaguing their business, because the foreigners in Shanghai were trying to replace the White Flowers as the new force against the Scarlets, because the Communists were being a constant nuisance trying to recruit within White Flower ranks. While Roma scoured the ground for a few bloodstains, Lord Montagov and Dmitri were busy dealing with politicians. They were fending back the tireless British and Americans and French, all of whom were drooling for a slice of the cake that was the Middle Kingdom, most hungry for Shanghai, the city above the sea. When was the last time his father had actually ordered him to go near the Scarlet Gang as he had last night, like a proper heir who was to know the enemy? It wasn't because Lord Montagov wanted to protect him from the blood feud. That had long passed. It was because his father didn't trust him one bit. Giving Roma this task was a last resort. A long, irritated groan brought Roma's attention back to the present. You know, he snapped, turning around and shielding his eyes from the light reflecting off the river, you chose to come today. Marshal Seo only grinned, finally satisfied now that he had drawn Roma's attention. Rather than shooting back a quip, Marshal stuck his hands into the pockets of his neatly pressed slacks and casually changed the topic, jumping from Russian to rapid, ranting Korean. Roma managed to pick up a few words here and there, blood, and unpleasant, and police, but the rest were lost, adrift in the void of lessons he had skipped when he was young. Mars, Roma interrupted. You're going to have to switch. I don't have the brain for translation today. In response, Marshall only continued with his tirade. His hands were gesticulating with his usual vigor and enthusiasm, moving at the same pace as he was speaking. Syllable stacked upon syllable until Roma wasn't quite certain if Marshall was still using his native tongue, or merely making noises to express his frustration. The general gist is that it smells like fish here, a third, quieter, wearier voice sighed from a few paces away, but you don't want to know the sort of analogies he's spouting to make the comparison. The translation came from Benedict Montagov, Roma's cousin, and the third person who closed off their trio within the white flowers. His blonde head could usually be found bent toward Marshall's dark one, a matching pair conspiring some move to aid Roma's next task. Presently it was inclined downward, his attention focused on examining a stack of crates as tall as he was. He was so focused that he was unmoving, only his eyes scanning left and right. Roma folded his arms. Let's be thankful it smells like fish, and not dead bodies. His cousin snorted, but otherwise did not react. Benedict was like that. He always seemed to be simmering over something right below the surface, but nothing ever came through, no matter how close he came to it. Those on the streets described him as the watered-down version of Roma, which Benedict embraced only because such an association with Roma, no matter how disparaging, gave him power. Those who knew him better thought him to have two brains and two hearts. He was always feeling too much but thinking twice as fast, a modestly loaded grenade, putting its own pin in any time someone tried to pull it out. Marshall did not have the same control. Marshall Seo was a raging, two-ton explosive. He had finally stopped with his fishy comparisons, at least, dropping to a sudden crouch by the water. Marshall always moved like this, like the world was on the verge of ending, and he needed to jam as many movements in as possible. 
ever since Marshall had been embroiled in a scandal involving another boy and a dark storage closet, he had learned to hit first and hit fast, countering the talk that followed him around with a Cheshire cat grin on his face. If he was tougher, then he could not be beat down. If he was more vicious, then nobody could drop their judgment upon him without fearing a knife pressed to their throat. Roma. Benedict waved his hand, and Roma strode over to his cousin, hoping that he had found something. After last night, the bodies had been removed and sent to the local hospital for storage, but the blood-splattered crime scene remained. Roma, Marshall, and Benedict needed to put together why five of their men, a scarlet, and a British police officer would tear out their own throats, only the crime scene was so sparse of clues that obtaining answers felt like a lost cause. What is it? Roma asked. Did you find something? Benedict looked up. No. Roma deflated. This is the second time we have searched the scene from corner to corner, Benedict went on. I think we've done all we can, there cannot be anything we have missed. But other than examining the crime scene, what else could they do to understand this madness? There was nobody to question, no witnesses to interrogate, no backstories to piece together. When there was no perpetrator to a crime, when the victims did such a terrible thing to themselves, how were answers supposed to be found? Over by the water, Marshall sighed loudly in exasperation resting his elbow on his knee, his head on his fist. Did you hear about an alleged second incident last night? He asked, switching to Chinese now. There are whispers, but I received nothing conclusive. Roma pretended to find something of particular interest in the cracks along the ground. He couldn't hold back his grimace when he remarked, the whispers are true. I happen to be there. Oh, excellent. Marshall bolted upright clapped his hands together. Well, not quite excellent for the dead victim, but excellent. Let us go search the new scene instead and hope it will offer more information than this foul smelling. We cannot, Roma cut in. It occurred within Scarlet territory. Marshall stopped pumping his fists, disheartened. Benedict, on the other hand, was watching his cousin curiously. And how did you happen to be on Scarlet territory, he asked without bringing us, no less was the unspoken addition tacked to the end of his question. My father sent me to obtain answers from the Scarlets, Roma replied. That was half a truth. Lord Montagoff had indeed waved Roma off with the order to determine what the Scarlets knew. Walking up to the burlesque club had been Roma's own doing. Benedict arched an eyebrow. And did you obtain answers? No Roma's gaze wandered off. Juliet knew nothing. A sudden bang echoed loudly into the relative calm of the waterfront. Benedict had accidentally elbowed the crates in disbelief, sending the one at the top of the stack hurtling onto the ground and splintering into dozens of wooden slabs. Juliet? Benedict exclaimed. Juliet is back. Marshall echoed. Roma remained silent, his eyes still tracing the edge of the river. An ache was building in his head a sharp tension that throbbed each time he probed into his memories. It hurt him just to say her name. Juliet. This was where he had known her. As workers bustled back and forth with dirty rag cloths tucked in their pockets, grabbed it periodically to wipe away the grime that collected on their fingers, two heirs had hidden here in plain sight almost every day, laughing over a common game of marbles. Roma forced away the images, his two friends didn't know what had happened, but they knew something had. They knew that one day Roma had been trusted by his father as closely as one should expect from a son, and the next, regarded suspiciously as if Roma were the enemy. Roma remembered the stares, the glances exchanged between observers when Lord Montagov spoke over him, insulted him, smacked him over the head for the littlest infraction. All the white flowers could sense the change, yet not a soul dared voice it aloud. It became something quietly accepted, something to wonder about but never discuss. Roma never brought it up, either. He was to accept this new strain, or risk shaking it even further upon confrontation. For years had passed now on a careful tightrope. So long as he did not run any faster than what was asked of him, he would not lose his balance above the rest of the white flowers. 
Juliet is back, Roma confirmed quietly. His fists tightened. His throat constricted. He breathed in, barely able to exhale through the shudder that consumed his chest. All the abominable stories he had heard, all the stories that blanketed Shanghai like a heavy mist of terror, injected directly into the hearts of those outside scarlet protection, he had hoped them to be lies, hoped them to be nothing but propaganda that sought to poison the willpower of men who were out to harm Juliet Kai. But he had faced her last night for the first time in four years. He had looked into Juliet's eyes and, in that instant, felt the truth of those stories, as if a higher power had opened his head and nestled the thoughts neatly into his mind. Killer. Violent. Ruthless. All those and more, that was who she was now. And he mourned for her. He didn't wish to, but he did, he ached with the knowledge that the softness of their youth was gone forever, that the Juliet he remembered was long dead. He ached even more to think that though he was the one who had dealt the killing blow, he had still dreamed of her in these four years, of the Juliet whose laughter had rung along the riverside. It was a haunting. He had buried Juliet like a corpse beneath the floorboards, content to live with the ghosts that whispered to him in his sleep. Seeing her again was like finding the corpse beneath the floorboards to not only have resurrected, but to be pointing a gun right at his head. Hey, what is this? Benedict nudged aside a piece of the crate he had broken, cupping something from the ground into his hands. He brought his hands up to his nose and took one look before yelping in disgust, shaking a dust-like substance from his palms. Attention captured, Roma dropped to one knee and Marshall hurried over, both squinting at what Benedict had found with heavy confusion. A minute passed before anyone spoke. Are those, dead insects? Marshall asked. He scratched his chin, unable to explain the presence of such small creatures scattered in the crate. They didn't resemble any insect that the three boys had seen before. Each creature certainly had three segments to its body and six legs, but they were weirdly misshapen, the size of a child's fingernail and pitch black. Mars, check the other crates, Roma demanded. Benedict, give me your bag. With a grimace, Benedict handed over his shoulder bag watching in disgust as Roma scooped up a few of the insects and put them with Benedict's notebooks and pencils. There was no alternative. Roma needed to take these away for further inspection. Nothing in here, Marshall reported, having broken the lid off the second crate. They watched him work through the rest. Each crate was shaken thoroughly and smacked a few times, but there were no more insects. Roma looked skyward. That crate at the very top, he said. It was open before you touched it, was it not? Benedict frowned. I suppose so, he replied. The insects could have crawled in. A sudden burst of Chinese voices came around the corner then, startling Roma badly enough to drop Benedict's bag. He swiveled on his heel and met his cousin's wide gaze, then looked to the combative stance Marshall had immediately shifted into. Scarlets. Marshall asked. We don't need to stick around to check, Benedict said immediately. Faster than Marshall could react, he gave the other boy a rough push. It was only Marshall's surprise that allowed him to stumble to the edge of the boardwalk, teetering and teetering before tipping over, dropping into the water with a quiet plink. Roma had not managed one word of protest before his cousin was also charging at him, throwing them both into the Huangpu River before the merry voices could bend around the corner and come upon the boardwalk. Murky darkness and blips of liquid sunlight closed around Roma. He had dropped into the water quietly with Benedict's guidance, but now he was as loud as his raging heartbeat, his arms thrashing wildly in his haste to find his bearings amid the waves. Was he sinking lower or rising to the surface? Was he right side up or upside down, swimming closer to the soil until his entire body was buried within the river, never to be seen again? A hand jabbed his face. Roma's eyes flew open. Benedict was hovering before him, his hair flying in short locks all around his face. He pressed an angry finger to his lips, then dragged Roma by the arm, swimming until they were under the boardwalk. Marshall was already floating there, having poked his head into the few inches of breathable space between the underside of the boardwalk and the rippling river. Roma and Benedict did the same, 
inhaling as silently as possible to catch their breaths, then pressing their ears close to the boardwalk panels. They could hear the scarlet voices above, talking about a white flower they had just beat to near death, running away only because a group of police officers had come by. The Scarlets did not stop nor notice the shoulder bag that Roma had dropped. They were too caught up in their high, caught up in the aftereffects of the feud's bloodlust. Their voices merely became terribly loud before fading again, heading onward in obliviousness to the three white flowers hiding in the very water beneath them. As soon as they were gone, Marshall reached over and thumped Benedict over the head. You didn't have to push me, Marshall grumbled angrily. Did you hear what they were saying? We could have fought them. Now I'm soggy in places no man should be soggy. While Benedict and Marshall started to argue back and forth, Roma's eyes wandered, scanning the underside of the boardwalk. With the sun beaming brightly through the slits of the platform, the light revealed all sorts of mold and dirt that collected in clumps under the space. It also immediately directed Roma's gaze toward what looked like a shoe, floating in the water and knocking against the inner side of the boardwalk. Roma recognized it. By God, Roma exclaimed. He swam for the shoe and plucked it out of the water, holding it up like a trophy. Do you know what this means? Marshall stared at the shoe, supplying Roma with a look that was somehow vocal without saying any words. That the Huangpu River is becoming increasingly polluted? At this point, Benedict was getting fed up with floating in the grime under the boardwalk and swam out. Marshall was fast to follow, and Roma, remembering with a start that it was indeed safe to surface now, hurriedly did the same, slapping his hands against the dry side of the floating boardwalk and shaking the water out of his trousers when he was back on his feet. This, Roma said, gesturing to the shoe, belonged to the man who died on Scarlet territory. He was here, too. Roma grabbed Benedict's shoulder bag and shoved the shoe in. Let's go. I know where. Hey, Marshall cut in. Still dripping wet, he squinted into the water. Did you? Did you see that? When Roma looked out into the river, all he saw was blistering sunlight. Ah, uh, he said. Are you trying to be funny? Marshall turned to face him. There was something in his dead serious expression then that stopped Roma's teasing remark, stilled it with a sour flavor on his tongue. I thought I saw eyes in the water. The sourness spread. The whole air around them suddenly grew coppery with apprehension, and Roma tightened his grip on his cousin's bag until he was practically hugging it to himself. Where, he asked. It was only a flash, Marshall said, scrubbing his hands through his hair in an effort to wring the water out. Honestly, it might have just been the sunlight in the river. You sounded certain about the eyes. But why would there have been eyes? Benedict cleared his throat, having finished stomping the water out of his trousers. Roma and Marshall both turned to him. You've heard what the people are saying, no? Their responses were immediate. Gomal, Marshall whispered, at the same time Roma intoned, Chudovish. Benedict made an affirming noise. It was that which finally shook Roma out of his stupor, waving for his friends to hurry up and move away from the water. Oh, please, don't buy into the monster talk running through the city, he said. Just come with me. Roma hurried off. He whipped through the city streets, winding through the open market stalls and barely sparing the passing vendors a second glance, even when they reached out to catch him by the arm, hoping to advertise a strange new fruit sailed in from some other world. Benedict and Marshall huffed and puffed to stay at his pace, trading occasional frowns and wondering where Roma was taking them so fervently with a bag full of dead insects clutched in his arms. Here, Roma declared finally, skidding to a stop outside the white flower labs, panting heavily while he caught his breath. Benedict and Marshall collided with each other behind him, both almost toppling over in their haste to stop when Roma did. By then, they were practically dried from their dip into the river. Ouch, Marshall complained. Sorry, Benedict said. I almost slipped on this. He lifted his foot and salvaged a thin piece of paper, a poster that had fallen off a signpost. They usually advertised transportation services or apartment vacancies, but this one had giant text at the top heralding avoid the madness. Get vaccinated. 
give me that, Roma demanded. Benedict passed the sheet and Roma folded it, slipping the small square into his pocket for later examination. Follow me. Roma barged into the building and wound through the long hallway, entering the labs without knocking. He was supposed to don a lab coat every time he entered the building, but no one had ever dared tell him off, and the various young scientists that the White Flowers employed at these workstations barely looked up when Roma visited once a month. They were familiar enough with his presence to let him be, and the head scientist, Lawrence, was familiar enough with Roma not to say anything about his misconduct. Besides, who would ever bother protesting the behavior of the White Flower heir? As far as these scientists were concerned, Roma was practically the one distributing their wages. Lawrence? Roma called, scanning the labs. Lawrence, where are you? Up here, Lawrence's deep voice boomed in accented Russian, his hand waving from the second landing. Roma took the staircase up two at a time, with Marshall and Benedict bounding behind him like eager puppies. Lawrence looked up at their arrival, then furrowed his bushy white brows. He wasn't used to seeing guests. Roma's lab visits tended to be solo trips, made with his head ducked into his shoulders. Roma always slinked into this lab like the physical act of shrinking could act as a shield against the greasy nature of their underground trade. Perhaps if he didn't walk with his usual good posture, he could absolve himself of blame when he came asking for the monthly progress reports of the products that came in and out of this lab. This place was supposed to be a white flower research facility at the cutting edge of pharmaceutical advancements, perfecting modern medicines for the hospitals operating on their territory. That was, at least, the facade they maintained. In truth, the tables at the back were smeared with opium, smelling like heaviness and tar while the scientists added their own unique toxins into the mixture, until the drugs were modified into the epitome of addiction. Then the white flowers would send them back out, take the money in, and life went on. This was not a humanitarian venture. This was a business that made poor lives even poorer, and allowed the wealthy to burst at their seams. I wasn't expecting you today, Lauren said, stroking his straggly beard. He was leaning up against the railing to look onto the first floor, but his hunched back made the gesture appear terribly dangerous. We haven't finished with the current batch yet. Roma winced. Sooner or later he would get used to the blasé manner the people here treated their work. Work was work, after all. I'm not here about the drugs. I need your expertise. As Roma hurried to Lawrence's work table and brushed the papers aside to clear the space, Marshall sprang forward, taking the opportunity to make an extravagant introduction. His whole face lit up, as it always did when he could add another name to the eternally long list of people he had rubbed shoulders with. Marshall Seo, pleased to make your acquaintance. Marshall extended his hand, making a small bow. Lawrence, his joints slow and creaky, shook Marshall's outstretched fingers warily. His eyes turned to Benedict next out of expectance, and with an imperceptible sigh, Benedict extended his hand too, his wrist floppy. Benedict Ivanovich Montagov, he said. If his impatience wasn't already oozing from his speech, his wandering eyes certainly proved where his attention was, the insects Roma was spreading out on Lawrence's work table. Roma's face was stuck in a grimace as he used his sleeve to cover his fingers and separate each little creature from the other. Lawrence made a thoughtful noise. He pointed his finger at Roma isn't your patronymic Ivanovich. Roma turned away from the creatures. He squinted at the scientist. Lawrence, my father's name is not Ivan. You know this. For the life of me, my memory is worsening with my age if I can't remember yours, Lawrence muttered. Nikolievich? Sergevich? Mick? Can we take a look at this instead? Roma interrupted. Ah! Lawrence turned to face his work table. Without caring about the crucial matter of hygiene, he reached out with his fingers and prodded at the insects, his weary eyes blinking in confusion. What am I looking at? We found them at a crime scene, Roma folded his arms tucking his shaking fingers into the fabric of his suit jacket, where seven men lost their minds and tore out their own throats. Lawrence did not react to the aggravation of such a statement. He only pulled at his beard a few more times, 
knitting his eyebrows together until they became one long furry shape on his forehead. Is it that you think these insects cause the men to rip out their own throats? Roma exchanged a glance with Benedict and Marshall. They shrugged. I don't know, Roma admitted. I was hoping you could tell me. I confess I can't imagine why else we would find insects at the crime scene. The only other working theory is that a monster might have risen up from the Huangpu River and induced the madness. Lauren sighed. If it had come from anybody else, Roma may have felt a prickling of irritation, an indication that he was not being taken seriously despite the severity of his request. But Lauren sighed when he was making his tea and he sighed when he was cutting open his letters. Roma had witnessed enough of Lauren's Van Dyke's temper to know this was merely his neutral state. Lauren's prodded an insect again. This time he drew his finger back quickly. Oh. That's interesting. What? Roma demanded. What's interesting? Lawrence walked away without replying, his feet shuffling on the floor. He scanned his shelf, then muttered something under his breath in Dutch. Only when he had retrieved a lighter, a small thing red in color, did he respond, I will show you. Benedict pulled a face, silently waving an arm through the air. Why is he like this? He mouthed. Let him have his fun, Marshall mouthed in return. Lawrence came hobbling back. He retrieved a petri dish from a drawer underneath the work table and delicately picked up three of the dead insects, dropping them upon the dish one after the other. You should probably wear gloves, Benedict said. Hush, Lauren said. You did not notice, did you? Benedict pulled another face, this one looking like he was chewing on a lemon. Roma stifled the slightest hint of a smile that threatened his lips and quickly placed a hand on his cousin's elbow in warning. Notice what, he asked, when he was assured that Benedict would remain quiet. Lauren stepped away from the work table, walking until he was at least ten paces away. Come here. Roma, Benedict, and Marshall followed. They watched Lauren's pull a flame free from the lighter, watched as he brought it to the insect in the center of the petri dish holding the burning yellow light to the insect until it started to shrivel, the exoskeleton reacting to stimuli even past death. But the strangest thing was happening, the other two insects on either side of the burning insect were burning up too, shriveling and glowing with heat. As the insect in the middle curled further and further inward, burning with the fire, those to either side of it did the exact same. That's a mighty strong lighter you have there, Marshall remarked. Lawrence quashed the flame. He strode toward the work table then, with a pace that Roma didn't think him capable of, and hovered the petri dish over the rest of the dozens of insects that remained on the wooden surface. It is not the lighter's doing, dear boy. He pushed down on the lighter. This time, as the insect under the flame turned fiery red and curled inward, so too did all the insects laid out on the table, viciously, suddenly, in a manner that almost gave Roma a fright in believing they had come alive. Benedict took a step back. Marshall pressed his hand to his mouth. How can that be? Roma demanded. How is this possible? Distance is the determinant here, Lauren said. Even in death, one insect's action is determined by the others nearby. It is possible that they do not have their own mind. It is possible they act as one every single one of these insects that remain alive. What does this mean? Roma pressed. Are they responsible for the dead men? Perhaps, but it is hard to say. Lauren set the petri dish down, then rubbed at his eyes. He seemed to hesitate, which was terribly unexpected and, for whatever reason, prompted a pit to begin growing in Roma's stomach. In the years that Roma had known the old scientist, Lawrence was always saying whatever came to mind with no concern for propriety. Spit it out, Benedict prodded. A great, great sigh. These are not organic creatures, Lawrence said. Whatever these things are, God did not make them. And when Lawrence crossed himself, Roma finally realized the unearthliness of what they were dealing with. 5. Midday sunlight streamed through Juliet's bedroom window. Despite the shine, it was brisk out today, chilly in the sort of way that drew the roses in the garden a little straighter, 
as if they couldn't afford to lose a single second of the warmth filtering through the clouds. Can you believe Tyler? Juliet fumed, pacing her room. Who does he think he is? Has he been bullying his way around for the past four years? Rosalind and Kathleen both pulled a face from upon Juliet's bed, where Rosalind was braiding Kathleen's hair. That look was as good as confirmation. You know Tyler doesn't have any real influence in this gang, Kathleen tried. Don't worry, ow, Rosalind. Stop moving and maybe I wouldn't have to pull so hard, Rosalind replied evenly. Do you want two even braids or two lopsided braids? Kathleen folded her arms, huffing. Whatever point she had been raising to Juliet seemed completely forgotten. Just wait until I learn how to braid my own hair. Then you'll have power over me no longer. You've been growing your hair long for five years, Mimi. Just admit you think my braiding is superior. A smattering of sound came from right outside Juliet's bedroom door then. Juliet frowned, listening while Kathleen and Rosalind continued on, with no indication they had heard the same noise. Of course your braiding is superior. While you were learning how to style yourself and be ladylike, I was being taught how to swing a golf club and shake hands aggressively. I know the tutors were bigoted assholes about your education. I'm only saying right now to stop squirming. Hey, hey, hush, Juliet whispered quickly, pressing a finger to her lips. It had been footsteps. Footsteps that stopped, probably in hopes of catching a floating piece of gossip. While most mansions of big-name bosses sat along bubbling well road in the city center, the Kai house resided quietly at the very edge of Shanghai. It was an effort to avoid the watchful eyes of the foreigners governing the city, yet despite its strange location, it was the hotspot of the Scarlet Gang. Anybody who was anybody in the network would come knocking when they had free time, even though the Kais owned countless smaller residences in the heart of the city. In the silence, the footsteps sounded again, moving on. It probably mattered little if the maids and aunts and uncles passing by every minute tried to eavesdrop, Juliet, Rosalind, and Kathleen were always speaking in rapid English when it was only the three of them, and very few people in the house had the linguistic ability to act as eavesdroppers. Still, it was irritating. I think they're gone, Kathleen said after a while. Anyway, before Rosalind distracted me, she shot her sister a feigned dirty look for emphasis, my point was that Tyler is merely a nuisance. Let him say what he wants to say. The Scarlet Gang is strong enough to deflect him. Juliet sighed heavily. But I worry. She wandered to her balcony doors. When she pressed her fingers to the glass, the heat of her skin misted up the surface immediately in little dots, five identical spots where she left her mark. We don't take note of it, but the blood feud casualties keep rising. Now, with this strange madness, how long will it be before we don't have the numbers to be operating anymore? That won't happen, Rosalind reassured her, finishing the braids. Shanghai is under our fist. Shanghai was under our fist, her sister cut in. Kathleen sniffed, and pointed to a map of the city that Juliet had unfurled on her desk. Now the French control the French concession. The British, the Americans, and the Japanese have the international settlement. And we're battling the white flowers for a stable grasp on everywhere else, which is a feat in itself considering how few Chinese-owned zones are left. Oh stop! Rosalind groaned, pretending to have a fainting spell. Juliet had to stifle a giggle as Rosalind splayed an arm across her forehead and flopped back onto the bed. You've been listening to too much communist propaganda. Kathleen frowned. I have not. At least admit you have communist sympathies, come on. They're not wrong, Kathleen retorted. This city is no longer Chinese. Who cares? Rosalind kicked out with her foot suddenly, using the momentum to push her body upright, sitting so fast that her coiffed hair whipped into her eyes. Every armed force in this city either has an allegiance to the Scarlet Gang or the White Flowers. That is where the power is. No matter how much land we lose to the foreigners, gangsters are the most powerful force in the city, not foreign white men. Until the foreign white men start rolling in their own artilleries, Juliet muttered. She walked away from the balcony doors and trailed back toward her vanity table, 
hovering by the long seat. Almost absently, she reached out, trailing her finger along the lip of the ceramic vase that sat by her cosmetics. There used to be a blue and white Chinese vase here, but red roses did not match the whorls of porcelain, and so the swap had been made for a western design instead. It would have been so much easier if the scarlets had run the foreigners out, had chased them away with bullets and threats the moment their ships and their fancy goods docked in the bund. Even now the gangsters could still join forces with the tired factory workers and their boycotts. Together, if only the Scarlet Gang wanted to, they could overrun the foreigners, but they wouldn't. The Scarlet Gang was profiting far too much. They needed this investment, this economy, these stacks and stacks of money flooding into their ranks and holding them afloat. It pained Juliet to think about. On her first day back, she had paused outside the public garden, spotted a sign that read no Chinese aloud, and burst out laughing. Who in their right mind would forbid the Chinese from entering a space in their own country? Only later did she realize it hadn't been a joke. The foreigners truly thought themselves mighty enough to enforce spaces that were reserved for the foreign community, reasoning that the foreign funds they poured into their newly constructed parks and newly opened speakeasies justified their takeover. For temporary riches, the Chinese were letting the foreigners make permanent marks upon their land, and the foreigners were growing cozy. Juliet feared the tables would turn suddenly one day, leaving the Scarlet Gang to realize they had found themselves standing on the outside. What's wrong with you? Juliet jerked to attention, using the vanity mirror to peer at Rosalind. What? You looked like you were plotting murder. A knock came on Juliet's bedroom door before she could respond forcing her to turn around properly. Ollie, one of the maids, opened the door and shuffled through, but remained hovering over the threshold, unwilling to step too far in. None of the household staff knew how to deal with Juliet. She was too bold, too brazen, too western, while they were too new, too uncertain, never comfortable. The household staff rotated every month as a matter of practicality. It prevented the Kais from learning their stories, their lives, their histories. In no time, their month was up and they were being shoved out the door for their own safety, cutting the ties that would bind Lord and Lady Kai to more and more people. Siaojia, there's a visitor downstairs, Ollie said softly. It hadn't always been like this. Once, they had had a set of household staff that lasted through Juliet's first fifteen years of life. Once, Juliet had nurse, and nurse would tuck Juliet in and tell her the most heartaching tales of desert lands and lush forests. Juliet reached out, plucked a red rose from the vase. The moment she closed her hands around the stem, the thorns pricked her palm, but she hardly felt the sting past the calluses protecting her skin, past the years she had spent chasing away every part of her that qualified for delicate. Juliet hadn't understood at first. For years ago, while she knelt in the gardens, Trimming their rosebushes with thick gloves on, she hadn't realized why the temperature around her had risen so intently, why it sounded almost as if the entire grounds of the Kai Mansion were shuddering with an explosion. Her ears were screeching, first with the remnants of that awful, loud sound, then with the shouting, the panic, the cries wafting over from the back, where the servant's house was. When she hurried over, she saw rubble. She saw a leg, a pool of blood. Someone had been standing right at the threshold of the front door when the ceiling caved in. Someone in a dress that looked like the sort nurse wore, with the same fabric that Juliet had always tugged on as a child, because it was all she could reach to get nurse's attention. There had been a single white flower lying on the path into the servant's house. When Juliet shook off her gloves and picked it up, her ears ringing and her whole mind dazed, her fingers came upon a pinned note, one written in Russian, in cursive, bleeding with ink when she unfolded it. My son sends his regards. They had wheeled so many bodies into the hospital that day. Corpses upon corpses. The Kais had been playing nice, had decided to ease up on an age-old hatred whose cause had been forgotten to time, and look where it had gotten them, death delivered directly to their doorstep. From that incident onward, the Scarlet Gang and White Flowers shot at each other on sight guarding and defending territory lines as if their honor and reputation depended on it. Xiaojia. Juliet squeezed her eyes shut, 
dropping the rose and smoothing a cold hand over her face until she could swallow back every memory that threatened to erupt. When she opened her eyes again, her gaze was dull, uninterested as she inspected her fingernails. So, she said, I don't deal with the visitors. Yet my parents. Ollie cleared her throat, then twisted her hands through the rough hem of her button shirt. Your parents are out. I could fetch Kai Tyle. No, Juliet snapped. She regretted her tone immediately when the maid's expression turned stricken. Out of all their household staff, Ollie was the one who treated Juliet with the least amount of caution. She didn't deserve to be barked at. Juliet tried for a smile. Let Tyler be. It's probably just Walter Dexter downstairs. I'll go. Ollie inclined her chin respectfully, then hurried away before Juliet's temper came back. Juliet supposed she gave the household staff the wrong impression. She would do anything for the Scarlet Gang. She cared for their welfare and their politics, their coalitions and alliances with the merchant firms and investors. But she did not care about little men like Walter Dexter, who thought themselves mightily important without the capacity to back such a claim. She had no desire to be running the errands that her father didn't want to do. This was far from the cutthroat business she had expected to be welcomed into when she was finally summoned back. If she had known that Lord Kai would leave her out of the blood feud, out of the same paralleled sniping occurring on the political stage, maybe she wouldn't have rushed to pack her bags and pour out the entire contents of her alcohol stash when she left New York behind. After the attack that killed Nurse, Juliet had been shipped back to New York for her own safety, had had to simmer on her resentment for four long years. It wasn't who she was. She would have rather stayed and braced herself on her own two feet, fight with her chin held up. Juliet Kai had been taught not to run, but her parents, as parents tended to be, were hypocrites, and they had forced her to run, forced her out of the thick of the blood feud, forced her to become someone far removed from the danger. And now she was back. Rosalind made a throaty noise as Juliet shrugged a jacket over her beaded dress. There it is again. What? The murder face, Kathleen supplied without looking up from her magazine. Juliet rolled her eyes. I think this is simply my resting expression. No, your resting expression is this. Rosalind imitated the most scatterbrained expression she could manage, eyes wide and mouth open, swaying in circles on the bed. In response, Juliet threw a slipper at her, drawing giggles from Kathleen. Shoo, Rosalind chided, smacking the slipper away and biting down on her laugh. Go attend to your duties. Juliet was already walking out, making a rude gesture over her shoulder. As she trudged down the hallway of the second floor, picking at her chipping nails, she paused in front of her father's office to shake out her shoe, which hadn't fit right ever since it had gotten caught on a drain covering. Then she froze, her hand on her ankle. She could hear voices coming from the office. Ah, excuse me, Juliet hollered, kicking the door open with her high-heeled shoe. The maid said you were both out. Her parents lifted their heads at once, blinking plainly. Her mother was standing over her father's shoulder, one hand rested on the desk, and the other placed upon a document in front of them. The staff say what we want them to say, Chineida, Lady Kai said. She made a flicking motion with her fingers at Juliet. Don't you have a visitor to entertain downstairs? Huffing, Juliet pulled the door closed again, glaring daggers at her parents. They hardly paid her heed. They simply went back to their conversation, assuming Juliet would run along. We have lost two men to it already, and if the whispers are true, more will fall before we can determine exactly what is causing it, her mother said, voice low as she resumed speaking. Lady Kai always sounded different in Shanghainese than any other language or dialect. It was hard to verbalize exactly what it was except a feeling of calm, even if the subject matter carried a terrible squall of emotion. That was what it meant to speak your native tongue, Juliet supposed. Juliet wasn't really sure what her native tongue was. The communists are beside themselves with joy. Zhang Gutai won't even need a megaphone for recruitment anymore. Her father was the opposite. He was quick and sharp. 
though the tones of Shang Haini's came completely from the mouth instead of the tongue or throat, he somehow managed to make it reverberate tenfold within himself first before releasing the sound. With people dropping like flies, capitalist ventures cease to grow, factories become ripe for revolution. Shanghai's commercial development comes to an abrupt stop. Juliet grimaced, then hurried away from her father's office door. No matter how hard her father had tried through his letters, Juliet had never cared much about who was who in the government, not unless their ongoings had some direct effect on Scarlet business. All she cared about was the Scarlet Gang, about whatever immediate dangers and tribulations they were facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Which meant that in scheming, Juliet's mind liked to gravitate to the white flowers, not to the communists. But if the communists had indeed unleashed madness onto this city as her father seemed to suspect, then they too, were killing her people, and she had a bone to pick with them. Her father hadn't been overlooking the deaths in favor of politics this morning after all. Perhaps they were one and the same. It does make sense that the communists could be responsible for the madness, Juliet thought as she started down the staircase toward the first floor. Only how could they possibly manage such a feat? Civil war was no novelty. This country was in political turmoil more than it was at peace. But something that caused innocent people to gouge their own throats out was certainly far from any biological warfare Juliet had studied. Juliet bounded onto the last step of the staircase. Hello, she shouted. I am here. You may bow. She entered the living room and, with a start, found a stranger primly seated on one of the couches. It was not the annoying British merchant, but it was indeed someone who looked very similar, only younger, around her age. I'll refrain from bowing if that's okay, the stranger said, an upward tilt to his mouth. He rose to his feet and stuck out his hand. I'm Paul. Paul Dexter. My father couldn't make it today, so he sent me. Juliet ignored the outstretched hand. Poor etiquette, she noted immediately. By the rules of British society, a lady was always to have the privilege of offering the handshake. Not that she cared about British etiquette, nor how their high society defined what a lady was, but such minuscule details pointed to a lack of training, and so Juliet filed that away in her head. And he really should have bowed. I assume you're here for the same request still? Juliet asked, smoothing her sleeves down. Indeed. Paul Dexter took back his hand without any malice. His smile was a cross between that of a Hollywood star and a desperate clown. My father promises you that we have more lernicrum than any other merchant sailing into this city. You will not find better prices elsewhere. Juliet sighed as a few cousins and uncles filtered through the living room, waiting for them to pass. As the group walked by, Mr. Lee clapped a hand over her shoulder good-naturedly. Good luck, kid. Juliet stuck out her tongue. Mr. Lee grinned, wrinkling his entire face, then produced a small wrapped candy from his palm for Juliet to take. She was no longer an overeager four-year-old who would eat until she gave herself a toothache, but she took it anyway, popping the candy into her mouth while her uncle strolled away. Please sit, Mr. Dexter. Call me Paul, he interrupted, perching again on the long couch. We're a new generation of modern people, and Mr. Dexter is my father. Juliet barely refrained from gagging. She bit down on the hard candy instead, then collapsed onto an armchair perpendicular to Paul. We have been admiring the Scarlets for some time now, Paul continued. My father has high hopes of a partnership. A visible shudder swept through Juliet's body at the familiarity Paul had with the term Scarlets. As a name, the Scarlet Gang sounded a lot nicer in Chinese. They called themselves Hong Bang, the two syllables twirled together in a quick snap of vowels. Such a name curled in and out through scarlet tongues like a whip, and those who didn't know how to handle it properly ended up lashed. This was Paul Dexter's lashing. I'll give you the same answer we gave your father, Juliet said. She drew her legs up onto the armrest, the layers of her dress falling back. Paul's eyes followed the motion. She watched his eyebrow twitch with the scandal of her long, pale thigh on show. We're not taking on any new endeavors. We're busy enough with our current clients. Paul feigned disappointment. 
he leaned forward, like he could persuade her with mere eye contact. All it did was show Juliet that he hadn't quite brushed out a clump of pomade in his sweep of dark blonde hair. Don't be like that, he said. I hear there's a rival business who might be more enthusiastic about the offer. So perhaps you should try them, Juliet suggested. She straightened up suddenly. He was trying to entice her into listening by suggesting he would take his business to the white flowers, but it mattered little. Walter Dexter was a client they wanted to lose. I'm glad we could resolve this matter so promptly. Wait, no. Goodbye now, Juliet pretended to think. Peter. Paris. Paul, he supplied, frowning. Juliet summoned a smile, not unlike the scatterbrained one Rosalind had been mimicking earlier. Right. Bye. She hopped to her feet and pranced across the living room, toward the front entrance. In a blink, her fingers were on the heavy handle, and she was pulling the door open, eager to get rid of the British visitor. Paul, to his credit, was fast to recover. He came up to the door and bowed. Finally, some manners. Very well. He stepped out, onto the front stoop, then pivoted again to face Juliet. May I make a request, Miss Kai? I already told you. Paul smiled. Can I see you again? Juliet slammed the door shut. Absolutely not. 6. Roma wasn't having a pleasant day. Within his first hour awake, he had tripped going up the stairs, smashed his favorite mug with his favorite herbal tea, and checked his hip against the kitchen table so roughly that there was a giant purple splotch forming on his torso. Then he had been forced to inspect a crime scene. Then he had had to face the possibility that this was a crime scene of supernatural proportions. As Roma trudged back into the city's central hub under the early afternoon sun, he could feel his patience wearing incredibly thin. Every blow of whistling steam sounded like the noise his father made from his mouth when he got angry, and every crack of a butcher bringing his cleaver down reminded Roma of gunfire. Usually, Roma adored the busyness that surrounded his home. He would deliberately take the long routes to skirt in and out of the stalls, peering at the bundles of farm-grown vegetables piled higher than their cellar. He would make faces at the fish, inspecting the conditions of their small, dirty tanks. If he had time to kill, he would pick up sweets from every vendor selling them, popping them into his mouth as he went along and emerging from the markets with aching teeth and empty pockets. The open market was one of his greatest loves. But today it was nothing but an irritant atop an already viral rash. Roma ducked under the laundry lines pulled along the narrow alleyway leading into the Montagov central housing block. Both clean and dirty water dripped furious puddles onto the pavement, transparent if it was under a sopping wet dress, black and sludgy if it was under a half-installed pipe. That was a feature that became more prominent as one ventured deeper in Shanghai. It was as if a lazy artist had been in charge of building everything, rooftops and window ledges would curve and stretch with the most glorious angles and archways, only to abruptly end or cut into the neighboring block. There was never enough space in the poorest parts of this city. Resources were always running out just before the builders were ready. Pipes were always a smidgen too short, drains only had half a covering, sidewalks seemed to slope into themselves. If Roma wanted to, he could stretch his arms out from his bedroom window on the fourth floor, and easily reach the outward folding window shades of a bedroom in the building next to his. If he stretched with his legs instead, he could hop over without struggle to scare the old man who lived there. It wasn't like they were short on space. There was an abundance of land outside the city for expansion, land untouched by the influence of the international settlement and the French concession. But the White Flowers' lodgings were nestled right beside the French concession, and there they were resolute to stay. The Montagovs had been located here since Roma's grandfather emigrated. The foreigners had only claimed the nearby land in these recent years as they became more brash with their legal power. Every once in a while it gave the White Flowers great trouble whenever the French tried to control the gang's ongoings, but the state of affairs always blew in favor of the Russians. The French needed them, they did not need the French. The White Flowers would let the foreigners continue practicing their laws over a space that didn't seem to belong to either of them, 
and the pompous merchants with their floral coats and polished shoes stepped aside when the gangsters ran amuck on the streets. It was a compromise, but it was one that would become more tense as more time drew out. Places like these were already suffocating. It did not to add more weight upon the pillow press to their faces. Roma shrugged Benedict's bag higher up his shoulder. Benedict hadn't been very pleased that Roma was taking his art supplies away from him, but then Roma had pretended to offer it back, and his cousin had only needed one look, at all the dead bugs Lawrence didn't want to keep, and the dead man's shoe that Roma had shoved in there, before promptly pushing it back, asking Roma to return it after he gave it a good wash. Roma unlocked his front door and slipped in. Just as he dragged himself into the living room, a door slammed to his right, and Dmitri Voronin was strolling in too. Roma's already unpleasant day turned even worse. Roma! Dmitri shouted. Where have you been all morning? Despite being only a few years older, Dmitri acted as if he were legion superior to Roma. As Roma passed him, Dmitri grinned and reached out to ruffle Roma's hair. Roma jerked away, narrowing his eyes. He was nineteen, heir to one of the two most powerful underground empires in the city, but whenever Dmitri was in the same room as him, he was reduced to a child again. Out, Roma replied vaguely. If he said it was anything related to white flower business, Dmitri would pry and pry until he was in the know too. While Dmitri wasn't unintelligent enough to ever openly insult Roma, Roma could hear it in every reference to his youth, every quasi-sympathetic tut whenever he spoke up. It was because of Dmitri that Roma wasn't allowed to be soft. It was because of Dmitri that Roma had crafted a cold and brutal face that he hated seeing every time he looked into a mirror. What do you want? Roma asked now, pouring himself a glass of water. Don't worry. Dmitri wandered into the kitchen after him, grabbing a nearby chopping knife. He stabbed at a plate on the table, picked up a piece of cooked meat, and chomped down around the thick blade without regard for who had left the plate there or how long the food had been sitting out. I was on my way out too. Roma frowned, but Dmitri was already walking off, taking with him the heavy scent of musk and smoke. Left alone, Roma heaved a long exhale and turned to put his glass in the sink. Only, as he turned, he found himself being watched by wide brown eyes on a small, pixie-like face. He almost yelped. Elisa, Roma hissed at his sister, throwing open the doors of the kitchen cupboard. He couldn't figure out how she had been watching him from up there without his notice, or how she had even managed to fit in among the spices and sugars, but by now he had learned not to ask. Careful, she whined when Roma lifted her out of the cupboard. When he set her down on the floor, she gestured at the sleeve Roma had clenched in his fist. This is new. It was very much not new. In fact, the cloth and wrap shirt that went around her petite shoulders resembled the sort of clothing the peasantry wore before the royal dynasties in China ended, ripped in a sort of manner that could be caused only by slipping in and out of the tightest corners. Elisa simply spoke outrageous things on occasion for no reason other than to incite confusion leading people to believe she skated a thin line between insane and overly immature. Hush, Roma told her. He smoothed down her collar, then froze, his hand stilling when it touched a chain Elisa had looped around her neck. It was their mother's, an heirloom from Moscow. The last time he'd seen it, it had been on her corpse after she was murdered by the Scarlet Gang, a bright silver chain that stood stark against the blood seeping from her slit throat. Lady Montagova had gotten sick shortly after Elisa was born. Roma would see her once a month, when Lord Montagov took him to a secret location, a safe house tucked in the unknown nooks of Shanghai. In his mind, she had been grey and gaunt, but always alert, always ready to smile when Roma walked up to her bed. The point of a safe house was so Lady Montagova didn't need guards. She was supposed to have been safe. But four years ago, the Scarlet Gang had found her anyway, had slashed her throat in response to an attack earlier that week, and left one wilted red rose clutched in her hands. When they buried her corpse, her palms were still embedded with the thorns. Roma should have hated the Scarlet Gang long before they killed his mother, and he should have hated them even more, with a burning passion, after they killed Lady Montagova. But he didn't. After all, 
it was Lex Talionis, an eye for an eye, that was how the blood feud worked. If he hadn't launched that first attack, they wouldn't have retaliated against his mother. There was no way to spread blame in a feud of such scale. If there was anyone to blame, it was himself. If there was anybody to hate for his mother's death, it was himself. Elisa waved a hand in front of Roma's face. I see eyes, but I see no brain. Roma snapped back into the present. He placed a gentle finger under the chain, shaking it about. Where did you get this? he asked softly. It was in the attic, Elisa replied. Her eyes lit up. It's pretty, isn't it? Elisa had been only eight years old. She had not been told about the murder, only that Lady Montagova had at last succumbed to illness. Very pretty, Roma said, his voice hoarse. His eyes flicked up then, hearing footsteps on the second floor. Their father was in his office. Run along now. I'll call you down when it's time for dinner. Giving a mock salute, Elisa skittered out of the kitchen and up the stairs, her wispy blonde hair trailing after her. When he heard her bedroom door close on the fourth floor, Roma started up the stairs too, going up to his father's office. He shook his head roughly, clearing his thoughts, and knocked. Enter. Roma filled his lungs with air. He pulled the door open. Well? Lord Montagov said in lieu of a greeting. He did not raise his eyes. His attention was on the letter in his hand, which he scanned quickly before tossing it away and picking up the next one in his stack. I hope you found something. Cautiously, Roma walked in and set the bag down on the floor. He reached into it, hesitating for a moment before pulling out the shoe and setting it down on his father's desk. Roma held his breath, clasping his hands behind his back. Lord Montagov looked upon the shoe like Roma had presented him with a rabid dog. He made that expression at Roma rather frequently. What is this? I found it where the first seven men died, Roma explained carefully, but it belongs to the man who died in the Scarlet Club. I think he was present at the scene of the first crime, and if so, then this is a matter of contagion. Lord Montagov slammed his hands down on his desk. Roma flinched hard but forced himself not to close his eyes, forced himself to stare forward evenly. Contagion. Madness. Monsters. What is wrong with this city? Lord Montagov bellowed. I ask you to find answers and you bring me this? I found exactly what you asked for, Roma replied, but quietly, barely audible. For the last four years, he was always doing what was asked of him, be it a little task or a terrible one. If he didn't, he would have the consequences to fear, and though he hated being a white flower, he hated the thought of not being one even more. His title gave him power. Power kept him safe. It gave him authority, it held his threateners back, and it let him keep Elisa safe, let him keep all his friends within his circle of protection. Get this out of my face, Lord Montagov ordered, waving at the shoe. Roma thinned his lips, but he pulled the shoe away and shoved it back into the bag. The point remains, Papa. He shook the bag, letting the fabric swallow up the shoe. Eight men clash on the ports of Shanghai, seven rip out their own throats, one escapes. If that one then proceeds to rip out his throat too the next day, does that not sound like a disease of contagion to you? Lord Montagov did not respond for a long while. Instead, he spun on his chair until he was facing the small window that overlooked a busy alleyway outside. Roma watched his father, watched his hands tighten on the arms of the large chair, his closely shaven head prickle with the faintest hint of sweat. The stack of letters had been momentarily abandoned. The names signed in Chinese at the base of many were familiar, Chin Duxiao, Li Dajiao, Zhang Gutai. Communists. After the Bolshevik Revolution swept through Moscow, the tide of that political wave had blown down here, to Shanghai. The new factions that rumbled to life some few years ago had been persistently trying to recruit the White Flowers as allies, ignoring the fact that the last thing the White Flowers would want was social redistribution. Not after the Montagovs had spent generations climbing to the top. Not when most of their common gang members had fled the Bolsheviks. 
even if the communists saw the white flowers as potential allies, the white flowers saw them as enemies. Lord Montagov finally made a disgusted noise, turning away from the window. I wish not to be involved in this business of a madness, he decided. Such shall be your task now. Figure out what is occurring. Slowly Roma nodded. He wondered if the tightness of his father's voice was a sign that he thought this madness business beneath him, or if it was because his father was afraid of catching the madness himself. Roma was not afraid. He only feared the power of others. Monsters and things that walked the night were strong, but they were not powerful. There was a difference. I'll find what I can on this man, Roma decided, referring to the most recent victim. Lord Montagov wheeled his chair back an inch, then lifted his feet onto his desk. Don't act in haste, Roma. You must confirm that this shoe truly belongs to the man who died last night first. Roma furrowed his brow. The last victim is being kept in a scarlet hospital. I'll be shot on sight. Find a way in, Lord Montagov responded simply. When I gave you the order to obtain scarlet information, you seemed to approach them with ease. Roma stiffened. That was unfair. The only reason why his father had sent him into Scarlet territory in the first place was because Lord against Lord was too severe of an interaction. If Lord Kai and his father had met and had their encounter end peacefully, both would have lost face. Roma, on the other hand, could defer to the Scarlet Gang without consequence to the White Flowers. He was merely the heir, sent out on an important mission. What are you saying? Roma asked. Just because I had reason to enter their burlesque club does not mean I can gallivant through their hospital. Find someone to take you in. I have heard rumors that the Scarlet Air has returned. A clamp fixed itself onto Roma's chest. He did not dare react. Papa, don't make me laugh. Lord Montagov shrugged flippantly, but there was something in his eyes that Roma didn't like. It is not so absurd an idea, his father said. Surely you can ask one favor. She was your lover once, after all. 7. In the span of a few short days, talk had started in the city. At first nothing except rumors, a suspicion that it was not an enemy nor a natural force bringing about this madness, but the devil himself, knocking on doors in the dead of night, and with one look, utter insanity was wrought on the victim. Then the sightings began. Housewives who hung their washing by the ports claimed to see tentacles skittering away when they ventured outside at nightfall to collect their things. A few scarlet workers who showed up late to their shifts were scared away by growling, then flashes of silver eyes staring them down from the other end of the alleyway. The most horrific account was the story spread by the owner of a riverside brothel, speaking of a creature curled amid the trash bags outside his brothel as he closed up. He had described it panting, as if in pain as if struggling against itself, half cast in shadow but doubtlessly an unnatural, strange thing. It has a spine studded with blades, Juliet heard whispered in front of her now, the story presently being passed from son to mother as they waited for food from the window of a fast-serving restaurant. The little boy was bobbing up and down in excitement, echoing words heard from a schoolmate or a neighborhood friend. The more deaths there were, and there had been multiple since the man in the burlesque club, the more the people speculated, as if just by speaking the possibilities they could stumble upon the truth. But the more people talked, the further truth slipped. Juliet would have shaken the stories off as rumors, but the fear seeping into the streets was very, very real, and she doubted such a feeling would reach these heights without substantial backing to the claims. So what was it, then? Monsters weren't real, no matter what Chinese fairy tales had once been taken as truth. This was a new age of science, of evolution. The so-called monster had to be a creature of someone's creation, but whose? Hush, the mother tried, the fingers of her left hand nervously twining through the beads on her right wrist. They were Buddhist prayer beads, used to track mantra, but whatever mantra the woman recited now couldn't compete with the limitless enthusiasm of her son. They say he has claws the size of forearms, the boy continued. He prowls the night for gangsters, and when he smells the taint of their blood, he pounces. It is not only the gangsters dying, Chineida, his mother said quietly. 
her hand tightened on the back of his neck, keeping him steady in the slow-moving line. The little boy stopped. A tremor entered his sweet voice. Mama, am I going to die? What? His mother exclaimed. Of course not. Don't be ridiculous. She looked up, having reached the front of the line. 2. The shopkeeper passed a paper bag over the window, and the mother-son pair hurried off. Juliet stared after them, and thought about the sudden fear in the boy's voice. In that brief moment, the boy, barely older than five, had comprehended that he too could die with the rest of the corpses in Shanghai, because who could be safe from madness? On the house, miss. Juliet looked up suddenly, finding a paper bag already hovering in front of her face. Only the best for the princess of Shanghai, the old shopkeeper said, his elbows resting on the perch of the serving window. Juliet summoned her most dazzling smile. Thank you, she said, taking the bag. Those two words would give the shopkeeper plenty of material to brag about when he met up with his friends for Mahjong tomorrow. Juliet turned around and left the line, reaching into the bag and ripping a chunk of the bun to chew on. Her smile fell as soon as she was out of sight. It was getting late and she would be expected at home soon, but still she dawdled among the shops and the bustle of Cheng Huangmio, one slow-moving girl in a crowd of havoc. She didn't have a lot of opportunities to wander about in places like these, but today she did. Lord Kai had sent her over to check on an opium distribution center, which unfortunately, hadn't been as exciting as she'd thought. It had merely smelled bad, and upon finally locating the owner with the papers her father wanted, the owner had passed them to her looking half asleep. He hadn't even offered a greeting first nor verified Juliet's right to be asking for such confidential supply information. Juliet didn't understand how someone like that could be given management over fifty workers. Excuse me, she muttered, pushing through a particularly thick crowd gathered in front of a pencil sketch shop. Despite the darkness seeping into the pink skies, Cheng Huangmio was still bustling with visitors, lovers taking slow strolls through the chaos, grandparents purchasing Xialong Bao for the children to slurp on, foreigners simply taking in the sights. The name Cheng Huangmio itself referred to the temple, but to the people of Shanghai, it had come to encompass all the busy surrounding markets and the cloisters of activity in the area. The British Army had set up its head office here almost a century ago, in the Yuyuan Gardens, which Juliet was passing now. Since then, even after their departure, the foreigners had taken a liking to this place. It was always full of their faces, cast in wonder and amusement. This is the end. Get the cure now. There is only one cure. And sometimes it was full of native eccentrics too. Juliet grimaced, tucking her chin in so as not to make eye contact with the ranting old man on the Juka Bridge. However, despite her best efforts to pass unnoticed, the old man straightened at the sight of her and darted along the zigzag bridge, the thuds of his footsteps making sounds that were rather concerning to hear from such an old structure. He skittered to a stop in front of her before she could put enough distance between them. Salvation, he screeched. His wrinkles deepened until his eyes were wholly swallowed by sagging skin. He could barely lift his back past a perpetual hunch, yet he moved as fast as a scurrying rodent on the hunt for food. You must spread the message of salvation. The La Jespa will give it to us. Juliet blinked rapidly, her eyebrows raised. She knew she shouldn't entertain ranting men on the streets, but there was something about him that pricked the little hairs on her neck straight up. Despite his rural accent, she had understood almost all of the man's croaky Shanghainese, all except that little pocket of gibberish. La Jespu? Was the S sound merely a lisp of his generational upbringing? La Jiibo? Juliet tried to guess in correction. A toad will give us salvation? The old man looked mightily offended. He shook his head from side to side, throwing around his thin, wispy white hairs and rustling up the flimsy braid he wore. He was one of those few people who still dressed like the country hadn't left the imperial era. My mother told me a wise proverb when I was young, Juliet continued, amusing herself now. La ji bo siang chie tiuy. The old man merely stared at her. Did he not understand her Shanghainese? Abroad, 
she had constantly feared that she would lose her accent, feared she would forget how to pronounce those persistently flat tones found in no other dialect across this country. Bad joke? Juliet asked. In the more common dialect, she repeated herself, this time more hesitantly. Lai Hama Siang Chi Tian Ero? Yes. I deserve at least a little chuckle, come on. The old man stomped his foot down, shaking in his exertion to be taken seriously. Perhaps Juliet had chosen the wrong proverb to joke around with. The ugly toad wants a bite of swan meat. Maybe the old man hadn't been raised on fairy tales about the frog prince and his ugly toad stepbrother. Maybe he didn't like that her joke implied his la jespa savior, whatever that meant, was the equivalent of a proverbial, scheming, ugly creature who lusted after the swan, his frog prince brother's beloved. The la jespa is a man, he snapped right into Juliet's face, his voice a reedy hiss. A man of great might. He gave me a cure. An injection. I should have died when my neighbor collapsed on me, tearing at his throat. Oh! So much blood. Blood in my eyes and blood running down my chest. But I did not die. I was saved. The La Jespa saved me. Juliet took a great step back, one she should have taken five minutes ago, before this conversation began. Uh, this has been fun, she said, but I really should be going. Before the old man could make a grab at her, she sidestepped him and hurried off. Salvation, he screamed after her. Only the La Jespa can bring salvation now. Juliet took a sharp turn, moving out of view completely. Now that she was in a less crowded area, she let out a long breath and took her time weaving through the shops, casting glances over her shoulder to ensure she wasn't being followed. Once she was certain there was nobody on her tail, she sighed in sorrow to be leaving Cheng Huangmio behind and wove out from the collection of closely congregated shops, stepping back onto the city streets to begin her walk home. She could have flagged a rickshaw or stopped any one of the scarlets loitering outside these cabarets, to have them fetch her a car. Any other girl her age would have, especially with a necklace as shiny as the one around her neck, especially if their footsteps reverberated with an echo that stretched two streets over. Kidnapping was a lucrative business. Human trafficking was thriving at an all-time high, and the economy was booming with crime. But Juliet walked on. She passed men in large groups and men who squatted in front of brothels, leering like it was their second job. She passed gangsters throwing knives outside the casinos they had been hired to guard, passed shady merchants cleaning their guns and chewing on toothpicks. Juliet did not falter. The sky grew redder and her eyes grew brighter. Wherever she went, no matter how far into the darkest underbelly of the city she wandered, as long as she stayed within her territory, she was the reigning supreme. Juliet paused, rolling out her ankle to ease the tightness of her shoe. In response, five nearby scarlet gangsters who were waiting around a restaurant also stilled, waiting to see if they would be summoned. They were killers and extortionists and raging forces of violence. But as the rumors went, Juliet Kai was the girl who had strangled and killed her American lover with a string of pearls. Juliet Kai was the heiress who, on her second day back in Shanghai, had stepped into a brawl between four white flowers and two scarlets and killed all four white flowers with only three bullets. Only one of those rumors was true. Juliet smiled and waved to the scarlet men. In response, one waved back, and the other four nervously laughed among themselves. They feared Lord Kai's wrath if anything were to happen to her, but they feared her wrath more if they were to test the truth of the rumors. It was her reputation that kept her safe. Without it, she was nothing. Which meant that when Juliet wandered into an alleyway, and was stopped by the sudden pressure of what felt like a gun pressed to the small of her back, she knew it wasn't a scarlet who had dared stop her. Juliet froze. In a split second, she ran through all the possibilities an affronted merchant wanting comeuppance, a greedy foreigner wanting ransom, a confused addict on the streets who hadn't recognized her by the sparkly beads of her foreign dress. Then a familiar voice said, in English, of all languages, don't shout for help. Keep moving forward, follow my instructions, and I won't shoot. The ice in her veins thawed in an instant and instead roared into a fiery rage. 
had he waited for her to enter an isolated area, until no one was around to give aid, thinking she would be too afraid to react? Had he thought it would actually work? You really don't know me anymore, Juliet said quietly. Or maybe Roma Montagoff thought he knew her too well. Maybe he thought himself an expert and had brushed off the rumors she spread about herself, thinking there was no way she had become the killer she claimed to be. The first time she killed someone, she had been fourteen. She had known Roma for only a month, but she had sworn to herself that she wouldn't follow the blood feud, that she would be better. Then, one night on their way to a restaurant, their car had been ambushed by white flowers. Her mother had yelled for her to stay down, to hide behind the car with Tyler, to use the guns that had been placed in their hands only if absolutely necessary. The fight had almost ended. The Scarlets had killed almost every white flower. Then the last white flower remaining dove in Juliet and Tyler's direction. There was a last-ditch fury burning in his eyes, and in that moment, though there was no doubt that it was a time of absolute necessity, Juliet had frozen. Tyler had been the one to shoot. His bullet had studded into the white flower's stomach, and the man had gone down, and in horror, Juliet had looked to the side, where her parents were watching. It wasn't relief that she saw. It was confusion. Confusion over why Juliet had frozen. Confusion over why Tyler had been more capable. So Juliet had raised her gun and fired too, finishing the job. Juliet Kai feared disapproval more than she feared grime on her soul. That killing was one of the few secrets she had kept from Roma. Now she knew she should have told him, if only to prove that she was just as nefarious as Shanghai always said she was. Walk, Roma demanded. Juliet remained still. As she intended, he misread her inaction as fear, for ever so slightly, he hesitated and eased up the press of his gun just a smidgen. She whirled around. Before Roma could so much as blink, her right hand came down hard on his right wrist, twisting his gun-wielding hand outward until his fingers were unnaturally bent. She slapped down at the gun with her left hand. The weapon skittered to the ground. Her jaw gritted to brace for impact, Juliet twisted her foot out behind Roma's and jerked it against his ankles, until he was falling backward, and she followed, one hand locked on his neck and the other reaching into her dress pocket to retrieve a needle-thin knife. Okay, Juliet heaved, breathing hard. She had him pinned flat on his back, her knees on either side of his hips and her blade pressed to his throat. Let's try this again like civilized people. Roma's pulse jumped under her fingertips, his throat straining to move away from the blade. His eyes were dilated as he stared at her, adjusting to the shadows of the sunset, while the alleyway faded into a dusky violet. They were close enough to be sharing quick, short breaths, despite both of their best efforts to appear unbothered by the exertion of the struggle. Civilized? Roma echoed. His voice was scratchy. You have me at knife point. You had me at gunpoint. I'm on your territory, I had no choice. Juliet frowned, then pressed the knife in until a bead of blood appeared on its tip. Okay, stop, stop. Roma winced. I get it. One small slip of her hand now would cut his neck right open. She was almost tempted to give it a try. Everything between them felt far too familiar, too automatically intimate. She itched to be rid of that feeling, to slice it off like it was a malevolent tumor. Roma still smelled as he used to, like gunmetal and mint and the softness of a gentle zephyr. This close, she could determine that everything and yet nothing had changed. Go on, Juliet prompted wrinkling her nose. Explain yourself. Roma's eyes flickered up in vexation. He acted flippant, but Juliet was tracking his erratic pulse as it thudded away beneath her fingers. She could feel every jump and stutter of fear as she leaned in with her blade. I need information, Roma managed. Shocking. His eyebrows rose. If you let me go, I can explain. I'd prefer if you explain like this. Oh, Juliet. Click. The echo of the safety being pulled on a handgun sounded into the alley. Surprised, Juliet looked to her left, where the gun she had disarmed was still lying, untouched. She turned her gaze back to Roma and found him smiling, 
His beautiful, wicked lips quirked in mockery. What? Roma asked. He sounded almost teasing. You thought I only had one? The cold press of metal touched her waist. Its chill seeped through the fabric of her dress, printed its shape into her skin. Begrudgingly, slowly, Juliet removed her knife from Roma's throat and raised her hands high. She released her deathly grip on him, each step as prolonged as possible until she was standing up, striding backward to put herself two paces away from the pistol. In unison, with no other way to avoid a deadlock, they put their weapons away. The man who died at your club last night, Roma began. Do you remember his mismatched shoes? Juliet bit down on the insides of her cheeks, then nodded. I found the other half of one of the pairs in the Huangpu River, right where the rest of the men died the night of the mid-autumn festival, Roma went on. I think he escaped the first bloodshed. But he took the madness with him, took it to your club a day later, and then succumbed to it. Impossible, Juliet snapped immediately. What sort of science? We are past science, Juliet. Her indignation hot in her throat, Juliet brought her shoulders up to her ears and clutched her hands into fists. She entertained the idea of calling Roma paranoid, irrational, but unfortunately she knew how diligent he was when he found something to focus on. If he thought this a possibility, it was very likely a possibility. What are you saying? Roma folded his arms. I'm saying that I need to know for certain if it was indeed the same man. I need to see the other shoe on his corpse. And if the shoes match up, then this madness, it could be contagious. Juliet felt denial lay thick and heavy in her bones. The victim had died in her club, spraying blood onto a room full of her scarlets, coughing spittle into a gathering full of her people. If this was indeed a disease of the mind, a contagious disease of the mind, the Scarlet Gang was in big trouble. It could have been a suicide pact, she suggested without much conviction. Perhaps the man backed out, only to act later. But Juliet had looked into the dying man's eyes. In there, terror had been the only emotion that existed. God. She had looked into the dying man's eyes. If this was contagious, what was her risk of catching it? You sense it just as I do, Roma said. Something is not right here. By the time this goes through official channels to be investigated, more innocent people will have died from this peculiar madness. I need to know if it is spreading. Roma was looking right at Juliet when he fell silent. Juliet stared back, a deep coldness unfurling in her stomach. As if you care, she said softly, refusing to blink in case her eyes started watering, about innocent people dying. Every muscle along Roma's jaw tightened. Fine, he said sharply. My people. Juliet looked away. Two long seconds passed. Then she pivoted on her heel and started to walk. Hurry up, she called back. Just this once she would help him, and never again. Only because she, too, needed to know the answers he sought. The morgue will be closing soon. 8. They walked in tense, palpable silence. It was not that it was awkward, in honesty, that would have been preferable. It was rather that their proximity to each other, with Juliet walking ahead and Roma trailing three paces behind so they weren't seen together, was horrifyingly familiar, and, quite frankly, the last thing Juliet wanted to feel for Roma Montagov was nostalgia. Juliet dared a glance back as they worked through the long, winding streets of the French concession. Because there were so many foreigners here clambering for a piece of the city, the roads of the French concession reflected their greed, their scramble. Houses within each sector turned inward in a manner that, if viewed from the skies, almost appeared circular, huddling in on themselves to protect their underbelly. The streets here were just as busy as the Chinese parts of the city, but everything was somewhat more orderly. Barbers performed their duties on the pavement like usual. Only every few seconds they would reach down with their feet and neatly brush the discarded tufts of hair closer to the gutters. Vendors sold their wares at moderate volumes, rather than the usual screaming Juliet would hear in the western parts of Shanghai. It was not only the adaptations of the people that made the French concession peculiar, the buildings seemed to sit a little straighter, the water seemed to run a little clearer, 
the birds seemed to chirp a little louder. Perhaps they all sensed Roma Montagov's presence and were bristling in warning. And Roma was bristling right back, inspecting the houses with his eyes narrowed into the twilight. It hurt to look at him like this, unaware, curious. Careful that you don't trip, Roma intoned. Juliet glared at him, though he was still looking at the houses, then forced her gaze back onto the sidewalk before her. She should have known any sort of obliviousness from Roma Montagov was merely an act. She had once known him better than she knew herself. She used to be able to predict his every move, except the one time when it really mattered. Roma and Juliet met on an evening like this four years ago, right before this city imploded with the bustle of its new reputation. The year was 1922, and nothing was impossible. Planes dove and swooped in the sky and the last remnants of the Great War were being scrubbed clean. Humanity seemed to be on an upward turn from the fighting, and the hatred and the warfare that had once spilled over the edges, allowing the good things at the bottom to slowly rise. Even the blood feud in Shanghai had reached an unspoken sort of equilibrium, where instead of fighting, a scarlet and a white flower might nod coldly at one another if they were to pass on the streets. It was an atmosphere of hope that had welcomed Juliet when she stepped off the steamboat then, her legs unsteady after a month at sea. Mid-October, the air warm but becoming brisk, workers bantering by the port side as they volleyed packages into waiting boats. At fifteen, Juliet had come back with dreams. She was going to do something worthy of remembrance, be someone worthy of commemoration, ignite lives worth fighting for. It was a feeling she hadn't known when she left at the age of five, sent away with little more than some clothes, an elaborate fountain pen, and a photograph so she wouldn't forget what her parents looked like. It was the high of that feeling that had sent her chasing after Roma Montagov. Juliet's whole chest shuddered as she exhaled into the night. Her eyes burned, and quickly she wiped the sole tear that had fallen down her cheek, her teeth gritted hard. Are we almost there? Relax, Juliet said without turning around. She didn't dare, in case her eyes were glimmering under the dimly burning street lamps. I'm not leading you astray. Back then, she hadn't known who he was, but Roma had known her. He would reveal months later that he had rolled that marble at her on purpose, testing to see how she would react while she waited by the ports. The marble had come to a stop near her shoe, American shoes, shoes that wouldn't blend in with the cloth and heavy soles stomping down around her. That's mine. She remembered her head jerking up upon picking up the marble, thinking the voice belonged to a rough Chinese merchant. Instead, she had been looking into a pale, young face with the features of a foreigner, a smorgasbord of sharp lines and wide, concerned eyes. The accent with which he spoke the local dialect was even better than hers, and her tutor had refused to speak anything except Shanghainese in case she forgot it. Juliet had rolled the marble into her palm, closing her fingers around it tightly. It's mine now. It was almost funny now, how Roma had startled upon hearing her Russian, flawless, if a little stilted from a lack of practice. His brow furrowed. That's not fair. He stayed in the Shanghai dialect. Finders keepers. Juliet refused to switch out of Russian. Fine, Roma said finally returning to his native tongue so they spoke the same language. Play a game with me. If you win, you may keep the marble. If I win, I get it back. Juliet had lost, and rather grudgingly, returned the marble. But Roma had not started the game for the fun of it, and he wouldn't let her slip away that easily. When she turned to leave, he reached for her hand. I'm here every week at this time, he said sincerely we can play again. Juliet was laughing as she slid her fingers out of his hold. Just you wait, she called back. I'll win them all from you. She would find out later that the boy was Roma Montagov, the son of her greatest enemy. But she would return to find him anyway, thinking herself shrewd, thinking herself clever. For months they flirted and pretended and towed the line between enemy and friend, both knowing who the other was but neither admitting to it both trying to gain something from this friendship, but being uncareful, falling too deep without knowing. When they were launching marbles along the uneven ground, they were just Roma and Juliet, not Roma Montagov and Juliet Kai, 
the heirs of rival gangs. They were laughing kids who had found a confidant, a friend who understood the need to be someone else if only for a while each day. They fell in love. At least Juliet thought they had. Juliet. Juliet gasped, coming to a quick stop. In her days, she had been two heartbeats away from walking right into a parked rickshaw. Roma yanked her back, and instinctively, she looked up at him, at his certainty and cautiousness and clear, cold eyes. Let me go, Juliet hissed, yanking her arm away. We're almost to the hospital. Keep up. She hurried ahead, her elbow stinging where he had touched her. Roma was fast to follow, as he always was, as he had always known how, trailing after her in a way that seemed natural to the untrained eye, so that anybody looking upon them would think it to be a coincidence Roma Montaga and Juliet Kai were walking near each other, if the prying eye recognized them at all. The grandiose building ahead loomed into view. Number 17, Arsenal Road. We're here, Juliet announced coldly. The same hospital where they had brought all the bodies after the explosion. Keep your head down. Just to defy her, Roma squinted up at the hospital. He frowned like he could sense the familiarity of such a place merely by the shakiness of Juliet's voice. But of course he didn't, he couldn't. She watched him stand there, easy in his own skin, and felt her palms burn with fury. She supposed he knew exactly how deeply this city felt the weight of what he had done. The blood feud had never been as bloody in those first few months after his attack. If she had leaned in to smell the letters that Rosalind and Kathleen sent across the Pacific Ocean, breathed in the ink that they scrawled messily onto thick, white paper to describe the casualties, she imagined that she would have been able to smell the gore and violence that slit the streets red. She had believed Roma to be on the same side as her. She had believed that they could forge their own world, one free of the blood feud. Nothing but lies. The explosion in the servant's house was the most serious hit that the white flowers could ever get away with. They would have been spotted trying to blow the main mansion, but the servant's house was unwatched, dismissed, an afterthought. So many scarlet lives, gone in an instant. It had been a declaration of war. And it could not have been achieved without Roma's help. The way the men had snuck in, the way the gate had been left open, it was all intel that only Roma could have known from the weeks and weeks spent with Juliet. Juliet had been betrayed, and here she was, still reeling from it four years later. Here she was, harboring this pulsating lump of hatred burning in her stomach, that had only gotten hotter, and hotter in the years she had been robbed of a confrontation, an explanation, and yet still she did not have the courage to sink her knife right into Roma's chest, to get revenge in the only way she knew how. I am weak, she thought. Even as this hate consumed her, it was not enough to burn away every instinct she had to reach for Roma, to keep him from harm. Perhaps the strength to destroy him would come with time. Juliet simply needed to bite it. Head down, she prompted again, pushing through the double doors to enter the hospital foyer. Miss Kai, a doctor greeted as soon as Juliet approached the front desk. Can I help you with anything? Help me like this, with one hand, Juliet mimed her lips zipping shut. With the other, she leaned over the desk and swiped the key to the morgue. The doctor's eyes widened, but he looked away. The key cold in her palm, Juliet kept moving through the hospital, trying to breathe as shallowly as possible. It always smelled like decay here. Before long, they had reached the back of the hospital, and Juliet stopped in front of the door to the morgue with a huff. She turned around to face Roma, who had been walking while staring at his shoes, as commanded. Even with his best effort, his shrinking violet act wasn't convincing. Poor posture was ill-suited on him. He was born with pride stitched to his spine. In here, he asked. He sounded hesitant, like Juliet was leading him into a trap. Without speaking, Juliet slid the key in, unlocked the door, and flipped on the light switch, revealing the single corpse inside. It was lying on a metal table that took up half the floor space. Underneath the white-blue lighting, the dead man looked to have already wasted away, mostly covered by a sheet. Roma stepped in after her and took one look at the tiny room. He started toward the corpse, rolling up his sleeves. 
only before he could lift the sheet, he paused, hesitating. This is a small hospital, and someone else is probably going to die within the hour, Juliet prompted. Get a move on before they decide to transfer this man to a funeral home. Roma threw a glance back at Juliet, eyeing the impatient stance she had adopted. Do you have somewhere better to be? Yes, Juliet said without hesitation. Get on with it. Visibly prickled, Roma yanked the sheet off. He appeared to be surprised when he found bare feet on the man. Juliet pushed off from the wall. For crying out loud. She marched over and dropped to a crouch by the shelves beneath the metal table, retrieving a large box of bagged items and dumping out its contents. After tossing aside the slightly bloody wedding ring, the very bloody necklace, and the toupee, Juliet found the mismatched pair of shoes that had been on his feet that day. She peeled the bag open and shook the nicer one out. Yes. Roma's lips were thinned, his jaw pulled tight. Yes. Can we agree that this man was indeed at the scene, then? Juliet asked. Roma nodded. That was that. They didn't speak while Juliet put everything into the box again, her fingers working nimbly. Roma was somber, his eyes fixed to a random point on the wall. She figured that he couldn't wait to get out of here, to stretch the distance between their bodies as far as possible, and pretend the other didn't exist, at least until the next corpse of the blood feud got thrown over the territory lines. Juliet pushed the box back in and found her hands to be trembling. She scrunched them into fists, squeezing as hard as she could manage when she stood and met Roma's gaze. After you, he said, gesturing to the door. For years. It should have been enough. As the seasons blew by and all this time crawled forward, he should have become a stranger. He should have grown to smile differently, as Rosalind had, or walk differently, as Kathleen did. He should have turned more brash, like Tyler, or even adopted a wearier air, like Juliet's own mother. Only he looked at her now, and all he had become was, older. He looked at her and Juliet still saw the exact same eyes wearing the exact same stare, unreadable unless he let her through, unshakable unless he allowed himself to let go. Roma Montagov had not changed. The Roma who had loved her. The Roma who had betrayed her. Juliet forced herself to release her fists, her fingers aching from the tension she had squeezed into them. With the briefest nod in Roma's direction, allowing him to follow her back out. She reached for the door and waved him through, shutting the morgue after herself with a heavy finality and opening her mouth to bid Roma a cold, firm farewell. Only before she even had the chance to speak, she was interrupted by absolute, world-ending pandemonium within the hospital. At the far end of the corridor, doctors and nurses were wheeling gurneys, screaming at one another for an update on a situation or the location of a free room. Roma and Juliet ran forward immediately, returning to the lobby of the hospital. They were already expecting tragedy, but somehow, what they found was even worse. The floor was slick with crimson. The air was heavy. Everywhere they looked, dying scarlet gang members, gushing blood from their throats and screeching in agony. There had to be twenty, thirty, forty, either dying or already dead either motionless or presently still trying to dig their fingers into their own veins. Oh God, Roma whispered. It started. 9. When I peeked into his room, he was sleeping so soundly that I was a little afraid he had died in the night, Marshall said, nudging the dead man with his foot. I think he was faking it. Benedict rolled his eyes, then swatted Marshall's foot away from the corpse. Could you give Roma some credit? I think Roma is a pathological liar, Marshall replied, shrugging. He merely did not want to come out with us to look at dead bodies. Daylight had broken only an hour ago, but the streets were already roaring with activity. The sound of waves crashing onto the nearby boardwalk was barely audible from this alleyway, not with the chatter streaming in from the inner city. The early morning glow encased the cold streets like an aura. Steam at the ports and the smoke from the factories pumped steadily upward, thick, sooty, and heavy. Oh hush, Benedict said. You're distracting me from said task of inspecting dead bodies. Frowning deeply, he 
he was kneeling over the corpse that Marshall had nudged into the wall. Again, Benedict and Marshall had been assigned cleanup duty, which not only encompassed the cleanup of the bloody corpses, but also the cleanup of the municipal officers involved, paying off any and every legal force that tried to install themselves upon these dead gangsters. Distracting you? Marshall dropped to a squat so that he was level with Benedict. If that is so, you should thank me for relieving the morbidity. I would thank you if you helped me out, Benedict muttered. We need these men identified before noon. At this rate, the only thing we will have identified is the number of bodies here. He rolled his eyes when Marshall looked around and started counting. Six, Mars. Six, Marshall repeated. Six dead bodies. Six digit contracts. Six moons circling the world. Marshall adored the sound of his own voice. In any circumstance where there was silence, he took it upon himself as a favor to the world to fill it. Don't start. Benedict's protest went unheard. Shall I compare him to a winter's night? Marshall proclaimed. More breathtaking and more rugged, tempest breezes do tremble with less might. You saw a stranger for two seconds on the street, Benedict interrupted dully. Please calm down. With eyes like deadly nightshade, lips like fresh fruit. A freckle atop his left cheek like, Marshall paused, then suddenly shot to his feet, like this strangely shaped spot on the ground. Benedict stopped short, frowning. He stood too, squinting at the culpable object on the ground. It was much more than just a strangely shaped spot. It's another insect. Marshall lifted a leg onto a jutting brick in the wall. Oh, please no. Between the cracks in the pavement, a black speck dotted the cement, ordinary upon a mere, cursory glance. But just as an artist could pick out one accidental jerk of the paintbrush amid a smorgasbord of intentional slashes, the moment Benedict's eye landed on the speck, a shudder swept down his spine and told him that the canvas of the world had made a mistake. This creature wasn't supposed to be here. It's the same, he said, gingerly pinching his fingers around the insect. It's the same sort of insect as the ones we found at the port and took to the laboratory. When Benedict picked up the single dead thing and showed it to his wayward friend, he expected Marshall to make some crude comment or construct a song about the fragility of life. Instead, Marshall furrowed his brows. Do you remember Tsarina? he asked suddenly. Even for Marshall's usual tangents and long-winded stories, this abrupt topic switch was odd. Still, Benedict entertained him and replied, of course. Their golden retriever had passed away only last year. It had been a strange, mournful day, both in respect for their furry companion and in peculiarity over a death that for once hadn't occurred with the press of a bullet and a spray of blood. Do you remember when Lord Montagu first got her? Marshall continued. Do you remember her bounding through the streets and rubbing noses with every other animal she encountered, be it a cat or a wild rat? Marshall was trying to get at something, but Benedict could not yet determine what. He would never understand the way people like Marshall talked, in circles upon circles, until his speech was the Ouroboros swallowing itself. Yes, of course, Benedict answered, frowning. She caught so many fleas that they were jumping in and out of her fur. The Ouroboros finally spat out its own tail. Knife. Benedict motioned for Marshall to rummage through his pockets. Give me your knife. Without missing a beat, Marshall flicked a blade free and tossed. The handle glided into Benedict's palm cleanly, and Benedict sliced the point down, shearing a strip through the corpse's hair as thoroughly as he could. When the loose hair fell to the ground, Benedict and Marshall leaned in at once to examine the dead man's scalp. Only then did Benedict nearly throw up inside his mouth. That, Marshall deadpanned, is disgusting. There was only an inch of skin on show, an inch of grey-white between two crops of thick black hair. But in this space, a dozen pinky nail-sized bumps bulged forth, dotted homes for dead insects that had taken up residence just below the first layer of skin. Benedict's scalp itched with phantom crawling at the sight, at the curled exoskeletons thinly visible under the membrane, at the legs and antennae and thoraxes trapped and frozen in time. Benedict tightened his grip on the knife. 
cursing himself for his curiosity, he slowly flattened the tufts of the dead man's hair so it wasn't blocking his view of the exposed skin. Then, with his teeth gritted together, and a wince dancing on the edge of his tongue, he pushed the tip of the blade into one of the bumps. There was no sound of release nor any fluid discharge, as Benedict had been expecting from a sight so disgusting. Intense silence, interspersed only by the occasional toot of a car chugging along the nearby street, Benedict used the knife to slit the thin skin atop one of the dead insects. Go on, Benedict said when one formerly buried insect became semi-exposed. Give it a pull. Marshall looked at him as if he had suggested that they both slaughter a baby and eat it. You must be joking. My hands are both occupied, Mars. I hate you. Marshall inhaled a deep breath. He stuck two fingers gingerly into the slit. He pulled out the dead insect. It came into the world with veins and vessels and capillaries attached to its belly. It was as if the insect were an entity unto itself and the dead man grew out of it, when really, the paper-thin lines of pink and white sprouting from the insect were being pulled from the man's brain. Benedict could have been fooled. The veins trembled as a stray gust of wind blew in from the waterfront. What do you know? Benedict said. I think we just discovered what's causing the madness. 10. A few days later, Juliet was on a warpath for Leeds. Stay alert, she told Rosalind and Kathleen quietly outside the squat building of an opium den. Across the street, there were two doors with red roses taped to them, a scarlet calling card in theory, but a loud, clear threat in reality. Rumor had it that the scarlet started using red roses only in mockery of the white flowers, who would paste any old white flower to the doors of the buildings they took in territory disputes. But the use of the red rose had begun so long ago that Juliet wasn't sure if there was any truth to the claim. All that was certain was that having a red rose taped to one's door was a last warning, to pay up, give in, cash out, or do whatever it was that the Scarlet Gang had demanded of you, else face the consequences. This entire street was under Scarlet control, but every territory had its problem areas. Stick close to me, Juliet continued, waving her cousins forward. The moment they entered the opium den and stepped upon damp, uneven floorboards, the three girls were instinctively pressing their hands to the line of their hips or the band of their waists, comforted only by the presence of the weapons hiding under the rich fabric of their clothing. There may be active assassins working here. Assassins? Kathleen echoed, her voice pitching high. I thought we came here to shake unpaid rent money for your father. We are. Juliet parted the beaded curtains, stepping through the partition, and into the main den, where the smells of distorted histories and forced addictions floated freely. The scents wafting into her nose reminded her of a rose on fire, of perfume mixed with gasoline, and set aflame until the remaining ash could be used as thick, heady cosmetics. But the scarlet grapevine tells me this is also a socializing ground for communists. They paused in the middle of the den. The remnants of old China were stronger here, amid the various paraphernalia, the pipes and the oil lamps, that had been brought over from before the turn of the century. The decor lagged well behind the times too, for while the chandeliers on the ceiling looked like the ones hanging golden, and glittering in every Shanghai burlesque club, the bulbs were covered in a thin layer of grime, oily in appearance. Be careful, Juliet warned. She eyed the bodies slumped against the walls of the den. I doubt these people are as docile as they look. A few centuries ago, when this place was still the home estate of a royal or a general, it might have been opulent and lush. Now it was a husked-out building of missing floorboards and a ceiling sagging with the weight of itself. Now the couches bore holes where patrons extended their legs, and the armrests were worn down where patrons rubbed their grubby hands before tossing up a few cents and hurrying out, that is, if they weren't enticed into the back rooms first. As Juliet craned her neck and searched the den for the madam in charge, she heard giggling echo from the corridors. In the next few seconds, a group of young women skittered out, each dressed in a different pale-colored hanfu, which Juliet supposed was an attempt to invoke the nostalgia of China's previous eras. If only the skirts of their hanfu weren't caked with dirt, and their hairpins weren't one sharp motion from falling out. If only their giggles weren't incredulously fake even to the untrained ear 
Their red smiles curved vivaciously, but their eyes dull. Juliet sighed. In Shanghai, it was easier to count the establishments that didn't double as brothels than the ones that did. How can I help you? Juliet turned around, searching for the voice who had spoken cheerily from behind. Madam, as she called herself, was inclined upon one of the couches, a lamp burning away beside her, and a pipe tossed carelessly across her torso. When Juliet wrinkled her nose, Madame rose, inspecting Juliet just as closely as Juliet was inspecting the black stains on the older woman's hands. I'll be, Madame said. Juliet Kai. I haven't seen you since you were four years old. Juliet raised an eyebrow. I wasn't aware we had ever met. Madame pursed her pale lips. You wouldn't remember, of course. In my mind, you'll always be a little thing toddling around the gardens, oblivious to everything else in the world. Aha, uh -huh, Juliet said. She shrugged flippantly. My father failed to mention this. Madame's eyes stayed level, but her shoulders hitched with the slightest signal of offense. I was rather good friends with your mother for some time, she harumphed, until, well, I'm sure you heard that somebody accused me of being too friendly with the white flowers a decade ago. It was all hogwash, of course. You know I hate them as much as you do. I don't hate the white flowers, Juliet shot back immediately. I hate those who harm the people I love. Most often they tend to be the white flowers. There's a difference. Madame sniffed. With every attempt she was making to relate to Juliet, she was getting pushed away. Juliet could keep at this all day. She loved picking holes in other people. Indeed, but don't let them hear you say that, Madam muttered. She shifted her attention away from Juliet then, changing tactics and grabbing Rosalind's wrist, crooning, Oh, I know you. Rosalind Lang. I knew your father, too, of course. Such precious children. I was so upset when you were sent to France. You won't believe how much your father crowed on about the excellence of a Western education. Her eyes turned to Kathleen. A beat passed. Juliet cleared her throat. Baba sent us here to collect, she explained, hoping it would direct Madame's attention back to her. You owe. But who are you? Madame asked, interrupting Juliet to address Kathleen. Kathleen narrowed her eyes. Rather tightly, she replied, I'm Kathleen. Madame made a performance out of searching her memory. Oh, Kathleen. I remember now. She gushed, clicking her fingers. You used to be so rude, always sticking your tongue out at me. I was a child, so you will have to forgive my past misdeeds, Kathleen replied dryly. Madame pointed at Kathleen's forehead. You have the Sagittarius constellation birthmark too. I thought I remembered. Who? Kathleen interrupted. It sounded like a dare. Who do you remember having it? Well, Madam said, embarrassed now. There used to be three of you Lang siblings, right? You had a brother, too. Juliet thinned her lips. Rosalind hissed through her teeth. But Kathleen, Kathleen only stared at Madam with the flattest look in her eyes and said, Our brother is dead. I'm sure you heard. Yes, well, I'm very sorry, Madam said, sounding not sorry at all. I also lost a brother. Sometimes I think. Enough, Juliet interrupted. This had gone on long enough. Can we speak elsewhere? Madame crossed her arms tightly and pivoted on her heel. She did not ask for the three scarlets to follow her, but they did so anyway, trotting along and pressing up against the walls when they had to pass the pastel girls flittering about the narrow hallways. Madame led them into a bedroom decorated in various shades of red. There was another door here, one that led straight out onto the streets. Juliet wondered if it was for easy escape or easy entrance. I have your rent money. They watched Madame wade through the discarded clothes on her floor, reaching under the slab of a mattress she called a bed to retrieve her money. Muttering beneath her breath, Madame counted the coins, each clinking into her palm to the tune of the groaning ceiling beans. Madame extended her arm offering Juliet the money in her fist. Actually, Juliet closed her hand around Madame's and pushed the money back. Keep it. 
there is something else I would prefer. Madame's pleasant expression faltered. Her eyes swiveled to the side, to the other door. And what would that be? Juliet smiled. Information. I want your knowledge regarding the communists. The pleasant expression on Madame's face dropped entirely. I beg your pardon? I know you let them frequent this place for their meetings. Juliet cocked her head, once at Kathleen and once at Rosalind. The two sisters broke away from their positions beside her and fanned into the room, each planting themselves in front of an exit. I know one of these back rooms isn't holding a girl and her eternal pleasure ride, it holds a table and a fireplace to keep the members of the Communist Party of China warm. So tell me, what have you heard about their role in this madness sweeping through the city? Madame barked out a sudden laugh. She lifted her lips too wide. Juliet could see the thick gap between her two front teeth. I haven't a clue what you mean, Madame said. I keep out of their business. Is it fear or loyalty preventing her from talking? Juliet wondered. Madame was scarlet associated but not a gangster, loyal to the cause but not quite willing to die for it. Of course. How rude of me to assume, Juliet said. She rifled through her pocket, then grinned brighter than the thin, diamond necklace she had retrieved, now dangling between her fingers. Will you accept a gift from me to make up for my insolence? Juliet skittered behind Madame before Madame could protest, and Madame did not move, either, for what was the harm in taking a diamond necklace? It was not a diamond necklace. Madame squawked when Juliet pulled the garrote wire tight, her fingers flying up to scrabble at the pressure digging into her skin. By then the wire was already wrapped around her neck, the microblades piercing in. Those who are loyal to the Scarlet Gang are dropping dead in droves, Juliet hissed. Those who dirty their hands for us are falling victim to the madness, while people like you remain tight-lipped, unable to decide whether you bleed scarlet or fight for the workers' red rags. Thin beads of blood bubbled to the surface of Madame's smooth skin, enough to stain the hues of her neck. If Juliet pulled the wire only a hair's breadth further, the blades would dig deep enough to scar upon healing. Which shade do you bleed, madam? Scarlet or red? Stop, stop. She wheezed. I speak. I speak. Juliet loosened the wire a minuscule fraction. Then speak. What role do the communists play in this madness? They do not claim responsibility for the madness, madam managed. As a group, they remain resolute that this is not of their political doing. Privately, however, they speculate. Regarding what? Juliet demanded. They think one genius within the party schemed it up. Madame's fingers tried to claw at the wire again, but the wire was too thin for her to secure a grip. All she achieved was scratching, her nails grazing at skin as if she were mocking the madness as victims. They whisper of having seen one man's notes, planning it all. Who? When Madame seemed to hesitate, her tongue gagging forward, Juliet pulled the wire tighter in threat. By the door, Rosalind cleared her throat, an unspoken recommendation for Juliet to ease up and watch herself, but Juliet did not falter. She only said, her voice as calm as the morning tide, I want a name. Jean Gutai, Madame spat out. The Secretary General of the Communists. Immediately, Juliet let go of the wire, bringing it back to her side and giving it a shake. She retrieved a handkerchief from her pocket, giving the chain a wipe down until it was sparkly and silver once again. When she tucked the wire away, she offered Madame the handkerchief with the same bright smile she reserved for working flapper parties and charming old men. Madame was pale and shaking. She did not protest when Juliet tied the handkerchief around her neck, carefully adjusting the fabric until it soaked up the line of blood. I apologize for your troubles, Juliet said. You'll keep this between us, won't you?" Madame nodded blankly. She did not move when Juliet summoned Rosalind and Kathleen back to her side, nor did she protest when Juliet tossed all the cash she had in her pocket onto the table to belatedly pay Madame for the information. Juliet marched out of the room, her heels echoing loudly as she exited the den with her cousins. She was already forgetting how steady her grip had been upon the wire, 
how willing she had been to hurt Madame for what she wanted to hear. All she could think about was the name she had received, Jean Gutai, and how she was to proceed next. Kathleen watched her the entire car ride back. Juliet could feel it like a slick sweep of grease across her forehead, something that was bothering her without doing any harm. What? Juliet finally demanded when the car stopped to let Rosalind out. As soon as Rosalind slammed the door after herself, shrugging her fur throw over her shoulders and strutting into the burlesque club to do her noon shift, Juliet slid across the back seat until she was directly before Kathleen, who was slouched across the seats facing her. Why do you keep giving me that funny look? Kathleen blinked. Oh. I wasn't aware you had noticed. Juliet rolled her eyes, raising her legs to rest on the soft cushion beside Kathleen. The car started back up, the crunch of gravel beneath its wheels loud. Biagia, you underestimate the eyes I have, she gestured all over her face, everywhere. Did I cause offense? No, of course not, Kathleen said quickly. Slowly, she sat up straight, then gestured to Juliet's hands. Juliet looked down. There was a smear of blood that she hadn't managed to clean in the soft space between her thumb and index finger. I guess I was expecting you to just wave a gun around or something. I didn't think you would actually threaten her. Kathleen had always been the pacifist. In the letters that she and Rosalind had sent to America, while Juliet was away, always tucked within the same envelope, Juliet could immediately tell the difference between the sisters. There was the matter of handwriting, of course. Rosalind's big loopy letters when she wrote in English or French in her wide, spread out Chinese characters, as if each stroke were trying to run away from the others. Kathleen, on the other hand, always wrote like she was running out of space. She squished her letters and strokes until they overlapped, sometimes carving up the previous character with the brunt of the next. But beneath that, even if they had typed their letters out on a typewriter, Juliet could tell. Rosalind wrote on the state of affairs as anyone in this city would. She was bright and witty from years of education in classical literature. The sweetness of her words would drip onto the page as she bemoaned Juliet's absence and told her she would have been beside herself if she had seen Mr. Ping last week when his suit pants ripped down the middle. It wasn't that Kathleen wasn't as well read, Kathleen merely looked inward. She would never write a summary on the latest blood feud casualty, and then offer a wise idiom on the cyclical nature of violence. She would lay out a step-by-step -step procedure on stopping further brutality so they could live in peace, then wonder why nobody in the Scarlet Gang seemed to be capable of doing so. Juliet had always had an answer. She only never had the heart to tell Kathleen. It was because they didn't want to. Madame deals with the riffraff day in, day out. Juliet set her chin in her hand. Do you think she would be scared at the mere sight of a gun? Kathleen sighed irritably, smoothing down her hair. Nevertheless, Juliet, it's not like. You have been present at some of my father's business meetings, no? Juliet interrupted. I heard Mama say Giorgio brought you and Rosalind along for some time a few years ago, before you lost the stomach for it. It was only Rosalind who lost the stomach. Kathleen countered evenly, but yes, our father did take us along for some negotiations. Negotiations, Juliet mocked, leaning back in the seat. Her voice came out in a sneer, but the derision wasn't directed at Kathleen. It was directed at the way the Scarlet Gang worked their own language, as if everybody did not already know the truth. They should begin calling it what it really was, extortion, blackmail. Having arrived at their destination, the car slowed to an idle outside the mansion gates, its engine rumbling. The gates surrounding the house were new, replaced right after Juliet left. They were an utter nuisance for the men stationed out front whenever relatives arrived every five minutes hoping to enter, and now the two on duty hurried to pull the heavy metal spires open before Juliet could yell at them for being slow. But that was the price for safety in the face of ever-present danger. You remember, don't you? Juliet asked. My father's tactics? She had seen plenty during those short few months of her first return. Even before that, when Juliet was only a child, 
some of her earliest memories were of raising her arms to be picked up and smelling blood emanating off her father when he did so. The Scarlet Gang did not tolerate weakness. Yes, Kathleen said. So if he can do it, Juliet continued, why shouldn't I? Kathleen had nothing to say to that. She merely sighed a little sigh and flopped her hands to either side of herself in defeat. The car came to a complete stop. A maid was already waiting to open the door, and though Juliet took the helping hand out, it was only a matter of courtesy, in her beaded dress, it was easy for her to scoot out of the car and step down from its high elevation. Kathleen, meanwhile, needed a few seconds to make a dignified exit, the confines of her cheap house slowing her progress. By the time Kathleen's shoes crunched down on the driveway, Juliet was already heading toward the front door angling her head toward the sunlight to warm her cold face. It would all fall into place. She needn't worry. She had a name. First thing tomorrow, she would show up at this John Gutai's place of work and confront him. One way or another, Juliet would stop this madness nonsense before her people suffered for it. Then a shriek shot through the gardens. Ollie, what's wrong with you? Juliet whirled around reacting fast to the panic echoing through the gardens. Her heart stuttered in horror. It's too late. The madness had come knocking on her doorstep. No, 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 Juliet hissed, rushing toward the flower beds. There, Ollie had been on her way back into the house, a laundry basket filled with clothing propped on her hip. Only now the basket was lying on the roses, bundles of folded clothing crushing them without mercy and Ollie was tearing at her own throat. Get her onto the floor, Juliet yelled at the nearby gardener, the one who had gotten Juliet's attention in the first place with his shriek. Kathleen, get help. Juliet took one of Ollie's shoulders. The gardener took the other. Together they tried their hardest to force the maid down, but by the time Ollie's head thudded against the soft soil of the rose beds, her fingers were already knuckle-deep into the muscle and tendon running through her neck. There was a horrible wet, tearing sound, a sensation of dampness as blood spurted outward, and then Juliet could see bone, could see clearly every ridge of ivory white spliced neatly through the pink red of Ollie's neck. Ollie's eyes turned glassy. Her hand slackened, the chunks of torn flesh sliding from her loosened grasp and dropping to the ground. Juliet wanted to throw up. The blood pouring from Ollie's throat ran and ran, seeping into the soil until the earth was stained dark until the stain grew large enough to stop merely a few feet away from the former side of the old servant's house, where nurse, too, had met her end. This is why, Juliet thought numbly. This is why we shall not love more than we need to. Death will come for everyone in the end. A terrified scream shot out from the main house. Kathleen. Juliet bolted to her feet. Kathleen, she roared. Kathleen, where are you? Juliet, come. Juliet slammed through the front door and sprinted through the living room, drawing concerned gasps from the few confused ants who had risen from their gossiping on the couches. In a frenzy, she skidded into the kitchen to find Kathleen standing by the long counter, her body frozen in horror, hands pressed to her mouth and muffling her words in an effort not to scream. A cook was writhing on the floor, blood already trickling down his forearms. Three feet away, under the doorway into the main hallway, another maid was in the process of collapsing, leaning against the jam, and striking herself to resist the madness. Step back. The maid collapsed. The first arc of blood from her throat flew wide, staining the intricate carvings of the doorway and painting the beige walls into an abstraction. Faintly, Juliet wondered if they would ever be able to get such a stain out, or if it would remain in this house forever. Even when painted over or scrubbed viciously from the jam, its presence would remain, stinking up the room with the Scarlet's failure to protect their own. The maid stilled. It seemed that was what finally jolted Kathleen into acting, because she surged forward then with a strangled gasp, her long hair swinging and shaking into her face in her haste. This madness, it could be contagious. Stop. Juliet shrieked. Kathleen froze in her steps. The only sound that could be heard in the sudden silence was Juliet's heavy breathing. She turned back, facing the two ants who had cautiously crept into the kitchen. 
they covered their mouths in horror, but Juliet didn't give them time to be horrified. Send for some of the men out front to clean this up, she said. Tell them to wear gloves. 11. Juliet slammed the trunk of the car shut, clicking its latch so vigorously that the vehicle shuddered up and down on its tires. Ready, she called to the driver. Go forth. Through the rearview mirror, the driver gave a grim nod. The car started to pull away from the gravel driveway, rumbling in the direction of the front gate, and toward the nearest hospital. The dead bodies in the trunk would be out of Juliet's hands then. She hoped the hospital appreciated how delicately the scarlets had wrapped the corpses in thick bedsheets. Miss Kai. Juliet turned, finding a messenger coming her way. Yes. The messenger gestured back at the house. Your parents have come downstairs. They ask what is occurring. Oh, now they come down, Juliet muttered under her breath. Not when there was screaming in the hallways. Not when Juliet was yelling obscenities so the gangsters would hurry up with the spare bedsheets, and the maids would fetch water so the servants could attempt to scrub out the stains on the floorboards. They were going to need to hire some heavy-duty cleaners. I'll go speak to my parents. Juliet sighed. She strolled past the messenger, shoulders heavy with anticipation. Her parents might have been taking a meeting upstairs, but dozens of relatives had witnessed the terrible deaths, and talk in this house spread fast. But when Juliet came back into the living room, she had to do a double take, seeing what seemed to be the entirety of her family. Are we having a party I wasn't invited to? Juliet jeered, halting to a stop at the threshold. There were still bloodstains in the kitchen, and her relatives were all gathered here in mass. Did they want to get infected and die? Lord Kai stood, cutting off whichever relative had been speaking within the gathering. Juliet, he said, inclining his chin up the staircase. There was something in his hands. A few slips of creamy white paper. Expensive paper. Come. It was as clear a dismissal as any for the rest of the household. While everybody else dispersed, however, Tyler remained on the couch, his hands placed behind his head like he had all the time in the world. He cocked his head at Juliet's death glare, feigning obliviousness. Juliet bit down on her tongue. She scuttled up the stairs after her father. What are we to do with the bloodstains? She asked as they filtered into his office. Her mother was already there, seated on the other side of her father's desk and browsing through reports. We will have someone come to clean it, Lady Kai replied, looking up and flicking a phantom speck of dust off the sleeve of her chipao. I am more concerned with why people were tearing their throats out in this house in the first place. It's the madness, Juliet interrupted. It's here, and it could be a viral contagion. We need to ask the other maids who were in contact with the victims to remain in their rooms for a few days. Her father sat down in his own big chair and crossed his hands over his stomach. Her mother tilted her head quizzically. And how do you know it is a contagion? Lord Kai asked. Though Juliet froze at the question, Belatedly realizing she had relayed a detail from Roma, her father did not sound suspicious. He had only asked the question plainly, as he did in any everyday conversation. She told herself to calm down. If her father were suspicious, he was the type to make the fact simple and clear. Word on the street, Juliet replied. It may only get worse from here on out. Lady Kai pinched the bridge of her nose. She shook her head waving off the thought. Three dead in this household still does not stand up against the thousands being swayed by the political tide. Juliet blinked. But, Mama, don't you wish to know why everybody was gathered around in such fascination downstairs? Lord Kai cut in. He pushed the paper in his hands onto the desk, angling them so that Juliet could get a good look. The conversation had moved on then. The madness was truly only an offshoot of politics in their minds. Fine, Juliet thought. If she was the only one with the right priorities, then she could solve this whole damn thing on her own. Juliet picked up the smaller slip of paper, her own name immediately catching her attention. Miss Kai, I would love to see you there. Paul. What is this? Juliet demanded. An invitation, Lady Kai explained 
to a masquerade party in the French concession next week. Juliet leaned in to read the bigger piece of paper, tooting under her breath. She didn't like the sound of this. Foreigners extending their hands in invitation could only mean demands and expectations. It is the French who are summoning us, she asked. The function is a joint venture between the different foreign powers, her father replied softly. In a mocking tone, he added, the French, British, Americans, and everyone else, they wish to come together and celebrate the native powers of Shanghai, reciting the text just as Juliet's eyes scanned over it. Our hospitality is extended to all under the protection of Lord Kai, it read. This party was inviting every member of the Scarlet Gang. Lady Kai scoffed. If the foreigners wanted to celebrate us, they could begin by remembering this is our country, not theirs. Juliet turned to look at her mother, curious. Distaste was fouling the lines in Lady Kai's face, deepening the grooves that she spent each morning covering with a layer of fine powder. However, Lord Kai continued, as if his wife hadn't made a scathing remark, it is the French who wish to meet with us. There's another card lurking here somewhere. After a few seconds of confused searching, Juliet lifted the bigger sheet of paper and found the third and final card, the same size as the one from Paul. This one was for her father, from the Consul General of France in Shanghai. There were only two lines of writing. He was requesting a meeting at the party to discuss the situation in Shanghai, whatever that meant. Well, Juliet said, does this mean trouble for us? It may not be trouble. Lord Kai shrugged. We will have to see. Juliet narrowed her eyes. She didn't like how her parents had drifted into a pregnant silence, one that was waiting for something, something. I certainly hope you're not going to make me go to this masquerade, Juliet guessed contemptuously. I am not going to make you go like some tyrant, her father replied. But I would strongly prefer it if you attended with me. Baba, Juliet whined. I did enough partying in New York to last nine lives. The French can say they want to discuss the state of affairs in Shanghai all they like, but we know they're useless. Juliet, her mother scolded. What? Juliet retorted, righteous. No, no, she is right, Lord Kai said. The French wish to meet only to discuss the Scarlet Militia. They wish to hear how many people I have under my control and they wish to have my cooperation under the possibility of a communist revolt. That is all true. Her father leaned forward then, pinpointing his gaze on her, and suddenly Juliet regretted whining, because she felt like a child being told off for protesting an early bedtime. But we still need allies. We need power, we need customers, and we need their support. And I need you to be my little translator when they mutter among themselves in French, thinking I cannot understand them. Juliet made a disgruntled noise at the back of her throat. Very well, she said. She reached for the letter of invitation and shoved it in her pocket, wanting to examine it more in her own time. I'll go, mais si ne pas de bon giari. She strode for the door, dismissing herself. She was so close, one hand was already on the handle and her body was in midstride, when her mother called out, wait. Juliet halted. This. Paul, Lady Kai said. Why is he calling after you? Lady Kai had said his name like it was some magic spell used for summoning. As if it held some grand weight to it rather than it be one syllable of lackluster annoyance. He is Walter Dexter's son, Juliet replied, apathetic. They are still trying to hire us as middlemen for their drug trade. Lady Kai mulled over that for a long moment. Then she said, is he handsome? Ugh, please. Juliet pushed forward. He is using me, mama. It is that simple. Please excuse me now. I have work to, what are you doing? That latter part was directed at Tyler, who had been lurking close enough to the door that Juliet had hit his shoulder when it opened. Calm down, Tyler said. I'm on my way to the washroom. They both knew that was a big, fat lie, as wide as Tyler's monstrous smile, and as long as his list of crimes. Juliet closed her father's office door after herself with a solid thud. She stared at her cousin, waiting, and he only stared back. His cheek was still bright with its cut, 
having not yet fully scabbed over. Do you have something you'd like to say to me, Tyler? Juliet asked. Only one, Tyler replied. His eyes flitted up, knowing her parents could still hear this conversation. I'm very excited to attend this party. Le moment o 2 nes plus udal. J.E. Sarai pret a prendre ta place. Juliet stiffened. Satisfied with the reaction he had incited, Tyler grinned again and merrily pivoted on his heel, strolling down the hallway with his hands shoved into his pockets and a low whistle sounding from his mouth. When you stop being useful, I'll be here to replace you. V.A.T.E. fair fautre, Juliet muttered. She took the stairs down two at a time, glared at the relatives who were still chatting on the couches, then made a beeline for the kitchen. There she found Kathleen, who was still peering at the stains in the floor tiles. She was also chomping on an apple, though it was beyond Juliet how her cousin managed to have an appetite. Any luck? Juliet asked. Oh, I gave up trying to clean out the stains ten minutes ago, Kathleen replied. I'm just inspecting that one because it looks like a cat. Juliet blinked. Kathleen took another bite of her apple. Too soon? Way too soon, Juliet said. Are you busy right now? I need your communist ties. For the last time, Kathleen threw her apple core into the trash can, knowing who our spies are in the party does not qualify me as a communist. What am I finding? Juliet put her hands on her hips. Jean Goutai's home address. Kathleen wrinkled her brow, trying to place the name. You can't find his workplace. He edits that newspaper, doesn't he? I can go poke around his workplace too, Juliet confirmed, but I want alternatives. Alternatives was a funny way of putting it. Juliet wanted his home address so she could break in and rummage around his belongings, should his answers in person prove lacking. But she didn't have to clarify for Kathleen. Kathleen knew. She mocked a salute, her lips quirking. On it. Lice. Roma echoed in horror. Lice-like, Lorenz emphasized, his correction accompanied by a sigh. He pointed to the strip of skin he had slid off the corpse, where the thick membranes were bulging with little pockets of dead insects. Benedict was slightly green, and Marshall had his fingers pressed to his mouth. They jump from host to host through the hair, then burrow into the scalp, Lorenz went on. He pushed down on an insect with his finger. Nearby, one of the scientists was blanching at the sight, unable to pull his curiosity away from the unconventional autopsy happening right atop the work table. No matter, the white flowers had seen stranger things. Good God, Marshall muttered. We could have been infected. Benedict made an offended noise. They're dead already, he replied, gesturing forward with his hand. And yet you made me pull one out, Marshall retorted. He shuddered, his full body vibrating with the motion. So revolting. Roma tapped his fingers against the work table. The lab was devoid of proper fresh air, and he had hardly slept the night before. His head was starting to pound with ferocity. Gentlemen, he prompted, trying to redirect Benedict's and Marshall's attention back to Lauren's. It did not work. The future well-being of the white flowers thanks you. Oh please, what will they know of my heroism? Roma exchanged a glance with Lawrence and shook his head. There was no point trying to butt in when Benedict and Marshall got like this. When they weren't scheming together, they were bickering together. It was almost always about the most nonsensical things that truly did not require an hour-long debate, yet regardless, Roma's two friends engaged in them, sometimes until their faces turned red. Roma wasn't sure if Benedict and Marshall were fated to eventually kill each other or kiss each other. Anyhow, Lauren said, clearing his throat when there was the slightest lull in the argument, with the resources we have here, we may be more advantaged than Shanghai's hospitals. I'd like to try to figure out how to engineer a cure, if that pleases you. Yes, Roma all but pleaded. That would be great. Thank you, Lawrence. Don't rush to thank me yet. Lawrence tooted. I cannot find a cure for this odd infestation without the help of you youth. Marshall quirked an eyebrow. 
Benedict jammed his elbow into Marshall's ribs to keep him from making any sarcastic remark about his youth. Anything, Roma promised. I'll need to run experiments, Lauren said. He nodded to himself. You must find me a live victim. A live. This time, it was Roma who jammed his elbow into Marshall's side. We're on it, Roma said quickly. Thank you, Lawrence. Truly. When Lawrence nodded his begrudging acceptance of such a sentiment, Roma pushed away from the work table, gesturing for Benedict and Marshall to follow suit, and the three of them took their leave. Roma was rather impressed that Marshall managed to stay silent until they pushed through the front doors. It was only when they were upon the sidewalk, under the thick clouds of the city, that Marshall finally erupted with, how the hell do you propose we bring him a live victim? Roma sighed, shoving his hands deep in his pockets. He started back in the direction of the White Flower headquarters with his cousin trailing close on his tail. Marshall, meanwhile, as a bundle of unspent energy, bounced in front of them, walking backward. You're going to trip on a pebble, Benedict warned. You're giving me a headache, Roma added. We don't know who's a victim of the madness until they succumb to it, Marshall went on, ignoring them both. As soon as someone is succumbing, how would we keep them alive long enough to take them to the lab? Roma shut his eyes momentarily. When he opened them again, they felt like they weighed a thousand tons. I don't know. The throbbing in his head was only getting worse. Roma hardly contributed to conversation as they made their way home, and when the turn into the main building block appeared, he ducked through with a muttered goodbye leaving Benedict and Marshall to stare after him before they proceeded to their own living quarters. His friends would forgive him. Roma fell silent when he needed to think, when the city grew far too loud, and he could hardly hear his own thoughts. Roma eased the front door shut. All he needed was a moment of quiet, and then he could have a grand OL time trying to figure out a plan for Lawrence. Roma's head jerked up, his foot stalling on the first step of the staircase. At the landing of the second floor, his father was staring down at him. Without any prelude, Lord Montagoff simply extended his arm, a piece of paper held between his fingers. Roma thought that his father would meet him halfway as he made his way up the stairs, but Lord Montagoff remained where he was, forcing Roma to trek forward in a hurry so as not to keep his father waiting, almost panting by the time he was close enough to take the slip of paper. It bore a name and an address written in loopy scrawl. Find him, Lord Montagoff sneered when Roma looked up for an explanation. My sources say that the communists may be the cause of this insipid madness. Roma's fingers tightened on the slip of paper. What he demanded. The communists have been seeking our help for years. And given that we keep refusing them, his father cut in, they are switching tactics. They make their revolution by squashing our power before we can counter their efforts. Stop them. Could it be a motive as simple as politics? Kill the gangsters so there was no opposition. Infect the workers so they were angry and desperate enough to buy into any revolutionary screaming in their ear. Easy as a river breeze. How am I to stop a whole political faction? Roma murmured, merely deliberating aloud. How am I to? A hard knock came on his skull. Roma flinched, moving away from his father's knuckles to avoid a second blow. He should have known better than to muse within his father's earshot. I gave you an address, did I not? Lord Montagoff snapped. Go. See how much truth there is in this claim. With that, his father turned and disappeared back into his office, the door slamming. Roma was left behind on the stairs holding the slip of paper, his head throbbing worse than before. Very well, he muttered bitterly. Kathleen trailed along the waterfront, her steps slow against the hard granite. This far east, it was almost quiet, the usual screaming by the bund replaced by clanging shipbuilding warehouses and lumber companies rumbling to finish their day's work. Almost quiet, but hardly peaceful. There was no place in Shanghai that would qualify as peaceful. Better hurry, she muttered to herself, checking the pocket watch in her sleeve. The sun would soon be setting, and it got cold by the Huangpu River. Kathleen paced the rest of the way to the cotton mill, taking not the front entrance, 
but a back window, right into the workers' break room. These laborers weren't offered many breaks, but as the end of their shifts crept nearer, more of them would come around to take a breather, and when Kathleen delicately climbed through the window, swinging her legs in, there was indeed a woman sitting there, eating rice out of a container. The woman almost spat her rice out through her nose. Sorry, sorry, didn't mean to scare you. Kathleen said quickly. Would you be able to fetch to now for me? Important scarlet business. Boss won't mind. Scarlet business, the woman echoed, putting her container down. She wore a red bracelet, so she was associated with the scarlets, yet her voice sounded skeptical all the same. When the woman stood, she paused, taking a moment to squint at Kathleen. Instinctively, Kathleen reached up to touch her hair, to make sure the wisps of her bangs lay just right above the arched brows she had delicately filled in. She was always careful not to touch her face too much, she spent far too long every morning doing her cosmetics until her face was soft and her chin was pointed to mess it up in the middle of the day. A long moment passed. Finally, the woman nodded and said, One second. Kathleen heaved an exhale as soon as she was left alone. She hadn't realized how tense she had grown, how she had almost expected the woman to speak her mind, to ask what right Kathleen had to be here, digging her nose into scarlet business. But at the end of the day, Kathleen was the one wearing the silk chipau, and this woman was the one in a cotton uniform that likely hadn't been replaced in years. She wouldn't have dared. The only one who did dare question her right to exist was her own father. Don't think about it, Kathleen muttered to herself. Stop thinking about it. She was already thinking about it. About the first argument they had when her father arrived in Paris, summoned because one of his three children had fallen ill. It's influenza, the doctors had said. She might not recover. Her father's temper was already at its breaking point, his French too elementary to understand the doctors. And when Kathleen tried to help, pulled him out into the hallway after the doctors left to make sure her father understood their options. I can't even listen to you right now, he sneered. He looked her up and down, eyeing her dress, the inspection dripping with distaste. Not until you stop wearing such. Don't, Kathleen cut in. Her father reared back. Perhaps it had been the interruption that was more offensive. Perhaps it had been her tone, certain in her command without wavering. What have the tutors been teaching you, he snapped. You do not talk back to me. Or what, Baba, she said evenly. What will you do? For thousands of years, the worst crime in China was a lack of filial piety. Having children with no xiaoshuan was a fate worse than death. It meant being forgotten in the afterlife, a wandering ghost doomed to starve when no offerings came in from irreverent descendants. But it was her father who had sent them out here who had thinned the string that China tied around their wrists. He had sent them to the West, where they were taught different ideas, taught about a different afterlife that had nothing to do with burning paper money. The West had corrupted them, and whose fault was that? Her father had nothing more to say. Go, he snapped. Go back into the room and join your sisters. I will speak to the doctors. Kathleen did not protest. She had wondered in that moment, peering over her shoulder as her father stood there, if he ever cursed the universe for taking his wife in childbirth, if he regretted losing her in exchange for three strangers. For Kathleen, Rosalind, and Celia. A girl who had been sickly all her life. A girl who was in training to be Shanghai's dazzling star. And a girl who just wanted to be left alone to live as she was. Kathleen closed her fist tightly, her teeth gritted hard, forcing the memories back. Her father would have forced her into hiding if he'd had his way. He would have rather disowned her than let her back in Shanghai wearing a chipao, and Kathleen would have rather packed her bags and made her own way across Europe than go on being her father's prodigal son. She supposed it was fortunate that Kathleen Lang, the real Kathleen, died of influenza two weeks after falling sick, her fourteen years of life coming to a close with no real friends, having been distant from her two sisters all her life. How were you supposed to mourn someone you never really knew? It was empty expressions under black veils and cold stares at the cremation vase. 
even the thickest blood from the womb could run thin if given the empty space to bleed. I won't call you Celia, her father said at the port, lifting their suitcases. That's not the name I gave you at birth. He cast her a glance ask you. But I will call you Kathleen. And save for Rosalind, you may tell no one. It's for your own safety. You must realize that. She did. She had fought so hard all her life just to be called Celia, and now her father wanted to give her a different name, and she could accept it. The Lang triplets had been away from Shanghai for so long that not a soul had questioned Kathleen's changed face when they finally returned. Except Juliet, Juliet noticed everything, but their cousin had been quick to nod along, making the switch from Celia to Kathleen as quickly as she had made the switch to Celia. Now Kathleen responded to this name as if it were her own, as if it were the only name she had ever known, and it was a comfort, no matter how strange. Hello. Kathleen jumped at Danau's sudden appearance in the break room, her hand flying to her heart. Are you quite all right? Danau asked. Perfectly, Kathleen breathed. She squared her shoulders, recovering back into business mode. I need a favor. I'm after Jean Goutai's personal address. Though her cousin didn't know it, Juliet was actually familiar with Danau, whose name translated literally to Big Brain. He spent some hours working at this cotton mill, and some as a fisherman along the Bund, retrieving fresh stock for the Scarlet Gang. He had been around during their childhood, and had dropped by the Scarlet residence at least three times since Juliet's return. The Scarlet Gang liked their fish fresh. But they didn't need to know that their primary supplier was also their eyes and ears within the party. Jean Goutai, de now echoed. You want, the Secretary General's personal address. Indeed. Danau was pulling a face that said what the hell do you need that for? But he didn't ask and Kathleen didn't tell, so the fisherman tapped his chin in thought and said, I can find it for you. But our next meeting is not until Saturday. It may have to wait until then. Kathleen nodded. That is fine. Thank you. Danau left the break room without any fanfare. Mission achieved. Kathleen started to climb through the window again, only this time, as she slid onto the ledge, her hand came upon a flyer lying there, face down and grimy with dirt and grease. Kathleen flipped it over. The rule of the gangsters is over. It is time to unionize. Her eyebrows shot straight up. She wondered if this was Danau's doing, but she couldn't imagine so. Yet at the bottom of the flyer, typed in a neat, faded line, it read distributed on behalf of the Communist Party of China. It would seem Danau was not the only employee here with communist ties. A sudden splashing noise by the wharf startled Kathleen out of her reverie, prompting her to hop off the ledge and back onto the ground outside the cotton mill. When Kathleen looked out into the water, she thought she caught a flash of something shiny darting through the waves. Strange, she muttered. She hurried home. Twelve. They say Shanghai stands tall like an emperor's ugly daughter, its streets sprawling in a manner that only the limbs of a snarling princess could manage. It was not born this way. It used to be beautiful. They used to croon over it, examining the lines of its body and humming beneath their breath, nodding and deciding that it was well suited for children. Then this city mutilated itself with a wide, wide grin. It dragged a knife down its cheek and took the blade to its chest and now it worries not for finding suitors, but merely for running wild, drunk on the invulnerability of inherited power, well suited only for profit and feasting, dancing and whoring. Now it may be ugly, but it is glorious. Night always falls on this city with a quiet clomp. When the lights blink on, the buzzing of newly coveted electricity running through the wires that line the streets like black veins, it is easy to forget that the natural state of night is supposed to be darkness. Instead, night in Shanghai is vibrance and neon, gaslight flickering against the triangular flags fluttering in the breeze. In this clamor, a dancer steps out from the most crowded burlesque club on her side of the city, shaking her hair free of its ribbons. She keeps in only one, a twirl of red, to mark her allegiance to the Scarlet Gang, to be left alone while she makes her way through Scarlet territory when walking back home, to signal to the gangsters who lurk in the alleyways by the Bund, 
picking their teeth clean with their sharp blades, that she is not to be hassled, that she is on their side. The dancer shivers as she walks, dropping her long cigarette to the ground and putting it out with her shoe. Her hands freed now, she wraps them around her goosebumped arms. She is ill at ease. There is no one following her, nor is there anybody before her. Nevertheless, somehow she is certain that someone is watching her. It is not an utterly absurd concept. This city does not know itself, it will not feel the parasites that grow upon its skin until it is far too late. This city is a miscellany of parts smashed together and functioning in one collective stride, but place a gun to its head and it will only laugh in your face, misunderstanding the violence of such intent. They have always said that Shanghai is an ugly daughter, but as the years grow on, it isn't enough anymore to characterize this city as merely one entity. This place rumbles on Western idealism and Eastern labor, hateful of its split and unable to function without it, multiple facets fighting and grappling in an ever-constant quarrel. Half scarlet, half white flower, half filthy rich, half dirt poor, half land, half water flowing in from the East China Sea. There is nothing more but water to the east of Shanghai. Perhaps that is why the Russians have come here, these flocks of exiles who fled the Bolshevik Revolution, and even before that, when their home could no longer be a home. If you decided to run, you might as well keep running until you came to the edge of the world. That is what this city is. The party at the end of the world. Its flagship dancer has stopped now, letting the silence thrum in her ears as she strains to identify what it is that is prickling her nerves. The more she listens, the wider her hearing range stretches, picking up on the drip 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 of a nearby pipe and the chatter of late night workers. The catch is this, it is not someone watching her. It is something. And it comes to the surface. Something with a row of horns that grows from its curved back, glinting out of the water like ten ominous daggers. Something that raises its head and blinks opaque silver eyes at her. The dancer flees. She panics, moving in such haste to get away from the horrifying sight that she stumbles right in front of a ship flying the wrong colors and the white flower working to unload the ship catches sight of her. Excuse me, he bellows down. Are you lost? He has misinterpreted the dancer's idleness for confusion. He drops down from the ship's bow and starts walking toward her, only to halt abruptly upon spotting her red ribbon. The white flower's expression turns from friendly to thunderous in an instance. The dancer pulls her mouth into a tight, defeated grimace and throws her hands up attempting to defuse the situation by shouting, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wasn't watching the territory lines. But he is already whipping out his pistol, aiming with one eye lazily shut. Bloody scarlets, he mutters. You think you can waltz wherever you want, don't you? The dancer, almost half-heartedly, scrambles for her own weapon, a small handgun strapped to her thigh. Wait, she calls steadily. I'm not your enemy, there's something back there. It's coming. A splash sounds. A droplet of water lands in the soft flesh at the back of her knee, running a track down her leg. When the dancer looks down, she sees that the line of water is wholly black. She lurches to her right, diving into an alleyway and pressing against a bend in the wall. Gunshots sound into the night as the white flower interprets her fast pace to be an act of war but by then she is already out of sight, shielding herself from the waterfront, her whole body shaking. Then something erupts from the Huangpu River, and screaming resounds into the night. It is hard to say exactly what is occurring on the ports of Shanghai. While the dancer's mouth moves to silent prayers, hands clutch to her chest, knees folded until they press grooves into her forehead, the white flower and all his other men still upon the ship stand within range of the chaos. They scrabble, and scream, and resist, but the infestation comes down on them, and there is no stopping it. When the screaming stops, the dancer creeps out from the alleyway, hesitant in case there is calamity. Instead, what she finds are insects. Thousands of them, tiny, disgusting things crawling on the ground. They bump over one another and skitter about in random fashion, but en masse, they are all moving in one direction, toward the water. For the first time, 
this city may finally fear the barrel pressed to its temple like a poisoned caress. Because by the Huangpu River, the second wave of the madness unfolds, starting with the seven dead bodies lying motionless on the top deck of a Russian ship. 13. Juliet smoothed down the fabric of her chipao, pressing at the creases that were bunching up beneath her coat. She swallowed her discomfort in a hard gulp, as if it were nothing more than a bitter medicinal pill. It felt fraudulent, somehow, to put on a type of clothing that she hadn't worn in years. It felt like lying, to herself, to the image she had been building before she stepped foot back into the city. But if she wanted to blend in within Zhang Gutai's daytime place of work, she had to look like any regular upper-class 18-year-old clacking around these streets with pearl earrings dangling in her loose, ungelled hair. Juliet took a deep breath, tightened her grip on the sleeves of her coat, and marched into the building. Zhang Gutai, as an important figure in a relatively new and fragile political party, was a secretive man. But he was also the chief editor of a newspaper called Labor Daily, and their address was public information. Though she hadn't expected to find much, but a scant office complex when she wandered out here into the industrial edges of the Chinese part of the city, she was met with the absolute bustle of activity in the Labor Daily's offices, people running around with bundles of paper, and typewriters clutched in their arms as they yelled for the latest update on a batch that had proceeded forward into printing. Her nose wrinkling, Juliet walked right past the front desk with her chin held high. These people were communists, weren't they? They believed in equality, after all. She was sure they would also believe in letting Juliet take a look around by herself until she stumbled onto Jean Gutai's office. She wouldn't need anybody to show her around. Juliet smiled to herself. The thick of the activity seemed to be coming in and out of a little set of stairs dropping into a basement level, so Juliet went there, snagging a clipboard from a table in an effort to look occupied. There was no natural light when she entered the basement level. She passed what may have been a back door, then turned left, entering the main space and scanning the scene before her. The floor and walls were constructed of cement. The only illumination came from the few light fixtures latched to the walls, which seemed terribly inconvenient for all these people down here at their desks, squinting in the dimness. It reminded her of what cell blocks during the Great War might have looked like. Juliet supposed she wouldn't be at all surprised if it turned out this building really had been converted from an original use of holding prisoners. She continued striding forward, deeper into the prison-like office space, peering into each nook. Her heels were loud as she clicked through, but there was enough chaos down here that, for now, nobody thought much of her presence. Harried writers, both old and young, were busy scribbling, working fast on their typewriters, or taking phone calls. The wires that carried signals into this subterranean level were all tangled in a big mass at the back of the expansive space. As Juliet scanned the desks she passed, looking for anything of note, her attention snagged on one desk that appeared unoccupied. Such an observation was peculiar enough in this little bubble of activity. She was even more intrigued when she craned her neck to read the writing atop the folders beside the telephone, and saw, in Chinese, memo for Jean Gutai. Quickly she scrambled beneath the desk, clipboard shoved under her arm so she could search through the files. There was nothing noteworthy in the political reports, but when she dropped to a crouch and looked to the floor of the desk, she found drawings. If everybody else is so busy, why is this desk empty? Juliet thought. And whose was it? Surely not Jean Gutai, who most certainly had his own space. Shaking her head, she reached into the pile of drawings and pulled a few out, resolving not to look a gift horse in the mouth. But when she looked upon the first drawing, she broke out in a cold sweat, all the way from the high collar at her neck to the edges of the chipao brushing her ankles. One drawing was of wide, reptilian-like eyes. Another was of five claws gripping against a board of wooden scales somehow glistening despite the stray smears of ink along the page. Juliet's fingers froze, Stunned as she took in the images, dozens of them, all depicting variations of the same thing. Guai Wu, Juliet breathed. Monster. Before she could overthink it, she snatched one of the drawings in the pile, the one that depicted a blur of a creature standing in its entirety, and folded it up, tucking the little square of paper into her coat pocket. 
it joined the masquerade invitation that she had placed there yesterday and forgotten to remove. With a cursory glance around to make sure she was still in the clear, Juliet stood and wiped the sweat off her palms. She marched for the little steps out of the basement level, her fists clutched tight. Juliet paused suddenly, her foot hovering on the first step. To her left again was the back door. And it was shuddering. Suddenly all she could think of was the drawing in her pocket. She imagined a monster just on the other side of the door, breathing heavily, awaiting the prime moment to burst free and wreak havoc on innocence. Juliet stepped toward the door hesitantly. Her hand came down to rest on the round knob. Hello, she called, her voice hoarse. Is someone? What are you doing there? Juliet jumped, snatching her hand away from the knob of the door. The frame had stopped shuddering. She swiveled around. Oh me? The man who stood before her wore a fedora cap, his suit more western-looking than what everyone else down here was wearing. He had to be someone important, along the lines of Jean Goutai's rank rather than a mere assistant who answered the phone. I'm here to see your chief editor for important business, Juliet continued. I got a little lost. The exit is that way, the man said, pointing. Juliet's smile grew cold. Official scarlet business, she corrected. My father, Lord Kai, sent me. There was a moment of pause as the man digested her words, weariness setting in. Juliet had perfected the art of dishonest guiles, she hid her identity when necessary, then wielded it like a weapon when the time came. Only the man suddenly looked a little amused, too, much to Juliet's chagrin. Still, he nodded and gestured for her to follow him. There was one more floor above the first floor, and the man spared no patience in hurrying Juliet along. He ascended the humble brown staircase three steps at a time, while Juliet clacked up slowly, looking around. This staircase, with its thick handrails and long, polished panes, had the potential to be sweeping and decadent, if only the communists were not so intent on giving the appearance of seeming grounded with the common people. Everything in this building could have been glorious. But glory was not the point anymore, was it? Juliet leaned over the banister of the second floor with a sigh, hearing at the frenzy of papers and typewriters below. When the man gestured at her impatiently from ahead, she grimaced and kept walking. The man turned a corner and directed her into a spacious waiting area. There were two rows of chairs here, both pressed up against opposing walls and facing each other in front of a closed office door. Juliet finally understood his amusement. There was already someone sitting on one of the yellow chairs, legs stretched out in front of him. Roma lurched upright. What are you doing here? they demanded in unison. The man in the fedora cap quietly removed himself. As soon as he was out of sight, Roma launched out of his seat and grabbed Juliet's arm. She was so offended he dared touch her that she couldn't react for a long second, not until Roma had already moved them to a corner of the waiting space, the wall cold against Juliet's back. Let go of me, she hissed, shaking her arm from his grip. Roma must have obtained the same information that she had. He wanted to know about Jean Goutai's involvement in the madness. Juliet bit back a curse. If the white flowers got answers before she did, they would treat their findings like they treated the black market. They would do everything they could to secure a monopoly upon the information, pay off and kill sources until there was no way for the Scarlets to obtain what they knew. That way, only the white flowers were safe, assuming there was a way to stop this madness. That way, the city only stacked up with the bodies of their enemies. Then people would begin to switch loyalties. Then the white flowers would be victorious. And the scarlets would suffer. Look, Roma snapped. You have to leave. Juliet blinked rapidly, her head rearing back. I have to leave. Yes. Roma reached up, his expression dripping with derision, and flicked one of the earrings dangling from Juliet's ear. The pearl swung against her skin, brushing her jaw. Juliet barely stifled the whoosh of breath that threatened to escape, barely stifled the stream of fire she wanted to breathe from her throat. Play dress up somewhere else, Roma went on. I was here first. This is Scarlet territory. These people are communists. 
you have no sway over them. Juliet gritted her teeth, hard. Indeed, the Scarlet Gang had no control here. Her only consolation was that Roma didn't appear too happy himself, which meant the White Flowers had no sway over the Communists, either. For the time being, this neutrality was a good thing. The man in the fedora had shut his mouth immediately in learning Juliet's identity, precisely to avoid any unnecessary aggravation with the Scarlet Gang. But tiptoeing on thin ice wouldn't last forever. The Communists' very model of progress was overthrowing Shanghai as it was now, as it was for gangsters to thrive, sinful, profitable. Given the choice between killing all the capitalists and killing all the gangsters, they would choose both. Our relationship with the Communists is, as always, none of your business, Juliet said. Now, if you would be so kind, get out of my face. Roma narrowed his eyes. He took her command as a threat. Perhaps she had intended for it to be one. I'm not going anywhere. God, the nerve. Juliet straightened to her full height. They weren't that far apart, she and Roma, he barely held half an inch over her when she was in heels. I won't say it again, she hissed. Get out of my face. Now. His lips thinned. Resentfully, and slowly, Roma submitted to the threat. He made a steady step back, glaring at her as he scrubbed a hand along his eyes. If Juliet didn't know better, she would have thought the gesture to be an act of self-consciousness. But no, it was exhaustion, the shadows under his eyes were almost smoky, like his bottom lashes were fringed with soot. Have you not been sleeping? Juliet found herself asking suddenly. There was a direct correlation between her willingness to be civil, and the distance between them. With him several strides away, she wanted to commit homicide a little less. Roma's hand returned to his side. I'll have you know, he answered, that I am well, thank you very much. I wasn't asking after your well-being. Oh, give it a rest, Juliet. Juliet folded her arms thoughtfully. Last night she had heard the news about the sudden spike in white flower deaths, all lost to the madness. It was the biggest mass casualty yet. Which meant Roma wasn't going to leave just because she made a few barbed remarks, he was here now precisely because this strange madness had crept so close to home. She tilted her chin at the closed door. Is that his office? Roma didn't need to clarify who she meant. He nodded. Jean Gutai won't take visitors until the hour. Don't try anything. Like what? Juliet thought nastily. It wasn't as if she could run Roma out without making a scene and offending the communists, and she certainly refused to leave before she spoke to Jean Gutai. To find answers, it was this or nothing. Juliet marched to a chair and sat down. She tipped her head back and stared at the ceiling, resolute not to look anywhere else. Directing her mind elsewhere too, she reached into her coat pocket and fingered the drawing she had stashed away. It was uncertain whether these frightening sketches confirmed trouble with the communists specifically, but it confirmed something. She would have to inspect it further, because she thought she recognized the background to be the bund. It was nothing more than a few harsh lines, but for somewhere as distinctive as the bund, a few harsh lines were enough. Meanwhile, Roma had settled back onto his seat along the other row of chairs, his fingers tapping to the tick-tick-tick of the clock on the wall. He kept his gaze pinned to Juliet, much to Juliet's annoyance. She could feel his inspection like it was a physical thing, as if he were inches away instead of across the room. Every sweep of his eyes felt like he was mechanically pulling her apart, piece by piece, until her insides were out in the open for inspection. Juliet could feel a flush creeping up from her chest, coloring her neck with discomfort, then spreading until her cheeks were blazing hot. She was going to skin herself with her own damn knife. Her cells were betraying her on a molecular level. He was just looking, for heaven's sake. It did not qualify as an attack. Juliet was not going to rise to the bait. She would sit here until Jean Goutai was ready to meet, and then. What? Juliet snapped, unable to bear it any longer. She tore her gaze down finally supplying her own ammunition against Roma's weaponized stare. Roma made an inquisitive noise. He pursed his lips slowly, 
then tipped his chin. What's got you so worked up? Juliet followed the direction of his gesture. She yanked her hand out from her pocket. Again, that would be none of your business. If it is to do with men. Why would you assume that? Roma's expression thundered. Can I finish my sentence? The office door opened, cutting him off. A harried assistant came out and summoned Roma to go and before she quickly hurried away. With a huff, Roma shot Juliet a look that said this isn't over, before entering the office. Juliet broiled in the wait, her toes tapping erratically against the hard floor panels and her fingers twisting around one another. For ten minutes she drove herself up the wall, envisioning Roma doing all in his power to convince Jean Gutai to give him all the answers and disregard Juliet. Roma was a liar through and through, his tactics of persuasion knew no bounds. When Roma came out, however, it was immediately clear in the slouch of his head that he hadn't gotten what he wanted. Don't look so smug, he whispered while Juliet passed him. That's just my face, she hissed back. With her chin held high, Juliet walked into Jean Gutai's office. Well, it must be my lucky day, Mr. Jean declared when she entered, putting his fountain pen down. Despite his laudatory tone, he was frowning as he spoke. First it was the heir of the white flowers, now the scarlet crown princess. What can I do for you, Miss Kai? Juliet flopped into one of the two large chairs placed opposite Mr. Zhang's heavy mahogany desk. In seconds she took in everything before her, the framed black and white photographs of his elderly parents, the hammer and sickle flag hanging from the side of the filing cabinet, the festive red calendar on the wall marked with daily meetings. Her eyes returning to the communist before her, Juliet relaxed and made him see what she wanted him to see, letting out a small, careless laugh, vacuous as could be. You know how rumors work in this city, Mr. Zhang, she said. She held her nails out in front of her, squinting at a little chip marring her pinky. They come to me, and I follow them. Do you know what graced my ear the other day? Zhang Gutai appeared mildly entertained. Do tell. They say, Juliet leaned in, that you know why there is madness sweeping through Shanghai. For a long moment Mr. Zhang said nothing. Then he blinked rapidly and replied, Miss Kai, I haven't a clue why you would think that. No. Juliet said lightly. You didn't scheme up a madness to spread through the city? No plans at all to cause enough death until the gangsters are weak and the workers are frightened, until the factories have ripened into the ideal conditions for the communists to swoop in and incite revolution? She digested his surprise, his astonishment at being confronted. Roma must not have asked him about the madness directly, he must have approached it in a more roundabout way, treading the waters to gather his conclusions instead of coming right out and saying it. That was to be expected. The direct approach was more of Juliet's arena. Miss Kai, Jean Gutai said sternly. That is absurd. Juliet wasn't getting anywhere like this. She straightened in her chair and dropped her smile, her hands gripping the armrests. Now the easy flapper girl was gone. In her place sat the heiress of the most brutal gang in Shanghai. I will find the truth one way or another, Juliet said. So speak now if you wish to be offered mercy. Else I will tear the answer from you limb by limb. Miss Kai, I truly have no clue what you are speaking of, Mr. Zhang interrupted. Please leave now. This is a place of work, and I won't have your ridiculous accusations taking up my time. Juliet considered her options. Zhang Gutai's words were convincing, but he was uneasy. Unless he was a very, very good actor, he was no liar, but he kept glancing to the door, he kept tapping his hand against the flat of his desk. Why? What did he know that she didn't? Even if he did not scheme the madness, what was his involvement? Juliet leaned back in her seat, relaxing her spine again into a false ease. And what if I have questions on the Communist Party, she asked. You are the Secretary General, are you not? You are welcome to attend our meetings if you wish to know about the party, Mr. Zhang answered stiffly. Otherwise, Miss Kai, please leave. Juliet stood taking her sweet time to stretch and work out the cricks in her neck. Then, bobbing a deep and exaggerated curtsy, she simpered, 
thank you for your gracious time, and left the office. What now? She thought, closing the door behind her with a quiet click. She started to walk. If you won't. Oof. Juliet staggered back, her head spinning as she rounded the corner, and immediately collided hard with someone. The moment she looked up to see who the hell was in her path, she could only see red. Roma caught her wrist before her hand could come down on him. He held her mid-motion, their arms crossed like they were exchanging sword blows. Careful, Roma said quietly. His voice was too soft for the violence brewing under Juliet's skin. It was trickery. He was trying to divert her attention to his lips and breath and calm instead of whatever was going on here, with his harsh grip carving grooves into her wrist, and it was working. Juliet wanted to kill him for that alone. Roma gave a mocking smile, like he knew what she was thinking. Wouldn't want to make a scene in a communist stronghold, would you? Juliet tried to tug her arm back, but Roma held firm. If he didn't let go in three seconds, she was drawing her gun. One, two. Roma let go. Juliet rubbed her wrist, smoothing a palm over her raging pulse and grumbling something inaudible under her breath. When Roma simply stood there, she demanded, Why are you still here? Innocently, Roma pointed over to the chairs. I left my hat behind. You weren't even wearing a hat before. But indeed, on the chair where he had originally been sitting, a hat was lying on its side. Roma, shrugging, merely went to pick it up. Juliet pivoted on her heel and left as fast as she could, hurrying from the building. It wasn't until she was halfway down the road, pulling her coat tightly around her, that she stopped in her tracks, swearing. He better not have, she plunged her hand into her pocket, and came out with only one slip of paper. But when she unfolded it, she saw that the monster was still staring back at her, lines hazy with folding and refolding. Juliet snorted. Roma had taken the masquerade invitation instead. Fool, she muttered. When Juliet returned home, she found Kathleen already lounging on one of the couches in the living room. She went to join her cousin, complaining under her breath. What's wrong? Kathleen asked absently, flipping the pages of her magazine. A lot of things, Juliet grumbled. Did you find the address? Kathleen made a motion with her head that resembled a half nod. Sort of. I'll have it in a few days. Good enough. Juliet muttered. I've got the masquerade to worry about until then anyway. A headache was starting in the space behind her ears. She was trying to plot her next move, but it was hard to decide where to look. There had to be a reason why Madame had heard what she heard. There had to be a reason why the communists had said what they said. And if it was not but a rumor, then Juliet could only put her suspicion to rest when she had exhausted every avenue to do with Jean Gutai. Juliet perked up slightly. Her hand reached into her pocket again, touching the drawing. She had yet to exhaust everything. A whistle came from the front door then, interrupting Juliet's silent brooding. She looked up to find a scarlet messenger hovering in the foyer space, gesturing at her with one hand and fixing the fit of his shoe with the other. Pass me that parcel beside you. Juliet looked to her side. Indeed. A parcel was lying on the circular table beside the sofa she had chosen to collapse on, but what did this messenger think he was doing asking her to fetch him something that he could simply come get himself? It clicked. The Chipao. The scarlet gangsters had become accustomed to shortcutting their association of her to glittery, beaded dresses, and pomade in her finger-curled hair. As soon as she dressed in Chinese clothing instead, they saw right past her. Juliet breathed in and found her lungs to be horribly tight. Could she never be both? Was she doomed to choose one country or the other? Be an American girl, or nothing? The messenger whistled again. Hey! Juliet yanked out the knife sheathed at her thigh, right above where the slit of her chipao ended, and threw it. The blade embedded perfectly into the front door with a deep, sonorous thud. It drew a single drop of blood from the messenger's ear where it had cut through. You don't whistle at me, Juliet said coldly. I whistle at you. Understand? The messenger looked at her, really looked at her now. 
He reached up and touched his ear. The bleeding had already stopped. But his eyes were wide as he nodded. Juliet took the parcel in her hands and stood. She walked right up to the messenger and passed it to him quaintly, as if she were delivering a lunchbox to her friend. While you're at it, she said, I need you to do something for me. Go to the Bund and interview the bankers who work along the main strip. Ask whether they've seen anything funny lurking about. The messenger's mouth opened and closed. All of them. All. Of. Them. But. Juliet, hold on, Kathleen called, rising from the couch too. Let me. Juliet raised an eyebrow. Kathleen waved a hand at the messenger in a shooing gesture, and the messenger took the opportunity to flee, closing the front door after him with the knife still embedded within it. You want to waste your time on this? Juliet asked. It is not wasting my time if it is useful information you need. Kathleen reached into the coat rack by the door. Why are you chasing after it? I can send any one of the other messengers, Juliet continued, wrinkling her brow. Ordering her own cousin around didn't sit well with her. A specific task with specific goals was one matter, especially if Kathleen had contacts that benefited the mission. Sending her on a wild goose chase was another matter entirely. Juliet. I was mostly trying to frighten the messenger. It really is quite all right. Kathleen grabbed her cousin's wrist and squeezed, not hard enough to hurt, but hard enough for Juliet to know that this was serious. I'm not just doing this out of the kindness of my heart, she said firmly. In some few years, this gang is either under your hands or someone else's. And knowing the other contenders. Kathleen paused. Their heads both went to the same people, Tyler first, then perhaps the other various cousins who might have a fighting chance only if Tyler mysteriously disappeared. They were all terrible and ruthless and hateful, but Juliet was too. The minuscule difference was that Juliet was also careful, intensely controlling with how much of that hate she let slip out to guide her hand. It could be under your hands too, Juliet said lightly. We don't know what's going to happen in a few years. Kathleen rolled her eyes. I'm not a Kai, Juliet. That's not even in the realm of possibility. There was little to argue back against that. Kathleen came from Lady Kai's side of the family. When Lord Kai was the face of the Scarlet Gang, it was unsurprising that only those sharing his name were seen to be legitimate. One only had to look at how easily his fellow cousins merged into the inner circle, while Mr. Lang, Lady Kai's brother, still had not won any favor in the two decades he had been around. It has to be you, Kathleen said. Her tone did not allow for dissent. Everyone who may come for your crown is dangerous. And you are too, but, she took a moment to think through her phrasing, but at least you will never willingly bring danger inward just to soothe your pride. You're the only one I trust to hold this gang together, as a steady steel structure, rather than a grappling hierarchy of whims. If you fail to be a good heir, if you fall, then this way of life falls. Let me do this for you. Juliet's mouth opened, then closed. When all she could manage was a meek, okay, her cousin snorted. The serious spell broke. Kathleen shrugged her coat on. So, why do you need to know about the bankers at the Bund? Juliet was still mulling over her cousin's words. She had always thought of herself as the heir of the Scarlet Gang but that wasn't it at all, was it? She was the heir to her father's version of the Scarlet Gang. And was that so great? This Scarlet Gang was unraveling at its very scenes. Perhaps a different one could have won the blood feud with the White Flowers generations ago. Perhaps a different one would have stopped the madness by now. Rumors of a monster, Juliet answered aloud, shaking herself out of her head. There were so many loose pieces floating around, a monster, a madness, the communists, she had to focus on aligning them, not doubting herself. I've reason to believe they might have witnessed something. My hopes aren't high, but a smidgen of it exists at least. Kathleen nodded. I'll report back with what I find. With that, her cousin waved goodbye and shut the door after her, the sound echoing back into the living room. The knife looked rather comical moving with the door like that. 
Juliet sighed and yanked it out, tucking the blade into her dress as she trudged up the stairs. Her parents were going to be horrified to find a gouge in the door. She smiled at the thought and remained rather amused, until she entered her room and spotted a lone figure on her bed. Juliet almost jumped two feet into the air. Oh heavens, you scared me, she gasped a moment later. The sisters were hardly ever in her room separately, so she hadn't immediately identified Rosalind, especially not while her cousin had her face inclined toward the beam of afternoon sun cutting through the window. Are you and your sister both insistent on surprising me today? Rosalind looked a little miffed as she turned to Juliet. You were with Kathleen just now? I've been waiting for you here for hours. Juliet blinked. She wasn't sure what to say. I'm sorry, she settled on, though her apology was confused and, as a result, disingenuous. I didn't know. Rosalind shook her head and muttered, no matter. This was one of the details that Juliet remembered from their childhood, before any of them had left for the Western world. Rosalind carried grudges like it was a contest. She was passionate and headstrong and had nerves of steel, but when you looked past her well-chosen, surface-level pretty words, she could also simmer on feelings long past their relevance. Don't grouch at me, Juliet tooted. She had to address it now or fear its flare-up long into the distant future. She knew her cousin, had borne witness to Rosalind's slow-building hatred toward the people who upset her, toward her maternal aunts who tried to take the place of her dead mother, toward her father, who valued the strengthening of his guanchi in the Scarlet Gang more than he valued caring for his children, even toward her fellow dancers at the burlesque club, who were jealous enough with Rosalind's growing star status that they tried to exclude her from their circles. Sometimes Juliet wondered how Rosalind even managed to cope with so much absence in her life. And at that thought, she felt a little bad for not checking in with her cousin more often, though she hadn't been back in the city for all that long. Everyone always had more important things to be doing in the Kai family. Kathleen, at least, erred on the side of optimism. Rosalind did not. But constant care and outreach to your cousins was not a high priority when people were ripping at their own throats on the streets outside. What's wrong? Juliet asked anyway. She could at least spare a minute if Rosalind had been waiting here for hours. Rosalind didn't respond. For a moment Juliet almost feared that she hadn't absolved the burgeoning grudge. Then, all of a sudden, Rosalind dropped her face into her hands. There was something haunting about that motion that struck Juliet to the core, something childlike and lost. Insects, Rosalind whispered, her words muffled into her palm. Now a coldness had settled into the room. Juliet felt all the little hairs at the back of her neck lift, standing so ramrod straight that her skin almost felt sensitive sore to the touch. So many of them, Rosalind continued. Every crack of her cousin's voice sent a new shiver down Juliet's spine. So many of them, all coming from the sea, all going back into the sea. Slowly Juliet managed to lower herself into a kneel on her carpet. She craned her head to meet her cousin's drooped, terrified stare. What do you mean? Juliet asked softly. What insects? Rosalind shook her head. I think I saw it. I saw it in the water. It still didn't answer the question. Saw what? Juliet tried clarifying again. When Rosalind yet remained quiet, Juliet reached out and took her by the arms, demanding, Rosalind, what did you see? Rosalind inhaled sharply. In that one motion, it was as if she sucked all the oxygen out of the room sucked out all possibility that whatever she had witnessed could be something casually explained away. A second heartbeat was starting up along Juliet's skull, a pressure building from within to listen, brace, prepare. Somehow, she knew that what she was about to hear was going to change everything. Rosalind, Juliet prompted one final time. Silver eyes, Rosalind finally choked out with a shudder. Now that she had started speaking, it was coming out in a tumble. Her breathing grew increasingly shallow, and Juliet's grip grew increasingly tight, fingers still clasped about Rosalind's arms. Her cousin barely seemed to notice. It had silver eyes. And a curved spine. And sharp ridges. And scales and claws and I, I don't know, Juliet. 
I don't know what it was. Guai Wu, maybe. A monster. A roar started to sound in Juliet's ears. With careful control, she pried her hands away from her cousin, then reached into her coat, retrieving the drawing she had stolen. She unfolded the worn sheet, smoothing out the lines of ink smeared upon it. Rosalind, Juliet said slowly. Look at this drawing. Rosalind reached for the thin piece of paper. Her fingers tightened upon it. Her eyes filled with tears. Is this what you saw? Juliet whispered. Ever so slowly, Rosalind nodded. Fourteen. If anyone asked Benedict Montagov the one thing he wanted out of life, he had a very simple answer, to paint the perfect sphere. Ask anyone else in the white flowers and there would be an array of responses. Fortune, love, vengeance, all of these and more, Benedict wanted too. But they faded into the background when he was painting, thinking of nothing save the movement in his wrist and the arc of his paintbrush, a task so careful, so tedious, so beautiful. It was almost obsessive how badly he wanted to conjure the perfect sphere. It was one of those delusions that he had held since a child, a delusion that seemed to have formed fully fledged in his mind with no apparent origin, though if there was, perhaps it had been so early in his life he could simply no longer remember. It was all irrational anyway, a belief that if he achieved one impossible thing, then perhaps every other impossible element in his life would click together too, regardless of whether they truly correlated. When Benedict was five, he thought that if he could finish reciting the entire Bible from front to back, his father would survive his illness. His father died anyway, and then his mother too, six months later, from a stray bullet to the chest. When Benedict was eight, he convinced himself that he needed to run from his bedroom to the front door every morning within ten seconds, or else the day would be a bad one. This was back when he still lived within the central headquarters, in the bedroom next to Roma's on the fourth floor. Those days were always terrible and rough, but he didn't know how much of that was a result of his failures to run fast enough. He was nineteen years old now and the habits hadn't faded, they had simply winnowed down and condensed themselves into the tightest possible ball, leaving behind one single wish, which rested atop a pyramid of other impossible desires. Damn it, Benedict muttered. Damn it, damn it. He ripped the sheet of paper from the canvas and bunched it up, throwing it hard against the wall of his studio. The futility bore down on him, thumping at his temples and invading his dry, tired eyes. Somewhere deep in the recesses of his logic, he knew what he wanted to do wasn't possible. What was a sphere? It was a three-dimensional circle, and circles didn't exist. A circle had points that were all equidistant from the center, and for them to be the same they would need to match to the most exact of precisions. How far would Benedict go to find perfection? The brush strokes, the particles, the atoms. If a true circle didn't exist in their very universe, how was he supposed to paint one? Benedict set down the paintbrush, scrubbing at his hair as he left his studio. He paused down the hallway only when a voice floated from the adjacent room, bored and Ryan low. The hell are you swearing about? Now he and Marshall shared the rundown building that sat one block away from the main Montagov dwelling though Benedict's name was the only one on the papers. In technicality, Marshall was living here as an illegal tenant, but Benedict didn't mind. Marshall was an absolute loose cannon, but he was also an excellent cook and better than anyone at repairing a busted pipe. Perhaps it was all his practice putting together his own broken bones. Perhaps it was those early years of his life spent wandering on the streets and fending for himself before the white flowers took him in. To this day, none of the Montagovs were aware of what exactly happened to Marshall's family. There was only one thing that Benedict did know, they were all dead. Marshall strolled out of his room, moth-eaten pajama pants slung low over his hips. When he lifted his arms to fold them across his chest, his bedraggled shirt rode up and showcased a crisscross of knife wounds that had scabbed over his lower torso. Benedict was staring. His pulse jumped once at the terrible realization and jumped again at the thought of getting caught. You have more scars. His recovery was fast, barely stuttering even while his neck burned. This moment would probably come to him as he was trying to sleep, 
and then he would cringe so hard he would invert into himself, becoming an inside-out sheath of skin. Clearing his throat, Benedict continued. Where do they keep coming from? This city is a dangerous place, Marshall answered without answering at all, his grin deepening. He appeared to be teasing, buffing up his own bravado, but Benedict started to frown. There were always five thousand different thoughts bubbling for attention in Benedict's mind, and when one surged forward with a particular loudness, he paid attention to it. While Marshall wandered off down the hallway, disappearing into the kitchen to rummage about the cupboards, Benedict remained there outside his studio, musing. Isn't that interesting though? Are you still talking to me? Benedict rolled his eyes, hurrying to join Marshall in the kitchen. Marshall was getting the pots and pans out, a stick of celery in his mouth. Benedict didn't even want to ask why. He supposed Marshall was the type to chomp on raw celery for no good reason. Who else would I be talking to? Benedict replied, hoisting himself up onto the counter. The city. It is becoming more dangerous, isn't it? Marshall took the celery out of his mouth and waved it in Benedict's direction. When Benedict only gave him a look, unwilling to open his mouth and take a bite, Marshall shrugged and threw the celery into the trash can. Ben, Ben, precious thing, I was only being facetious. Marshall lit a match for the gas. It flared to life between his fingers, a hot, burning miniature star. This city has always been dangerous. It is the core of human flaw, the pulse of. But of late, Benedict cut in, leaning over the counter, his two hands propping him up against the hard granite. Haven't you noticed the crowds in the cabarets? The frequency of men who leap on stage to hassle the young dancers. The screaming on the streets when there aren't enough rickshaws for each patron to have his own. One would think that the numbers at the clubs would change, would grow lower and lower what with the madness. But the nightlife establishments may be the only places that haven't slacked in paying rent to my uncle. For once, Marshall needed a moment to respond, nothing held ready behind his tongue as soon as his moment came. He had the slightest smile on his lips, but it was pained, as if in sorrow. Ben, he said again. He paused. It might have been that he was struggling to find the words in Russian, starting and stopping a few times without coherence, so he lapsed into his mother tongue. It's not that the city has gotten more dangerous. It's that it has changed. Changed. Benedict echoed, switching to Korean too. He hadn't taken all those lessons for nothing. He had a terrible accent, but at least he was fluent. The madness sweeps everywhere. Marshall retrieved a sprig of cilantro from the bag at his feet. He started chomping down on that too. It moves like the plague, first all the reports were by the river, then they spread inward to the city, to the concessions, and now more and more mansions on the outskirts are sending victims to the morgue. Think about it. Those who wish to protect themselves will stay in, bar their doors, seal their windows. Those who do not care, those who are violent, those who delight in that which is terrible, Marshall shrugged, waving his hands about as he chose the right words, they thrive. They come outside. The city has not grown more violent. It is a matter of its people changing. As if on cue, the sound of glass shattering swept through the apartment, startling Marshall enough to flinch while Benedict simply turned around, frowning. They both listened, waiting to see if it was a threat. When they heard shouting about rent coming from the alley alongside the building, it was clear that they needn't worry. Benedict hopped off the kitchen counter. He rolled up his sleeves as he entered the hallway again, swerving into Marshall's bedroom to grab the nearest article of clothing he saw. Okay, let's go, he demanded when he came back into the kitchen. What do you mean? Marshall exclaimed. I'm making food. I'll buy you food from a street stall. Benedict threw the jacket over to him. We've got a live victim to find today. Marshall and Benedict wandered about white flower territory for hours with no luck. They knew that alleyways were common breeding grounds for madness, so they chose only to pick through those smaller paths of this city, twisting in and out of a labyrinth they were mightily familiar with. Before long, however, they realized it didn't matter how slow and careful they were, 
pausing in the mouths of the alleys when they heard the faintest rustling from within accompanied by an undeniably metallic smell. Twice now they had hurried in with a plan of attack, only to discover that the rustling was rodents, sniffing around a bloody corpse already long dead. If it wasn't a corpse, then it was silence. It was alleyways that lay as static, undisturbed pictures, all of them reeking from overflowing trash bags and broken crate boxes, because people were too frightened to venture far and dispose of their things properly. Benedict was almost relieved when they finally stepped back onto a main street, re-entering a world where wisps and snatches of conversation between vendors and shoppers drifted alongside him as he walked. This was the real part of the city. Those alleyways had become haunted versions of Shanghai, an underbelly transformed into a deadened husk. So that was a waste of time, Marshall remarked now. He checked his pocket watch. Would you like to tell Roma of our colossal failure, or shall I? Benedict pulled a face, blowing hot air into his stiff hands. It was not yet cold enough to require gloves, but the afternoon chill today was biting enough to sting. Where is Roma anyway, he asked. This was supposed to be his task too. He's heir of the white flowers. Marshall tucked the watch away. He can do whatever he likes. You know that's not true. Marshall's eyebrows shot straight up, disappearing right into the dark mop of hair that fell over his forehead. Both of them were silent for a moment, staring at each other in a rare bout of confusion. I mean, Benedict hurried to correct, he has to answer to his father still. Oh, Marshall said shortly. He was wearing an unfamiliar, uneasy expression that made Benedict uneasy in return. It gave Benedict a sudden dip in his stomach, an urge to snatch the words he had just said out of the air, to shove them back into his mouth so Marshall could go back to his usual, relaxed disposition. Oh! Benedict echoed in question. Marshall shook his head, laughing it off. The sound immediately relaxed Benedict's stomach. For a second there I thought you meant he wasn't the heir. Benedict glanced up at the gray clouds. No, he said, that's not what I meant. But privately they both knew. Benedict Montagov and Marshal Sio were some of the only white flowers who had publicly declared their allegiance to Roma. The rest were quiet, waiting to see if Roma would emerge victorious to his birthright, or if eventually he would be upstaged by whoever Lord Montagov decided to favor next. You want to go home now? Benedict sighed and nodded. We may as well. On the next street over, as Benedict and Marshall hurried south, Kathleen was moving north, dropping in and out of the banks along the Bund. The Bund, she thought absently. What a strange way of translating it. In Chinese, it was Waitin, which should have lent itself to being called the Outer Bank in English. That was what it was a strip of land that touched the part of the Huangpu River farthest downstream. By calling it the Bund instead, it became an embankment. It became a place to come and go, ships crowding in for a chance of the life inside the banks, for trading houses and foreign consulates buzzing with power. It was here that wealth gathered most densely, amid the decadent, Beaux Arts, inspired, Western-funded buildings that only produced more wealth in a self-sustained cycle. Many of the structures were not yet finished, letting the sea breeze blow through its open beams of scaffolding. The clanging of builders working intensely rang frantic even at this late hour. They were not allowed to build up along the height-restricted bund, so they could only build well. Even half-constructed, everything here was beautiful. It was like every project was a competition to outshine the previous. Kathleen's favorite was the HSBC building, a huge, six-floor neoclassical thing housing the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, glimmering on the outside as much as it did on the inside. It was hard to believe that such a colossal collection of marble and Monel managed to come together like this, in columns and lattices and a single roaring dome. It made the whole structure look like it belonged among ancient Grecian temples rather than the epicenter of Shanghai's financial golden age. It was too bad that the people who worked in such welcoming buildings were about as welcoming as moldy rice. Kathleen exited the HSBC building begrudgingly, emitting a long groan under her breath. Weary to her bones, she leaned against one of the exterior arches, taking a minute to consider her next steps. 
I haven't a clue what you mean was the number one phrase that had been thrown at her today, and Kathleen hated failing at her tasks. As soon as these bankers realized Kathleen had not come to query about her credit account, but rather to ask whether they had seen any monsters on their way to work, they shut down immediately, rolling their eyes and asking her to please move along. Within these granite walls and thick, roaring vaults, she supposed the people who spent day after day here thought themselves safe from the madness, from rumors of the monster that brought it by. Kathleen could tell. It was in the patient wave of their hands as they gestured for the next client, the leisurely manner of shrugging off Kathleen's question like it was simply beneath them. The rich and the foreign, they didn't truly believe it. To them, this madness sweeping the city was nothing except Chinese nonsense, only to affect the doomed poor, only to touch the believers caught in their tradition. They thought their glistening marble could keep out contagion, because the contagion was nothing save the hysteria of savages. When the madness comes through these columns, Kathleen thought to herself, the people here won't know what hit them. And then, cruelly, she almost thought, good. You, there. Xiao Guanyang. Kathleen swiveled around at the voice, her heart lifting in the hopes that a banker had come out to tell her that they recalled something. Only as she turned, her eyes landed on an elderly woman with a thick crop of white hair, shuffling nearer with both her hands clutching a large purse. Yes? Kathleen asked. The elderly woman stopped in front of her, eyes sweeping across the jade pendant press to her throat. Kathleen's arms prickled with goosebumps. She resisted the urge to touch her hair. I heard you asking, the woman leaned in, her voice taking on a conspiratorial tone, after a monster? Kathleen grimaced, shaking her goosebumps away with a small exhale. I'm sorry, she replied. I don't have any information, either. Ah, but I do, the woman interrupted. You won't get anywhere with these bankers. They hardly look up from their books and desks. But I was here three days ago. I saw it. You, Kathleen looked over her shoulder, then leaned in, lowering her voice. You saw it here. With your own eyes. The woman waved for Kathleen to follow her, and she did, looking both ways before they crossed the road. They walked up to the water, near the wharves that swept out into the river. When the elderly woman stopped, she set her bag down, then used both her arms to gesture. Right here, the woman said. I was coming out of the bank with my son. Darling thing, but a complete bendin when it comes to his finances. Anyway, while he went to fetch a rickshaw, I stood by the bank to wait, and from the street there, she moved her arms to gesture toward one of the roads that moved inward into the city, this thing, came running out. A thing, Kathleen echoed. You mean the monster? Yes, the woman trailed off. She had started this story with vigor, with the sort of energy that came with holding a rapt audience. Now it was fading, suddenly striking the woman with what she had truly seen. The monster. Horrific, undying thing. But are you sure? Kathleen urged. One part of her wanted to run home with this information immediately, tell Juliet so her cousin could gather the scarlet forces and their pitchforks. Another part, the sensible part, knew this was not enough. They needed more. Are you certain it was the monster, not a shadow or? I am certain, the woman said firmly. I am certain because a fisherman docking his boat tried to shoot at it as it lumbered along this very wharf. She pointed forward, to the wharf that extended out into the wide, wide river, currently rumbling with activity from the docked ships. I am certain because the bullets merely bounced off its back, clinking to the ground as if it were not a being standing upright, but a god. It was a monster. I am sure of it. What happened? Kathleen whispered. A chill swept up her neck and down her arms. She did not think it was the sea breeze. It was something far ghastlier. What happened next? The woman blinked. She seemed to come out of a slight daze, as if she had not quite noticed how intently she had gotten lost in her memory. Well, that's the thing, she replied, frowning. My eyesight, you see. It's not the best. I watched the creature leap into the water, and then. Kathleen leaned forward. And then. 
the old woman shook her head. I do not know. Everything got a little hazy. I thought I heard skittering. It looked like the darkness out there, she extended her arm, was moving. Like little things were being shot into the darkness. She shook her head again, more intensely this time. It did not look to do much, because the woman's voice had lost all of her initial energy. My son had returned by then with the rickshaw. I told him to go look. I told him that I thought I saw a monster in the water. He ran along the wharf to go catch it. Kathleen gasped. And, did he? No, the woman frowned, her gaze cast out toward the Huangpu River. He said I was talking nonsense. Said he only saw a man, swimming away. He was convinced a fisherman had simply fallen off his boat. A man. How could there have been a man in the water while the monster was there? How could he have survived? Unless. With a shuddering breath, the woman picked her bag up, then seemed to think twice, reaching out to grip Kathleen's hand instead. I recognize you from within the Scarlet Gang's ranks, she said quietly. There's something stirring to life in the waters that surround this city. There's something stirring to life in so many places we cannot see. The elderly woman's fingers tightened until Kathleen could no longer feel her circulation within her palm. Please, the woman whispered. Protect us. 15. Days later, Juliet could think of little else but the madness. She hardly reacted any more when people called her name. She had ears only for the sound of screaming, and each time screams rang through the streets, she winced, wishing, aching to do something about it. A monster, Juliet thought, her thoughts persistent in its cyclic loop as she leaned against the staircase in wait. There's a monster spreading madness on the streets of Shanghai. Ready to go? Lord Kai called down to her, pausing at the top to straighten the collar of his coat. Juliet forced herself back into the present. Sighing, she twirled the little clutch bag in her hands. Ready as ever. Lord Kai descended the rest of the stairs, then stopped in front of his daughter, his expression set in a frown. Juliet looked down at herself, trying to determine what had drawn his disapproval. She was wearing her American dresses again, this one slightly fancier to fit the occasion, with bundles of tulle at her shoulders that fell into sleeves. Was the neckline too low cut? Was this, for once, normal fatherly concern that wasn't about whether she could kill a man without flinching? Where's your mask? Close enough. I'll take it. Why bother? Juliet sighed. You're not wearing one. Lord Kai scrubbed at his eyes. Juliet couldn't tell if it was his general tiredness in preparing to deal with the Frenchman, or if he was exasperated with her childish behavior. Yes, because I am a fifty-year-old man, her father replied. It would look ridiculous. Juliet shrugged, then started for the front door. You said it, not me. The night was brisk when they stepped out into the driveway, and Juliet shivered slightly, rubbing her hands against her bare arms. No matter. It was too late to go back for a coat now. She climbed into the car with the chauffeur's help and slid down the seat to make room for her father. Most of their other family members who were attending the masquerade had already left. Juliet hadn't wanted to go anyway, so she had waited while Lord Kai took his time finishing up his work. He had only declared that it was time to get going when the sky turned pink and the burning orange sun started to brush the horizon. Lord Kai got into the car. Once he settled himself into his seat, he rested his hands in his lap and glanced over at Juliet. His expression set into another frown. This time he was eyeing the necklace laced tightly across her throat. That's not a necklace, is it? It is not, Baba. That's garrote wire, isn't it? Indeed it is, Baba. How many other weapons have you concealed on yourself? Five, Baba. Lord Kai pinched the bridge of his nose and muttered, Would Maya, have mercy on my soul. Juliet smiled like she had been complimented. Their car started forward and rumbled along smoothly, driving through the calmer, rural roads and into the city, honking every three seconds for the laborers and the men dragging rickshaws to get out of the way. Juliet usually made a habit not to look out the window, lest she make eye contact and a beggar approached. 
but for some inexplicable reason, she looked up tonight. Right in time to see a woman bawling on the sidewalk, cradling a body in her lap. The body was a bloody mess, hands stained red and throat so messy that its head was barely hanging on by the force of the neck bone. The crying woman cradled the head, pressed her cheek to its deathly white face. The car started to move again. Juliet turned her gaze to the front, to the passing blur of the windshield in the front seat, and swallowed hard. Why is this happening? She thought desperately. Has this city committed such awful sins that we have come to deserve this? The answer was, yes. But it wasn't entirely their fault. The Chinese had built the pit, gathered the wood, and lit the match, but it was the foreigners who had come in and poured gasoline upon every surface, letting Shanghai rage into an untamable forest fire of debauchery. Here we are, the chauffeur said, breaking. Juliet, her jaw tight, got out of the car. In the French concession, everything was a little bit shiny, even the grass beneath her feet. These gardens were usually gated, but they had been pulled wide open tonight specifically for this function. When Juliet walked through the gates, it was as if she had entered another world, one far from the dirty streets and tightly cramped alleyways that they had just driven through. Here it was greenery and climbing vines and slick intentions, little gazebos sitting patiently in quaint nooks and the darkness pulling in, pulling the shadows of the tall, wrought iron gates that bordered this garden long into the grass, growing longer with every second of the violet sunset. Despite the chill, Juliet was sweating a little as she browsed the crowds of people dispersed across these delicately kept gardens. Her first order of business was identifying where every relative had situated themselves. She found most of them easily, scattered about and socializing. Perhaps she had taken it a bit too far to bring so many weapons. Because of the knife strapped to the small of her back, her dress was too tight at her waist, and the white fabric at her knees was bunching up with every step. But Juliet couldn't help herself. By bringing weapons, she could fool herself into thinking she could act if disaster struck. She tried not to acknowledge that there were some disasters she couldn't fight off with her knives. The foreigners here certainly did not care. As Juliet walked, she overheard more than one giggle about the rumors of madness, British men and French women alike clinking their glasses in celebration regarding how intelligent it was to stay out of the local hysteria. They acted like it was a choice. Come, Juliet, Lord Kai prompted from ahead, straightening his sleeves. Juliet followed obediently, but her eyes remained elsewhere. Under a delicate marble pavilion, a quartet was playing soft music, the sound floating toward a clearing where some foreign merchants and their wives were dancing. There was an even ratio of scarlet gangsters and foreigners in attendance, merchants and officials alike, and a few were going so far as to be conversing in the fading twilight. She spotted Tyler within those groups, chatting with a Frenchwoman. When he saw her looking, he waved pleasantly. Juliet's mouth soured into a line. Nearby, the strings of lights looped across the gazebo awnings flared to life with a sudden whoosh. The gardens became illuminated with gold, pushing out the darkness that would have otherwise crept in when the sun settled completely into the sea. Juliet, Lord Kai prompted again. Juliet had slowed her walk to a snail's crawl without noticing. Begrudgingly, she picked up her pace. She had noted that most of the attendants remained in groups with those to whom they were alike. British women who had moved here with their diplomat husbands laughed with one another, their laced gloves swirling their pastel parasols. French officers clapped one another on the back, howling over whatever unfunny joke one of their superiors just told yet dispersed in different sections of the garden, three loners stood unassociated despite their best efforts to look as if they were occupied in proper business. Juliet stopped again. She cocked her head at one of them, the one who was intensely examining the plate in his hands. Baba, doesn't that boy look Korean to you? Lord Kai didn't even follow the direction of her gaze. He put his hands around her shoulders and nudged her in the direction they were going. Focus, Juliet. It was a moot command. Juliet didn't require any focus when they approached the Consul General of France, because when the men spoke, she simply faded into the background. She was barely more than an ornament decorating the place. She tuned in and out of the main conversation, 
not even catching the consul general's name. Her focus was on the two men standing at attention behind him. Do you want to get a sandwich afterward? The first man whispered to the second in French. I hate this catering. They're trying too hard to appeal to that bland country across the ditch. You spoke my mind, the second responded quietly. Would you look at them? A bunch of unrefined peasants. Juliet had tensed, but with the remark about the ditch, it was clear that they were referring to the British, not the Scarlet Gang. They sip away on their tea and claim they invented it, the second man continued. Think again, fool. The Chinese were brewing tea before you even had a king. Juliet snorted suddenly, the irrelevant pettiness of the conversation completely taking her by surprise, then coughed to mask the sound. Lord Kai had nothing to worry about. Bringing her here had been an unnecessary precaution. She turned her attention back to her father's conversation. They are wary, my lord, the consul general was saying. He spoke of his French businessmen, Juliet guessed. The guard municipal keeps the French concession safe for now, but if there is any trouble brewing, I need to know that I have the support of the Scarlet Gang. If there was a revolt from the common Chinese people, from the unpaid workers who decided communism was the prime solution, the French needed a way to maintain their hold on Shanghai. They thought they could obtain it with the weaponry and resources of the Scarlet Gang. They didn't quite realize that if there was a revolution, there would be no one left in Shanghai for them to do their business with. But Lord Kai voiced none of that. He agreed easily, under the condition that the Scarlet Gang still had the jurisdiction to run their errands in the French concession. The Consul General of France exclaimed, in an attempt to mold his English with Americanisms, Why, old friend, of course. That is not even in question, and when the two men shook hands, it seemed all was settled. Juliet thought the whole thing theatrical and ridiculous. She thought it preposterous that her father had to ask permission to run business on land their ancestors had lived and died on from men who had simply docked their boat here and decided they would like to be in charge now. The consul general of France, as if he could detect the hostility of Juliet's thoughts, at last turned his gaze to her. And how are you, Miss Juliet? Juliet smiled widely. You shouldn't get a say here. She was speaking before her father could stop her, her words dripping so sweetly that they sounded like admiration. However flawed we are however much we fight each other, this country is still not for people like you to dictate. The consul general's bright expression faltered, but only slightly, unable to determine if Juliet was taking a dig or making an innocent remark. Her words were sharp but her eyes were friendly, her hands clasped together like she was making small talk. Have a good day, Lord Kai cut in before any of the French could formulate a response. He steered Juliet away firmly, marching her by her shoulders. Juliet, Lord Kai hissed the moment they were out of earshot. I didn't think I had to teach you this, but you cannot say things like that to powerful people. It will be the death of you." Juliet shook her shoulders out of her father's grasp. Surely not, she argued. He is powerful, but he does not have the power to kill me. Very well, Lord Kai said firmly. He may not kill you. Then why can I not speak freely? Her father sighed. He breathed in, then breathed out searching for his answer. Because, he said finally, it hurts his feelings, Juliet. Juliet folded her arms. We stay quiet about the injustice of all this simply because it hurts his feelings? Lord Kai shook his head. He took his daughter by the elbow to lead her farther away, sparing a long look over his shoulder. When they were near one of the gazebos, he let go and clasped his hands before him. These days, Juliet, he said, Lo and warily, the most dangerous people are the powerful white men who feel as if they have been slighted. Juliet knew this. She knew this far more than people like her father and mother, who had only ever seen what the foreigners were capable of after they sailed their ships into Chinese waters. But Juliet, her parents had sent her off to America to be educated, after all. She had grown up with an eye pinned to the outside of every establishment before she walked in searching for the segregation signs that demanded she keep out. She had learned to move out of the way whenever a white lady in heels was coming down the sidewalk with her pearls, 
learned to fake meekness and lower her gaze in the event that the white lady's husband would note the slight roll of Juliet's eyes and yell after her, demanding to know why she was in this country and what her problem was. She didn't have to do a single thing in offense. It was the entitlement that drove these men forward. Entitlement that encouraged their wives to place a delicate handkerchief to their nose and sniff, wholeheartedly believing the tirade was deserved. They believed themselves the rulers of the world, on stolen land in America, on stolen land in Shanghai. Everywhere they went, entitlement. And Juliet was so tired. Everyone gets their feelings hurt, she said bitterly. While he's here, he can experience it for once in his life. He doesn't deserve to have power. It's not his right. I know, Lord Kai said simply. All of China knows. But this is the way the world works now. For as long as he has power, we need him. For as long as he has the most guns, he holds the power. It is not as if we do not have guns, Juliet grumbled anyway. It is not as if we have not had an iron grip on Shanghai for the last century with our guns. Once it was enough, Lord Kai replied. Now it is not. The French needed them, but the Scarlet Gang did not need the French in the same way. What her father meant in actuality was that they needed French power, they needed to stay on their good side. If the Scarlet Gang were to declare war and take back the French concession, as Chinese territory, they would be destroyed in hours. Loyalty and gang hierarchy was nothing against warships and torpedoes. The Opium Wars had proved that. Juliet made a sound of disgust. Seeing her father's stern expression, she sighed and diverted the topic back to what was important. Never mind. I heard nothing of interest from his men. Lord Kai nodded. That is fortunate. It means less trouble for us. Go enjoy yourself. Sure, Juliet said. By that she meant, I'm getting food and then I'm leaving. She had spotted Paul Dexter coming through the gates. He was searching through the crowd. I'll be hiding, Juliet coughed. Pardon me, I'll be hovering by that tree. Unfortunately, despite how quickly Juliet paced away, she still wasn't fast enough. Miss Kai, what a pleasant surprise. Having reached the food table, Juliet set her clutch down and primly picked up an egg tart. She took a nibble, then turned around, facing the human equivalent of stale bread. How have you been? Paul asked. He clasped his hands behind his back, stretching the blue fabric of his tailored suit. He wasn't wearing a mask, either. His green eyes blinked at her unfettered, reflecting the golden lights above them. Juliet shrugged. Fine. Excellent, excellent, Paul crowed. She didn't know why he was responding so enthusiastically to her uninspiring reply. Let me say, it's most. What do you want, Paul? Juliet interrupted. I already told you that we don't want your business. Undeterred, Paul only ramped up his zeal and took Juliet by the elbow to lead her away from the food. At the back of her mind, she considered shooting him, but because this was a party with hundreds of rich foreigners mingling about she decided that probably would not be the best course of action. She tensed her arm, but allowed Paul to lead her away. Just to talk, he said. We've taken our business straight to the other merchants. Worry not. I have no more intentions to bother the Scarlet Gang. Juliet smiled sweetly. Her teeth were gritted hard. And if that is the case, why are you bothering with me? Paul smiled sweetly back though his expression appeared genuine. Perhaps I am after your affection, pretty girl. Gross. She would bet her life savings that he only thought her pretty because she was digestible to Western standards. Her feminine beauty was a concept as fleeting as power. If she acquired a tan, put on some weight, and let a few decades pass, the street artists would not be rendering her face to sell their creams anymore. Chinese and Western standards alike were arbitrary, pitiful things. But Juliet still needed to keep herself in line, force herself to follow them if people were to look up to her. Without her looks, this city would turn on her. It would claim that she didn't deserve to be as competent as she was. The men, meanwhile, could be as tan, as fat, and as old as they wished. 
it would have no bearing on what people thought of them. Juliet removed her arm from Paul's grip, pivoting on her heel to return to the food. No, thanks. My affection is not one with such humdrum energy. It was as thorough a dismissal as any. Juliet thought she had been left alone when she picked up a drink. But Paul was persistent. His voice came over her shoulder again. How is your father? He is well, Juliet replied, barely biting back the aggravation that wanted to climb into her words. Out of social courtesy, she asked him in a light voice, and how is yours? Juliet was the queen of socialites. She had had nothing but practice. If she wanted to, she could have turned her slight, polite smile into a megawatt grin. But she did not think she could get any information out of Paul, and associating with him seemed pointless. Perhaps Paul could tell. Perhaps he was smarter than Juliet gave him credit for. Perhaps he had indeed detected the restlessness of her tapping fingers and the ceaseless movement of her craning neck. So he made himself useful. My father and I have started working for the Larkspur, Paul said. Have you heard of him? The Larkspur. Juliet's tapping fingers halted mid-movement. La Jespu. Larkspur. That was what the old man in Cheng Huangmio had been trying to say. Hearing one lunatic scream about a mysterious figure, claiming he had received a cure for the madness, was unworthy of notice. Hearing that same mysterious figure mentioned twice in a few days was strange. Her eyes focused properly on the British smooth talker before her, for once settling into a steady gaze. I've heard some things, here and there, Juliet replied vaguely. She tilted her head. What do you do? Run errands, mostly. Now Paul was being deliberately vague, and he knew it. Juliet watched the lines of his small smirk, the curve of his eyebrows drawing together, and read him to an inch of his life. He wanted attention for his involvement with the Larkspur, but he was not allowed to give answers. He would hint at all he knew, but he would not give anything up just for gossip. Errands. Juliet parroted. I cannot imagine there is much to do. Oh, that's where you're wrong, Paul said, his chest puffing up. The Larkspur has created a vaccine for the madness. He has merchants rushing for it in droves, and the organization of such a large affair requires workers the size of an army. Your salary must be fantastic. Juliet eyed the chain of a golden pocket watch draped through one of his buttonholes. The Larkspur sits upon stacks of money, Paul confirmed. Is this Larkspur benefiting off the panic of the madness, then? Juliet wondered. Or does he truly have a vaccine that is worth the money of these merchants? Juliet could have voiced her musings aloud, but Paul was looking too satisfied to give her a truthful answer. She only asked bluntly, and does the Larkspur have a name? Paul shrugged. If he does, I do not know it. If you would like, I could arrange for you to meet him. At this Juliet straightened up, peering at him from underneath her blackened eyelashes, waiting for the catch. Though I must say, Paul continued, looking apologetic, I am not yet very high in the ranks. You would have to stick around for some time, while I work my way up. Juliet barely refrained from rolling her eyes. Paul was still blabbering on, but she had stopped listening. He was only after a power trip. He couldn't make himself useful after all. Excuses moi, mademoiselle. Paul abruptly shut up as the voice spoke behind Juliet, giving her a blissful few seconds without his prattling. She silently thanked the French intruder, then took it back the moment she turned and faced the masked blonde man standing before them. Oh hell! voulez vous dancer? Though Juliet could feel a vein in her forehead throbbing dangerously, pulsating with the rhythm of her anger, she took the opportunity to escape. Bien sir, she said tightly. A plus tard, Paul. Juliet snagged Roma's sleeve and dragged him away, her fingers curled so tightly that her right hand turned numb. Did he think she wouldn't recognize him just because he was wearing a blonde wig and a mask? Do you have a death wish? Juliet hissed, switching to English as soon as Paul was out of earshot. Then, noting all the British ministers and merchants around her, she lowered her tongue into Russian instead. I should kill you right now. Your audacity. You wouldn't dare, 
Roma replied, he's Russian fast and biting. Would you risk allowing the Scarlet Gang to be seen as violent brutes in front of these foreigners just to get rid of me? The price is too high to pay. I Juliet clamped her lips shut, swallowing whatever else was poised on her tongue. They had paused in the fray of the dancing, amid a gathering of couples steadily increasing with the change in music. The pull of strings from the quartet was coming fast, the tune was livelier, the rhythm was teasing. Roma was right. Juliet wouldn't dare, but the foreigners had been the furthest thing from her mind. Juliet wouldn't dare because no matter how big her talk was, she still couldn't separate the hatred broiling in her stomach with the sudden lurch of adrenaline that came to life with his proximity. If her body refused to forget who Roma once was to her, how was she to make those same limbs rebel from their nature, make them destroy him? Penny for your thoughts. At Roma's switch back into English, Juliet's gaze jerked up. Their eyes locked. A tremor shuddered along the back of her hands. In the midst of so many swishing skirts, the stillness between them was starting to look suspicious. Really, Juliet wondered how Roma avoided looking suspicious anywhere he went. He moved too well. Had someone told her four years ago that he was a god in human form, she would have believed them. I doubt you have a penny on you, Juliet finally replied. Reluctantly, she took a step forward and raised her hand, Roma did the same. They didn't need to speak to make the complimenting gesture. They had always known how to predict what the other was about to do. Indeed, but I have plenty of larger bills. Would you offer more thoughts for those? The music grew louder, spurring the couples all around them to move with a renewed vigor. Roma and Juliet were forced to circle each other, hands extended but not touching, hovering but not steady, needing to move to blend in but unwilling to make contact, unwilling to pretend to be more than what they were. What are you doing here, Roma? Juliet asked tightly. She did not have the energy to play along with his trivial conversation. At such an intimate distance, she could hardly keep her breath even, could hardly hide the trembling that threatened to shake her extended hand. I gather you are not risking your life just to have a little dance. No, he replied surely. My father sent me. A pause. Only then did it seem like Roma was struggling to get his next words out. He wishes to propose that the Scarlet Gang and White Flowers work together. Juliet almost laughed in his face. She quavered at the rising numbers of the dead lost to the madness, yes, and she feared another outbreak within her own house, this time targeting those of her blood, those whom she knew well and held close to her heart. But it hadn't happened yet, and it wouldn't happen if Juliet could work fast enough, alone. No matter how much more efficient it was for the two gangs to work together, to join a divided city into one, she had no incentive at all to agree to Roma's proposal, and he appeared to think the same. The words coming out of his mouth were one matter, but his expression was another. His heart was not in it, either. Even if working together could merge their territory, even if it could bring a momentary peace to the feud so they could discover why their gangsters were being picked off one by one, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to set down the hatred and the blood, to resolve the fury that Juliet had been nursing in her heart for four years. Besides, why would Lord Montagu, of all people, propose an alliance? He was the most hateful of them all. Juliet could only come to one conclusion, the most likely, it was a test. If he sent Roma here and the Scarlet Gang agreed, then Lord Montagu knew the extent of their desperation. The White Flowers didn't truly want to work together. They only wanted to know how hard the Scarlet Gang had been hit, so they could use the information to strike even harder. Never, Juliet hissed. Run home and tell your father he can choke. Juliet whirled on her heel and broke away from their half dance, but then the music changed to suit a waltz, and Roma snagged her arm, pulling her back until her other hand landed on his shoulder, and his came around her waist. Before she could do a thing about it, he had pulled her into the proper stance, chest to chest, and they were dancing. It was like she was under compulsion. For a moment she allowed herself to believe they were fifteen again, spinning on the rooftop they liked to hide on, moving to the jazz club roaring beneath their feet. Memories were beastly little creatures, after all, they rose with the faintest whiff of nourishment. 
She hated the knee-jerk way she leaned into him. She hated that her body followed his lead without resistance. They used to be unstoppable. When they were together, they never had an ounce of fear, not when they were hiding at the back of a noisy club playing cards, nor when they made it their mission to sneak into every private park in Shanghai, a bottle of whatever Juliet had stolen from the liquor cabinet tucked underneath Roma's arm, giggling like a pair of idiots. It was all too familiar. The feeling of Roma's hands on her waist, his hand tucked in hers, those hands were of such grace, but she knew better than anyone that blood was soaked through and through the lines of his palms. Lines that read like scripture in appearance were in truth nothing but sin. This isn't proper, she intoned. You give me no choice, Roma replied. His voice was strained. I need your cooperation. The music rang sharp and then it moved fast, and as Roma twirled her outward, her skirts clinking alongside the tune, Juliet's resistance snapped to attention. When she came back, she wasn't content to let Roma lead. Despite their stance, the moves, the steps, the angle of their hands, despite everything about the waltz that determined she was the subservient partner, Juliet started to dictate where they were stepping. Why do you not dance with my father, then, she asked, taking in a deep gulp of air as the next spin came. He is the voice of this gang. Roma was fighting back. His grip was tight on her hand, his fingers pressing into her waist like he was trying to press his fingerprints into her dress. If she had only heard his voice, she would not have known the pressure he was under. His voice was easy, casual. I fear your father would shoot me in the face. Oh, and you don't fear that I would do the same. It would appear my reputation doesn't precede me. Juliet, Roma said. You have power. The music came to an abrupt stop and they froze too, just as they were, eye to eye, heart to heart. As the people around them broke away in light laughter, switching partners before the music started again, Roma and Juliet simply stood there, heaving for breath, chests rising and falling, as if they had just engaged in close contact combat instead of the waltz. Step away, Juliet told herself. The pain of it was almost physical. The years had worn on between them, had aged them into monsters with human faces, unrecognizable against old photos. Yet no matter how much she wanted to forget, it was like no time had passed at all. She looked at him and she could still remember the terrible dip in her stomach when the explosion happened, could still feel the tightness in her throat that signaled the onslaught of tears, worsening and worsening until she was breaking down against the exterior wall of her house, holding her scream back with nothing but the palm of her silk-gloved hand. You must consider it. Roma spoke quietly, like any loud noise could startle the bubble that had formed around them, could stomp down the strangeness between them, boiling and boiling to the surface. I give my word that this is no ambush. This is a matter of preventing chaos from descending onto the streets. Once, a long time ago, at the back of a library while a storm raged on outside, Juliet had asked Roma, do you ever imagine what life would be like if you had a different last name? All the time. Don't you? Juliet had thought about it. Only sometimes. Then I consider all that I would miss out on without it. What would I be if I weren't a Kai? Roma had lifted onto his elbow. You could be a Montagov. Don't be ridiculous. Very well. Roma had leaned in, close enough that she could see the twinkle in his dark eyes close enough to see her own blushing face in the reflection of his gaze. Or we could erase both names and leave this entire Kai, Montagov nonsense behind. Now she wanted to tear out the memories, launch them as a wad of spit right at Roma's face. You give your word. But you have always been a liar. She opened her mouth, the words to turn Roma away balanced right at the tip of her tongue. Then her gaze went to a rapidly approaching blur of movement coming toward him and she blanched, her jaw wiring shut. Roma became stock still when he sensed the gun that Tyler had pointed to his head. Juliet, Tyler said. Where the loose sleeves of his dress shirt billowed with the light wind, his hands were perfectly still, not a single tremor to the steady grip on his weapon. Step away. Juliet considered the situation. Her eyes darted a quick inventory of the foreigners around them, taking in their scandalized gasps and their confused, 
white eyes. She needed to de-escalate this right now. What is wrong with you? Juliet scolded, feigning outrage as she stepped away. Tyler frowned. What? Put away your gun and apologize to this kind Frenchman, she continued. She placed her hands on her hips, like she was Tyler's snappy, and instead of a girl with a heartbeat that threatened to tear through her rib cage. Tyler's expression morphed from furious to perplexed and back to furious again. He was buying it. It was working. Tyler, Lord Kai called from a distance away. Gun away. Now. This is Roma Montagov, Tyler snapped. Gasp sounded from the British couple who stood behind him. I know it. I could tell by his voice. Don't embarrass us by acting out like this, Juliet warned quietly. Tyler responded by pressing the barrel of the gun deeper into Roma's neck. I will not tolerate a Montagoff parading around on our territory. The disrespect. Two figures stepped out of the shadows then, their guns already pointed on Tyler, and snatching the words from his mouth. Benedict Montagoff and Marshal Seo had not even bothered wearing disguises. It was the Scarlet Gang's fault for not recognizing them. After all, Juliet had known they might be coming. She knew that Roma had snatched her invitation, that the White Flowers would have heard about this function even without it. And perhaps this was her own fault too. Perhaps some traitorous part of her had wanted Roma to show just so she could see him. That part of her, the one that had dreamed of a better world, that had loved without caution, was supposed to be dead. Just like monsters were supposed to be mere tales. Just like this city, in all its glitter and technology and innovation, was supposed to be safe from madness. Stop, Juliet said, inaudible even to herself. This would end in a bloodbath. Stop. A scream echoed into the night. The confused rumblings began immediately, but then confusion turned to panic and panic turned to chaos. Tyler had no choice but to lower his gun when the British woman standing two feet away from him collapsed to the ground. He had no choice but to dart backward and give wide berth when the woman's hands launched at her delicate lily-white throat and tore it to pieces. All around them. One by one by one by one. They dropped, scarlets and merchants and foreigners alike. Those who had not been infected attempted to run. Some made it out the gates. Some succumbed as soon as they skidded onto the pavement outside the gardens, the madness kicking in with delay. Juliet's lungs were tight again. Why was it spreading so damn fast? No, Juliet cried, rushing for a familiar figure on the ground. She got to Mr. Lee right before he could place his hands on his throat, slammed her knee onto his wrist in the hopes that she could prevent him from acting. The madness was too strong. Mr. Lee yanked his arm out from underneath her, and Juliet was sent toppling, her elbow skidding against the grass. Don't, don't, she shouted, lunging forward and trying again. This time his hands made contact with his throat before she could reach him. This time, before she could try to wrap herself around her favorite uncle and force him to stop, someone was pulling her away, a rough grip pushing Juliet back onto the ground. Juliet scrambled for the knife hidden in her back, her first instinct to brace for defense. Then she heard, Juliet, stop. I'm not attacking you. Her hand froze, a cry caught in her throat. An arc of blood flew wide into the night, drops landing on her ankle, her wrists, dotting her skin like morbid, crimson jewelry. Mr. Lee grew still. His face was frozen in his last expression, one of terror so unlike the kindness that Juliet was used to. I could have saved him, she whispered. You couldn't, Roma snapped immediately. You would have just infected yourself in the process. Juliet let out a small, surprised breath. She scrunched her fists to hide their shaking. What do you mean? Insects, Juliet, Roma said. He swallowed hard as a nearby bout of screaming increased in volume. That is how the madness is spreading, like lice through your hair. For the shortest, uncensored second, Juliet's eyes widened, the web of facts in her head finally connecting, a thin line tracing from point to point. Then she laughed bitterly and brought her hand up to her head. She knocked upon her skull, and a hard, 
crispy sort of sound came from her hair, a sound that made it seem like she was knocking on cardboard instead. Her naturally straight hair needed at least three pounds of product to make her finger waves, or else the formation wouldn't harden in place. I'd like to see them try. Roma didn't say anything in response. He thinned his lips and looked out into the gardens. Those who were alive had chosen to huddle under a gazebo, somber, and uncertain. Her father stood separated from the rest, his hands behind his back, merely watching. There was nothing that anybody could do except stand there and watch the last of the victims die. One meeting. Roma jerked his eyes to her, startling. Pardon? One meeting, Juliet repeated, as if his hearing had been the problem. She wiped the blood off her face. That's all I can promise you. 16. Juliet took her time arming herself. There was something comforting about the act, something satisfying about the smooth, cold feeling of a gun pressed to her bare skin, one sticking out of her shoe, one at her thigh, one by her waist. She was sure others would disagree. But if Juliet ran with the tide, she wouldn't be Juliet anymore. After the incident in the French concession gardens, it had been Bedlam in the Kai mansion. Just listen to them, she had told her parents, her eyes burning because of the late hour. There's no harm in listening. Disgruntled muttering had broken out immediately from the relatives gathered around on the couches, relatives who were inner circle scarlets and relatives who were absolutely clueless about what went on within the scarlet gang. Instead of going to sleep, they were all listening to a proposal that Juliet was directing only at her parents, and they all erupted with indignation, repulsed that Juliet would even entertain the notion of entering a meeting room with the white flowers in peace. Shut up! Juliet screamed. Shut up, shut up, all of you! Save for her parents, they all froze with their eyes wide, startled like raccoon dogs caught in the light. Juliet was heaving for breath, her face still marred with Mr. Lee's blood. She looked a living nightmare. Good, she thought. Let them consider me callous. It is better than marking me weak. Imagine, Juliet said when she could breathe evenly again. Her outburst had forced the living room quiet. Imagine what the foreigners must think of us. Imagine what they discuss among themselves now as they watch their officers clean the dead. We merely confirm that we are savages, that this country is a place where madness spreads like disease, taking its people in droves. Perhaps that is good, Tyler called from the base of the staircase. He was seated casually, his elbows leaning back on a step while the rest of his body lounged on the hardwood floors. Why not wait for this madness to run its course? Kill enough foreigners until they pack up their bags and run? Because that's not how it works, Juliet hissed. Do you know what will happen instead? They listen to the sweet nothings of their missionaries. They take it upon themselves to be our saviors. They roll tanks onto our streets, and then they place their government in Shanghai, and before you know it, Juliet stopped. She switched from Shanghainese to English, making her best attempt at a British accent. Thank goodness we colonized the Chinese when we did. Who knows how they may have otherwise destroyed themselves. Silence. Many of her relatives had not understood her when she switched to English. It did not matter. Those whom she needed to convince, her parents, understood her fine. The way I see it, Juliet continued, dropping into her natural American accent. If our gangsters don't stop dying, then we lose control. The workers in the cotton mills and opium centers start grumbling, the whole city starts to stir with chaos, and then the foreigners take over, if the communists don't get there first. At least the white flowers are an even playing field. At least we are at an equilibrium. At least we have half the city as opposed to none. Speak plainly, Lady Kai said. She, too, slipped into accented English. You mean to say that putting aside the blood feud with the white flowers is more acceptable than the risk of foreigners ruling us? Why can't they just speak Bendy Hua? An aunt muttered bitterly in complaint, no longer able to track the conversation. Only for one meeting, Juliet replied quickly ignoring the grumblings. Only for long enough to join our resources and put a stop to the madness once and for all. Only so the white men keep their hands off this damn country. 
and despite how strongly she had believed in her argument as she was delivering it, she'd still received the shock of her life when her parents had actually agreed. Now she looked into the mirror on her vanity, smoothed out her dress, and brushed a stray lock of hair back into her curls, pressing hard so it would mesh with the gel. Her hands were shaking. They shook on her way down the stairs, as her heels clacked along the driveway, as she slid into the back of the car, scooting to the end so Rosalind and Kathleen could jam themselves in after her. They kept shaking and shaking and shaking as she leaned her head against the window, staring out into the city streets as they drove. She watched the people with a new light, observing the vendors selling their wares and the barbers doing their jobs on the street sides, dropping their tufts of thick black hair to the concrete. The energy in Shanghai had disappeared. It was like some great big hand had reached down from the heavens and yanked the life out of every worker on the streets, took the volume away from the vendors, the vigor away from the rickshaw drivers, the lively chatter from the men who hung around shops for no reason other than to talk to passers-by. At least, until they saw the fancy car coming down the street. Then their scared eyes turned narrow. Then they did not dare openly rage, but they did stare, and such stares spoke monologues in itself. The gangsters were the rulers of the city. If the city fell, the gangsters got the blame. And then all the gangsters would die killed in political revolution. Madness or no madness, foreigners or no foreigners. Juliet leaned her head back against the seat, biting down on the inside of her cheeks so hard that the taste of metal flooded across her tongue. Unless she could stop it, this was going to come to a bitter, bitter end. Terrible, isn't it? Rosalind whispered, leaning over to peer out the window. Not for long, Juliet said in reply, in promise. Not if I can help it. Her hand stopped shaking. Elisa Montagova had memorized almost every street in Shanghai. In her head, instead of dendrites and synaptic nerves, she fancied there lived a map of her city, overlying her temporal lobes and amygdala pairs until all that she was made of was the places she had been. When Elisa went missing from the places she was supposed to be, she was usually listening in on someone else's conversation. Either within her own household or the whole city, Elisa wasn't picky. Sometimes she would catch the most interesting snippets of the lives around her, bits and pieces that would come together in the most unexpected ways if she heard enough from different people. Today was a disappointment. Sighing, Elisa climbed out of the vent she had squirmed herself into giving up on the argument between Mr. Lang and his elderly mother. There had been some rumors about instability within the Scarlet Gang, of Lord Kai being uprooted by his brother-in-law, but that proved to be a load of baloney. The only threat Mr. Lang posed was boring the ears off his own mother, whom he was visiting in her small city apartment, constantly complaining about the way she made her dumplings. Oh dear, Elisa said to herself, she peered down from the third-story rooftop she had found herself on, scratching her head. An hour ago, she had managed to sneak up here by climbing atop a street vendor's stall. It had cost her only one cent, to buy a vegetable bun, and then the old man had let her scramble onto the structure to get a leg onto the window ledge of the apartment block's second floor. Since then the vendor had packed up and taken his conveniently tall cart with him. Grimacing, Elisa searched for a ledge that could close the distance between the second floor and the hard ground, but she couldn't see anything of use on this side of the building. She would have to find another way down, and quickly too. The sun was hastening its descent, and Roma had threatened to take away all her shoes if she didn't attend the meeting tonight, which, to Elisa, was a threat that shook her to her easily cold toes. They will scrutinize us down to every last detail, Roma had said. They're going to watch Papa's every move. They're going to notice Dimitri's prominence. Don't let them notice that you're missing too. So Elisa pinched her nose and slid down the water pipe into the alleyway behind the building. There was so much trash dumped here that she even had trouble breathing through her mouth. It was as if the stench were being absorbed through her tongue. Grumbling, Elisa waded through the trash, trying to estimate how late she was running. The sun was already too low almost out of sight within the city, tucked behind the buildings in the distance. She was so preoccupied with her worrying that she almost didn't hear the wheezing until she passed right by. Elisa froze. Hello, she said, 
switching to the first Chinese dialect that her tongue landed on. Is someone there? And in Russian, a weak voice replied, Here. Elisa scrambled back, hurrying through the trash bags in search of the person who had spoken. Her gaze landed on a blot of red. When she waited closer, the shape of a man appeared amid the trash by the wall. He was lying in a pool of his own blood, his throat torn to shreds. Oh no. It didn't take Elisa's usual genius to work out that this man was a victim of the madness tearing through Shanghai. She had heard her brother whispering about it, but he wouldn't tell her anything concrete, and he would never discuss it in the places she could listen in on. Perhaps he did that on purpose. Elisa didn't recognize the victim before her, but he was a white flower, and by the look of his clothes, he was supposed to be working a shift at the nearby ports. Elisa paused, unsteady. Her brother had warned her to stay far, far away from anyone who looked like they were even a little unbalanced. But Elisa never listened. She dropped to her knees. Help, she screamed. Help. A sudden burst of activity erupted at the end of the alleyway, confused, annoyed muttering from other nearby white flowers coming to see what the fuss was about. Elisa put her ear to the dying man's mouth, needing to hear if he was still breathing, if he was still alive. She was just in time to catch his last, long sigh. Gone. Elisa rocked back, stunned. The other white flowers gathered around her, their annoyance transforming into sorrow, as soon as they understood why Elisa had been screaming. Many took off their hats and held them to their chests. They were not surprised to see such a sight before them. They appeared resigned, another death to add to the hundreds that had already occurred before their eyes. Run along, little one, the white flower closest to Elisa told her gently. Elisa got to her feet slowly, letting the men deal with their own fallen. Somehow, in a daze, she navigated herself back onto the streets, looking up at the orange sky. The meeting. She started sprinting, cursing under her breath as she pulled up her mental map for the fastest route. Elisa was by the Huangpu River already, but the address she had memorized was much farther south, in the industrial sector of Nanshur, where the cotton mills rumbled and buildings turned from commercial to industrial. The rival gangs were to meet there, far from the defined lines of their territories, far from the thoroughly established definitions of what was scarlet and what was white flower. In Nanshur, there were only factories. But amid those, there were either factory owners who were scarlet-funded or white flower associated, or workers with grubby faces, living under gangster rule but ambivalent to the way the scales turned. Some of those workers used to pledge their allegiance to one or the other, like the ones who were employed in the main city. Then the rural wages started to drop and the factory owners started getting richer. Then the communists came in and started to whisper in their ears about revolution, and after all, you could only have a revolution if you cut off the heads of those in power. Elisa flagged a rickshaw and clambered onto the seat. The man pulling it gave her a strange look, probably wondering if she was old enough to be running around on her own. Or maybe he thought her an escapee, one of those Russian dancers in the clubs fleeing her debts. Those girls were the cheapest stage props in all of Shanghai, too western looking to be Chinese, and too eastern acting to be exotically foreign. Keep going until the buildings look like they're falling apart, Elisa told the rickshaw driver. The rickshaw started moving. By the time Elisa arrived, the sun was almost completely under the horizon, only a wedge floating above the jaundiced waves. She idled before the building that Roma had described, confused and shivering with the first hints of the nighttime cold. Her gaze swiveled from the closed door of the abandoned warehouse to ten paces left of it, where a Chinese girl was looking out into the river. This far south, the Huangpu was a different color. Almost foggier. Maybe it was because of the smoke that drifted through the air around them, some from the nearby flour mill, some from the adjacent oil mill. The French Water Works establishment was nearby too. No doubt that network was doing its part clogging up the place. Elisa stepped forward hesitantly, hoping to ask the girl for confirmation of their location. Her fur shrug was ruffling in the breeze, all of it some shade of orange under the sunset. It hasn't started yet. Don't worry. Elisa blinked at the Russian words, 
taken aback for a short moment. Everything made more sense when the girl turned around and Elisa recognized her face. Juliet, Elisa said without thinking. She gulped then, wondering if she would get hit for using the heiress's name so casually. But Juliet's focus was on the lighter in her hand. She was playing with it flippantly, turning the spark wheel, and then quenching the flame as soon as it burst to life. Elisa, yes? That came as a surprise. Everyone in Shanghai knew of Roma. They knew of his cold blood and his reputation as the careful, calculating heir of the white flowers. But Elisa, who had little to do with anything, was a ghost. How did you know? Juliet finally looked up and raised an eyebrow, as if replying, Why would I not? You and Roma practically share a face, she said. I hazarded a guess. Elisa didn't know what to say to that, nor did she know what to say next in general. She was saved by a young white flower opening the door to the warehouse and sticking his head out, spotting Elisa first and then glaring at Juliet. The animosity wasn't unexpected, even if they were supposed to be playing nice today. Merely organizing this meeting had put five of their men in the hospital after one of the messages being run into Scarlet territory had been delivered a little violently. You better come in, Miss Montagova, the boy said. Your brother is asking after you. Elisa nodded, but her curious gaze kept going back to Juliet. Aren't you coming in? Juliet smiled. There was some hidden amusement in that, the sort with a cause everyone would wonder about but no one would ever know. In a moment. You go ahead. Elisa hurried inside. The climate within the warehouse could be best described as frosty. Lord Kai and Lord Montagov were simply staring at each other from opposite sides of the room, both seated behind their respective tables on their halves of the warehouse. There weren't many people here, and though the warehouse was small, the attendee numbers were meager enough for the space to feel roomy. Elisa counted less than twenty on each side, which was good. Gangsters had dispersed themselves into small clumps, pretending to be in conversation, but really, each side was watching the other closely, waiting for the slightest indication of an ambush. At the very least, it was unlikely any of these gangsters would act without instruction from Lord Kai or Lord Montagov. This meeting had forbidden upper-tier members of both the Scarlet Gang and the White Flowers from attending unless they were in the inner circle. Those with power were harder to control. Meanwhile, the errand runners and messengers in attendance did what they were told, and conveniently acted as human shields in case things got messy. She spotted Roma in the corner, standing stoic and far from Benedict and Marshall. When he caught sight of Elisa, he waved her over vigorously. About time. Roma handed her the jacket he had been carrying in his hands. He brought it along because he knew Elisa always forgot her jackets and inevitably ended up shivering in the cold. Sorry, she said, shrugging on the jacket. Has anything interesting happened yet? Elisa ran her eyes along the table on their side. Their father was seated icily. Beside him, Dimitri lounged back, one of his feet propped up against his other knee. Roma shook his head. Why are you so late? Elisa swallowed hard. I ran into someone interesting outside. As if the mere mention of her was a summoning, Juliet came through the door then. Heads turned in her direction, but she simply looked ahead, her eyes speaking of no emotion. Roma's mouth formed into a hard line. I shouldn't have to tell you this, he said quietly, but stay well away from her. Juliet Kai is dangerous. Elisa rolled her eyes. Surely you don't believe those stories about her killing her American lovers with her bare hands. Roma cut her off with a sharp look. His skull didn't last long, however, because his attention was wandering off, and whatever he had registered caused him to tense all over. Elisa followed his gaze, confused. Juliet's expression was no longer one of cynical amusement. She nodded once at Roma noting Roma's equally serious expression. Elisa decided that she was definitely missing something here. Elisa. She snapped her eyes back, facing her brother, who had already looked away. Roma frowned, then reached over and eased her hands away from her head. She hadn't even noticed that she was scratching intensely, pulling white blonde strands of hair out from their roots 
so that they were twisted around her fingertips like ropes of jewelry. Sorry, Elisa said, nodding her hands together behind her back. A hot prickling was spreading down her skin. It was possible that she was overheating with her jacket on, but a line of goosebumps along her collarbone said otherwise. I'm so warm. What, do you want me to fan you? Roma muttered. He pulled out a chair for Elisa, then took his own. Sit still. Let's hope this doesn't go to shit. Elisa nodded and sat back, trying not to scratch. When Juliet walked into the room, it was the weight of her gun pressed against her thigh that focused her against the weight of the stairs. She nodded at her parents to acknowledge that she had arrived, then moved her gaze across the rest of the room. In the first few seconds, she took in every face, matched them to a name, then ranked them in order of dangerousness. There was Dmitri Voronin, who she had heard was aggressive and impossible to control, but today Lord Montagov valued diplomacy, or so he claimed, and so Dmitri would remain quiet. There was Marshal Seo, twirling what looked like a blade of grass between his fingers as if it were a real blade. Beside him, Benedict Montagov sat with a neutral expression, looking like a pensive stone statue. And there was, of course, Roma. Juliet joined Rosalind and Kathleen at their seats, pulling a chair out and dropping in. With great reluctance, she concluded that none of the white flowers seemed more volatile than Tyler, who was practically trembling in his seat in effort to keep silent. This is for you, Kathleen said, noting Juliet's arrival. She slid over a square piece of paper. Juliet lifted a corner and read the brief scribblings of numbers and street names. Kathleen had done it. She had met with her contact again and retrieved Jean Goutai's personal address. Did you find anything at the Bund? Juliet asked, tucking the address away. The bankers were clueless, Kathleen replied. Only one old woman had any information, and she thought she saw a monster in the river. Juliet chewed over the thought. She said, interesting. Rosalind cleared her throat, leaning in. What are we whispering about? Oh. Juliet waved a hand. Nothing important. Rosalind narrowed her eyes. It looked as if she was going to say more, accuse Juliet of being dismissive. It would not have been undeserved, Juliet truly was trying to shut down unnecessary expansion on the subject, to keep quiet while they were in a warehouse full of white flowers. But Rosalind took the hint. She changed the topic. Take a look at Tyler. He's two seconds away from throwing a tantrum. Juliet turned around, her face pinched with distaste. His trembling had only intensified. Maybe we should ask him to leave. No Kathleen shook her head, then rose from her seat. I'll talk to him. Asking him to leave would be making more trouble. Before Juliet or Rosalind could protest, Kathleen was already off, pushing her chair back and walking toward Tyler, dropping into the seat beside him. Juliet and Rosalind couldn't hear what Kathleen was saying, but they could see that Tyler wasn't listening, even when Kathleen reached for his elbow and gave him a sharp shake. She's too kind-hearted for her own good, Rosalind remarked. Let her be, Juliet replied. Too many kind hearts turn cold every day. A hush started to sweep through the warehouse. The meeting was starting. From the corner of her eye, Juliet caught sight of Roma's gaze once again. She wished Roma would stop looking at her. This whole thing felt strange for both obvious reasons and reasons she couldn't precisely decipher. In bringing the Scarlet Gang and White Flowers together, it felt like cooperation, but it also felt like defeat but they had no choice. Well, I hope everyone's having a nice evening. Silence followed Lord Montagov's words immediately. He spoke in the Beijing dialect, the most common Chinese tongue that the merchants and foreign businessmen learned first, but it was accented. The older generation was not as fluent as their children. I will proceed right to the point, he said. There is madness in this city, and it is killing scarlets and white flowers alike. Lord Montagov seemed pleasant enough. If Juliet didn't know better, she would think him patient and unbothered. I'm sure that all will agree with me, then, he continued, that this must stop. Man-made disease or natural occurrence, 
We need answers. We need to figure out why it is affecting our people so heavily, and then we need to put a stop to it. Only silence followed. Really, a sardonic voice said. It was not directed at Lord Montagov, but at the silent Scarlet Gang. Marshal Co stood up. While the whole city dies, you still refuse to speak. It is simply in my belief, Lord Kai said coldly, that when one announces a plan to put a stop to the madness, they should offer some of their own ideas first. Was it not your daughter who suggested this meeting? This came from Dmitri Voronin, who shrugged in a blasé, God could care sort of way. Our daughter, Lady Kai cut in, her tone thunderous, sought to begin a dialogue. It was not a promise nor the guarantee of an exchange. Typical, Dmitri scoffed. That remark didn't sit well with the Scarlet Gang. The errand runners who surrounded Lord Kai twitched in their seats, their hands inching closer and closer to the guns hidden at their hips. Lord Kai made an impatient gesture, telling everyone to calm down. This is the situation at present, Lord Kai said. He placed his hands upon the table, palms flat on the cold surface. Under the current circumstances, we have leads and sources to work with should we wish to investigate this madness. Lord Montagov opened his mouth, but Juliet's father was not done. That means, Lord Kai pressed on, we do not need your help. Understand? We are here in hopes of furthering our knowledge and quickening our investigation. That is the position of the Scarlet Gang. Now, do the White Flowers wish to share their knowledge, their ideas, and indeed begin a cooperation, or did they attend this meeting simply to leech, as they have been doing for decades? While the back and forth occurred, eyes were shifting left and right, gazes met in all directions. Everybody was having an unspoken conversation, one person asking the ubiquitous question, and another giving the most minuscule shake of the head. It occurred to Juliet then that perhaps the white flowers offered no further avenues of investigation, because they had none to give. But to the white flowers, admitting that they were clueless was just as bad as offering up all their trade secrets. It gave away power. They would rather have the Scarlet Gang think them hostile. And some members of the Scarlet Gang bought it. As Marshal Co scoffed at the insult, muttering some inaudible retort beneath his breath, Tyler leaped to his feet, unable to hold himself back any longer. In two, three strides, he had crossed the divide. Then Benedict raised his gun, and Tyler froze in place. The room collectively stopped breathing uncertain what to do next, if now was a good time to react violently, if the simple act of raising a gun prompted retaliation. Juliet touched her own weapon, but she was more bothered with analyzing this turn of events, trying to connect them logically. Marshall with the calloused hands was the one who had been threatened, but Benedict with the paint-smudged fingers was the one reacting instead. Juliet's hands moved away from the holster at her thigh. She understood. Benedict had raised his gun to prevent Marshall from doing so first. Marshall would shoot, but Benedict wouldn't. We thought this meeting was supposed to be peaceful, Benedict said quietly, an attempt to unop the tension before him. He didn't know who he was dealing with. Tyler wasn't one for reason, he lashed out and thought through how to weasel himself out of the consequences later. Oh, that's rich, Tyler sneered. Whip out your gun and then claim you're talking of peace. Peace. In a flash, Tyler's own double action revolver was in his hand and pointed at Benedict. Juliet was on her feet in an instant, moving so fast that her chair fell over, only Tyler was faster, and he was already pressing down on the trigger. I hate that word like I hate all you Montagovs. He pulled the trigger. The sound of the shot echoed into the warehouse provoked gasps from every direction. But Benedict only blinked, unharmed. Juliet halted in her steps, breathing hard, her eyes wide as she turned around and searched for Kathleen. Kathleen winked at Juliet upon making eye contact. She opened her palm to show her the six little bullets that rested there. There had been no damage, but the damage was done. Chairs were scraping back and gangsters were jumping to their feet. Pistols were pointed and safeties were pulled, barrels were aimed, steady, even as the shouting began. If this is the way it is going to be, Lord Montagov announced above the noise and the accusations, 
and the heated swearing, then the Scarlet Gang and the White Flowers shall never cooperate. He didn't finish his declaration. A choking noise was coming from the corner of the warehouse, a quiet gasping, over and over again. In confusion, the gangsters searched for the source, wary for any sense of a trick. They didn't expect the noise to be coming from Elisa Montagova, who wheezed one last time before dropping to her knees, her fingers launching at her own throat. 17. Roma lunged for his sister, tearing her hands away from her throat in the flash of a second. Before she could shake him off with the frenzy of the madness, he already had her pinned to the ground, her hands twisted behind her back and her head pressed to the hard, concrete ground. Elisa, it's me. It's me, Roma gasped. Elisa tried to jerk forward. Roma hissed, craning his head back. Stop that. He should have known better than to waste breath trying to talk her out of it. The madness was far from the whims of an unruly child. This was no longer only his sister, something had consumed her from the inside out. Help. Roma called over his shoulder. Get help. The white flowers around him, each and every single one of them, hesitated. On the far side of the warehouse, the Scarlet Gang were ushering themselves out, leaving as fast as they could. This was not their problem to deal with, after all. When Juliet gave the appearance of lingering, her mother immediately pulled her away by the elbow and snapped something brief, as if speed was of the essence when outrunning a contagion. At least they had a right to flee. What were the white flowers doing flinching back? Don't just stand there. Benedict finally snapped out of his daze and rushed over, rolling his sleeves up. He knelt and pinned one of Elisa's kicking legs to the floor. Face paling, Marshall was forced to join them too by mere principle, pinning down the other leg and snapping his fingers to prompt the messengers nearby. Roma, Benedict said. We have to take her to Lawrence. Absolutely not. With his fervent exclamation, Roma almost lost his grip on Elisa's violent writhing. He quickly pinned her wrists down again. We're not bringing Elisa in to be Lawrence's experiment. How do you know that it won't do good? Benedict argued. His words were short and abrupt, a result of his exertion. Those things are probably eating away at her brain as we speak. If we haven't tried removing them, how do we know we cannot? Ben, Marshall chided. For once on an occasion such as this, his strained voice was the quietest of the three. We tried removing a dead thing from a dead man, and we pulled out ten tons of brain matter. How can we risk it? What choice is there? Benedict demanded. Marshall let go of Elisa's leg, throwing the task between Roma and Benedict to manage, then hurried to crouch near her head. There is always a choice. Marshall put his hands around Elisa's throat and squeezed. It took every working cell of Roma's rational mind not to attack his friend, not to push him away as Marshall counted beneath his breath. He knew exactly what Marshall was doing, knew that it was the necessary thing to do, but he burned with the need to protect. Elisa stopped struggling. Marshall let go quickly, removing his hands like he had been scalded, then reaching back over again to check for her pulse. He nodded. She's okay. Only unconscious. Heart thudding, Roma looped an arm around Elisa's neck, picking his little sister up like she weighed nothing, a paper doll of a girl. When Roma turned around, he saw that the warehouse was close to empty. Where the hell was his father? Let's go, Roma snapped, pushing the thought away for a later time. We have to find the nearest hospital before she wakes up. Let me through. Roma slammed his fists on the door, shaking the frame so hard that the floor beneath his feet shuddered in fear. It didn't matter, the hinges stood strong, and on the other side, through the thin pane of glass, the doctor shook his head, telling Roma to turn around and go back to the waiting room, where the rest of the white flowers had been told to remain. Let us take it from here, the doctor had said when they brought Elisa in. This hospital was smaller than some of the mansions on Bubbling Well Road barely the size of a house that a British merchant might buy for his mistress. It was pitiful, but their best option. There was no telling how long Elisa could hold out, so they couldn't risk venturing out of Nansher, 
and into the city central. Even if this hospital was built to treat the frequent accidents of the nearby cotton mill workers. Even if Roma was convinced the weary-eyed doctors here did not look any more competent than the average street vendor. Keep her under, Roma had demanded as he handed Elisa over. She needs oxygen, a feeding tube. We must wake her up to know what is wrong, the doctor insisted. We know what we are doing. This is not a common sickness, Roma thundered. This is madness. The doctor had waved for his nurses, waved for them to push Roma out. Don't you dare, Roma warned. He was forced back a step, then two. No stop. Don't you dare lock me out. They had locked him out. Now Roma slammed his fist on the door one last time, then pivoted on his feet, swearing viciously under his breath. He tugged on his hair, then tugged on his sleeves, pulling at everything in his immediate vicinity just to keep his hands moving, just to keep the sweats at bay and his anger concentrated in a tightly regulated radius. That was the problem with places like this, establishments far removed from the city central, and run by people making pitiful wages. They did not fear the gangsters as much as they should. Roma. Roma squeezed his eyes shut. He let out a long, excruciating breath, then turned to face his father. What is the meaning of this? Lord Montagov demanded. He had arrived with five men behind him, and now they all piled into this thin section of the hospital until the room felt airtight, until the off-white walls were almost slick with sweat. How did this happen? Roma turned his gaze to the ceiling, counting backward from ten. He noted all the various cracks in the chipping paint, the way that decay seemed to lurk in every corner. This hospital seemed so industrial from the outside, so different from the scarlet-funded facility in the French concession that Juliet had taken him to, but they were each falling apart in their own way. What are you doing merely standing there? Lord Montagov went on. He reached out to scuff Roma over the head. That was the final thing to send Roma veering off the rails. What took you so damn long to get here? Lord Montagov narrowed his eyes. Watch yourself. Elisa was dying, and you merely stood by to watch how the Scarlet Gang would react. What's wrong with you? One of Lord Montagov's men shoved Roma back the moment Roma leaned in too close. Perhaps it was something in his eyes, or something about the way Fury set his words on fire. Whatever it was, it must have been threatening, because with a nod from Lord Montagov, the white flower pulled a knife on Roma in threat for him to step back. Roma remained where he was. Go ahead, he said. You are making a fool of yourself, his father hissed. Lord Montagov thrived off the love of other people. He preened when surrounded and raged when stared at. Roma's dramatics were embarrassing him, and that gave Roma a perverse sort of pleasure. If I am a fool, then be rid of me. Roma splayed his arms. Have Dimitri investigate this madness instead. Or better yet, why don't you yourself take it on? Lord Montagov made no move to answer him. If they were alone, his father would be yelling, hand slapping whatever flat surface was closest to make a loud noise, any loud noise, for as long as it could make Roma flinch, his father would be satisfied. It wasn't obedience that Lord Montagov sought. It was the reassurance of his power. At this moment Roma was reckless enough to take that away. I suppose you are too busy. I suppose Dimitri has more important tasks to uphold, more important people to sweet-talk. Or perhaps, Roma's voice grew quiet, speaking like he was reciting a poem, it is because neither you nor Dimitri is brave enough to get close to the madness. You fear for yourself more than you fear for our people. You. A terrifying scream rang from within the locked doors, and Roma pivoted immediately, uncaring if his sudden movements earned him a knife in his back. He was already reaching into his coat pocket and drawing his gun, shooting once, twice, three times until the glass panel of the door crumbled entirely, opening a space for him to insert his arm through and turn the lock on the other side. Elisa, he bellowed slamming open the doors. Elisa. He skidded into the emergency room, a hand slamming up to cover his eyes from the harsh lights fixed to the droopy ceilings. Nobody objected to his presence. They were far too busy grabbing a hold of Elisa's writhing body, 
keeping her still for just long enough to press a syringe into her neck. She fell slack in seconds, the bloodstained strands of her lanky blonde hair falling over her eyes. What did you do to her? Roma demanded, rushing forward. He brushed her hair back, swallowing the lump in his throat. Her eyelids, so pale and translucent under this lighting that her blue-purple veins stood out starkly, fluttered briefly, then remained closed. The doctor, the same one who had locked him out, and assured him of his sister's safety cleared his throat. Roma looked to him, barely holding back his anger. We have injected her to keep her comatose. The doctor thinned his lips, then scrubbed his forehead vigorously, as if he was thinking through a fog in his mind. I we he cleared his throat, then tried again. We do not know what is wrong with her. She must remain asleep until there is a cure. 18. Roma descended the stairs. Though his physical body had carried him here, had moved him through the motions of waving his thanks at the bartender, through lifting the curtain at the back of the bar, his head remained miles away, still hovering outside the hospital room, and watching Elisa in her induced coma, her arms and legs strapped down to the bed for her own safety. I am undefeated. At the roar that traveled up the spiraling staircase, Roma's mind returned to him, and his anger slammed back into full force. Blood boiling, he jumped the last five steps, landing upon the floorboards with a heavy, wooden thump. Roma ventured deeper into this shallow underground, navigating the room underneath the bar. The construction of this place had sucked up almost all of his father's funds a few years back, the floors were uneven from overuse, and the lights on the low ceiling flickered on and off at random. It smelled of sweat and piss and there were so many voices shouting over one another that this could have been a gathering for delinquents, but there was no doubting the exorbitant design of this place. One look was enough, at the fighting pit in the center of the room, at the flashes of silver built into the ropes that secured the ring, to know that this underground arena was one of Lord Montagov's most prized investments. It was no wonder, given the betting charges down here had earned him back his losses within weeks. Don't you two have better things to do than hang out amid all this? Roma dropped into a seat at a spectator's table, inspecting the ceramic cups in front of Benedict and Marshall. That's what I've been saying, Benedict replied. This is the last time. I promise, Marshall said. Afterward, no, get him by the legs. Marshall's attention had been drawn away momentarily by the fight. The crowd around the barrier cheered as the loser went down, and the victor pumped his fists into the air. Terrible form, Marshall muttered, turning his gaze back. Disgruntled, Roma lifted the cup in front of Benedict and took a cautionary sniff. His cousin snatched it from his hands. Don't drink that, Benedict warned. Vodka? Roma asked in response, at last identifying the smell that had been wafting under his nose. In a teacup? Really? Not my idea. Marshall leaned in with a sly grin. Yes, don't blame your sweet cousin. It was mine. Their table suddenly shuddered with the impact of another man going down in the ring, the crowd roaring with cheers. A woman was marking the scores with a piece of chalk. In flocks before every fight, spectators ran to her with cash, calling out bets on who would win. Roma wasn't entirely surprised to see Dmitri Voronin stepping into the ring next. He seemed like the type to spend all his free time down here, mingling with the filth that coated the floors and feeling right at home. Roma, meanwhile, made it his goal to avoid this place. He would come down only if the matter couldn't wait, as was the case now. I just spoke with my father at home, Roma said. He angled his head so he didn't have to watch Dmitri pump his fists and bare his teeth to the crowd. He has stopped caring about the madness. He thinks it is something that can be waited out. He thinks that Elisa will simply wake up and snap out of it when she has grown tired of trying to tear out her throat. That was a half-truth. Lord Montagov no longer wished to investigate the madness, but it was not apathy. It was because Roma had hit a nerve and struck him right where it hurt most. This inaction was punishment. For calling his own father a coward, Lord Montagov would show him just how cowardly he could be and let Elisa wilt away. He is an idiot. Marshall paused. No offense. 
none taken, Roma muttered. It was as if his father did not realize that they could not run a gang without gangsters. Lord Montagoff had too much confidence in himself, most of it undeserved. If the worst-case scenario arrived, he probably thought he could face off with death and demand their assets back. I have to do something. Roma held his head in his hands. But short of siphoning all of our funds to the lab so Lawrence has more resources to work on a cure. Hold on, Marshall said. Why wait for Lawrence to make a cure from square one when there is word on the street about someone already having made a vaccine? We can steal the vaccine, run our research. There is no way to know if the vaccine is real, Benedict cut in. If you are speaking about the Larkspur, he sounds like an utter charlatan. Roma nodded in agreement. He had heard the rumors too, but it was nonsense, merely a way to profit off the panic sweeping through the city. If trained doctors could barely understand the mechanisms of this madness, how could one foreign man have dreamed up the cure? We must still find that live victim Lorenz requires, Roma decided. But. The sound of bones being crushed rang out from the ring, and the woman shouted for another contestant to take on the godly Dmitri Voronin. Roma cringed, wishing he could block out all the noise. From the table beside them, a man rose and ran up excitedly. But, Roma tried to continue over the uproar, watching the man go with a grimace, we cannot sit idle, and wait for a cure that Lawrence may or may not find. And truly, I am at a loss as to what else. A roar came from the crowds then, this one not of murderous joy but of outrage and disappointment. Roma whipped around, cursing when he saw why the fight had been interrupted. Dimitri had pulled a gun on his next competitor. Benedict and Marshall rose, but Roma quickly held out a hand, telling them to sit down. Dimitri's competitor, on closer appraisal, was not Russian. Roma had missed it before in his cursory glance when the man was running up, but the sweep of pomade in his hair gave him away as American. Let's calm down now, old boy. The American laughed nervously. His accent confirmed Roma's assessment. I thought this was a fight, not a showdown in the Wild West. Dimitri pulled a face, failing to comprehend what the American was saying. Scarlet merchants who sneak in here face the consequences. His competitor's eyes widened. I, I'm not with the Scarlet Gang. You trade with the Scarlet Gang. I have seen your face on their side of the streets. But I am not affiliated, the man protested. In this city, you are one or the other. Roma got out of his chair. He cast his two friends a sharp look, warning them not to follow, then turned, his face locked in its harsh expression. The American continued stammering away in the ring. Dimitri strode closer with his gun. By the time Roma had pushed his way through the crowd and climbed over the ropes, Dimitri was directly in front of the American, his nostrils flared wide in his anger. What is he so worked up about? Roma genuinely wondered. Slights like these could be easily ignored. It wasn't as if this man was a true scarlet. If he was stupid enough to come into a white flower fight club, his ship had probably landed in Shanghai only days ago. Roma jumped into the ring, his step smooth until he was sliding right between the American and Dimitri's barrel. That's enough. Move, Roma, Dimitri thundered. He pushed his gun forward in threat, until the cool metal pressed an indent into Roma's forehead. Run off, this does not concern you. Or what? Roma replied coolly. You'll shoot me? Up here, under these lights, surrounded by a crowd of white flowers, Roma was safer than he could ever be. There was a gun to his head, but he was unafraid. Dimitri had one choice here, and with an ear perked to the dissatisfied screaming coming from the spectators, he seemed to be realizing that Roma had him trapped. To Dimitri, perhaps Roma was the annoying kid in the household that Lord Montagov did not trust. To the people around them, Roma was heir of the white flowers, a killer of scarlets and neck deep in every drop of blood he had spilled in the name of vengeance. Like it or not, Roma was still a Montagov, and Montagovs had power. If Roma said this American wasn't a scarlet, he wasn't a scarlet. Roma waved for the American to leave. But as soon as the American stepped out of the ring, hurrying for the exit, 
Dimitri aimed and shot him anyway. No. Roma roared. The crowd became a mixed cacophony of cheering and horrified booing, split between those who had secretly been waiting for Dimitri to draw the blood they craved, and those who were eyeing the situation warily now, wondering what role Roma played here if he could not get Dimitri to listen to him. Roma had been simmering all day. He could not get the doctors to heed his demands. He could not convince his own father to see reason. He was the heir of the white flowers, heir to an underground empire made of killers and gangsters and toughened merchants who had fled a country ravaged by war. If he could not hold on to their respect, could not rule over them and feed on their fear, then what the hell did he have? Dimitri made one move against him, and suddenly Roma was surrounded by the jeering of the people he was supposed to command, looked at as if he were a child and not their heir. If it had been Dimitri at the hospital, perhaps the doctors would have listened. If Dimitri had told Lord Montagov that the madness was threatening the city more furiously than they had ever anticipated, Lord Montagov would have listened. Roma's control was slipping through his fingers like fine grains of sand. When he closed his fist, there were almost no grains left for him to hold on to. His hands were almost empty. If he lost the respect of these white flowers around him, he lost his status. If he was no longer Roma Montagov, heir of the white flowers, then he could not protect those he actually cared to keep safe. He had already failed Elisa. He didn't want to keep failing. We will not tolerate the Scarlet Gang. Dimitri was pumping his fists up and down, his handgun raising and lowering callously, riling up the spectators. We will kill them all. A long time ago, Roma had told Juliet that her anger was like a cold diamond. It was something she could swallow smoothly, something to be placed upon other people, gliding along their skin in glitter and glamour before they realized far too late that the diamond had sliced them into pieces. He had admired her for it. Mostly because his own anger was the precise opposite, an uncontrollable wave of fire that knew no subtlety. And it had arrived. In two quick motions, Roma lunged for Dimitri and disarmed him, throwing the gun into the crowd. You didn't give the American a fair fight, Roma said. He gestured for Dimitri to approach. So I'll let you make it up. The crowd screamed their approval. Dimitri stood still for a second, trying to decipher Roma's motivation. Then, with a glance outward into the cheering, he cricked his neck and charged. Roma refused to let this descend into the monstrous, bestial grappling that these places were known for. As soon as he slammed his arm up for his first block, he remained quick, light on his feet, each one of his punches thrown with intent. The ring was rocking with the intensity of the spectators, the entire club raging so loudly that its sounds were ringing with a faint echo. To the observers, everything was a rapid blur. To Roma, it was all instinct. He had spent years pretend sparring with Benedict, and it was finally counting for something. Roma switched from offense to defense within heartbeats, his right arm came up to block a punch and his left arm tore forward at the same time, landing a hit so solidly upon Dimitri's jaw that the other boy stumbled back, a mania playing in his eyes. It did not matter how furious Dimitri was. Roma was not tiring. It almost felt supernatural, this exhilaration rushing through the lines of his limbs, this pulsating, absolute need to win against the favorite, to have the people remember who was the actual Montagov, and who was the fraud, who was the one deserving of dignity as the heir. Then Dimitri got a hit on Roma's cheek, and something stung, far more than he expected. Roma hissed, stumbling back three steps to gather his bearings. Dimitri swung his arms, rolling out his shoulders, and under the lights, a flash of something glinted between his index and middle fingers. He has a blade between his fingers, Roma realized dimly. Then, as if it was new information, cheater. Ready to give up? Dimitri bellowed. He thumped his chest. Roma could not look away from the glinting flashes of the blade. He couldn't stop the fight now without losing face. But if he continued, all it would take was one swipe of Dimitri's fist across Roma's neck to kill him. The panic set in. Roma started to get sloppy. Dimitri kicked out and Roma took the hit. A fist flashed in his periphery, and in his haste to get away, 
Roma dodged too hard, overjudging his balance and stumbling. Dimitri struck again. A flash of the blade, a slit opened on Roma's jaw. The crowd jeered. They could sense Roma's energy depleting. They could sense that he seemed to have given up before the fight had even finished. Are you a Montega, or are you a coward? Roma tore his gaze back up, stealing his throbbing jaw. What was he fighting so damn fair for? What kind of deluded world was he living in where the white flowers wanted someone who ruled by honor, instead of sweat and blood and violence? Roma reached out and grabbed a fistful of Dimitri's shoulder-length black hair. Dimitri hadn't been expecting it. Nor had he expected Roma to slam a knee right into his nose, to take his arm and twist backward until Roma had a grip on his neck and a foot stomping down on the back of his knees. Dimitri fell flat to the ground of the ring. The crowd rushed for the ropes, shaking and shaking and shaking the ring. Roma had him now. With his hands positioned where they were, he could snap Dimitri's neck if he wanted. He could do anything and play it off as a mere accident, a slip of the moment. Roma Montagov, our victor, the woman with the chalkboard announced. Roma leaned down to Dimitri, close enough so Dimitri could not mishear his words over the roar of the crowd. Don't you forget who I am. With that, he stood, wiping his forearm across his bleeding mouth roughly. He ducked under the ropes and landed solidly amid the crowd. This place was a boiling pot of volatile activity and emotions. Roma couldn't get away fast enough. You, he snapped. A man with a white handkerchief in his pocket jerked to attention. Get someone to take the American's corpse out of here. The man ran off to fulfill his task. Roma found his way back to his friends, dropping into his seat with the weight of a thousand years. What a hero, Marshall crooned. Shut up, Roma said. He breathed in deeply. Again. Then again. In his head he saw the American crumple to the ground. Elisa's unmoving body. The complete lack of emotion on his father's face. Are you quite all right? Benedict asked in concern. Yes, I'm fine. Roma looked up with a glare. Can we go back to what we were discussing before? With Elisa in the state she is in, flashes of her face were burned into his mind, vivid and stark and already wasting away, I need answers. If this madness sprouted from somebody's bad intention, I must hunt them down. Didn't your father send you after the communists? Roma nodded. But it's a dead end. We have only struck dead ends wherever we go. We could plead with the Scarlet Gang for their information, Marshall suggested. This time with more guns. Benedict pressed a hand over the marshal's mouth, shutting him up before he could expand further on a nonsensical plan. Roma, I truly cannot fathom what else there is to do, Benedict admitted. I think the meeting made it clear that the white flowers know nothing. We are at a loss unless we wish to spread our resources thin and put an ear in every corner of Shanghai. How many spies do we still have in the Scarlet Gang? Roma asked. Perhaps they can figure out what it is. The Scarlet Gang practically admitted to having information, but they won't tell us. I doubt asking the spies would be effective, Benedict interrupted. His hand was still over Marshall's mouth. Marshall appeared to have started licking Benedict's palm in an effort to be released. Benedict acted as if he hadn't noticed. If the Scarlet Gang really do know something, it would be discussed within the inner circle. Letting rumors slip to the regular gangsters is a surefire route toward causing panic. Marshall finally writhed free of Benedict's hand. By God, you're both dull in the head, he said. Who in the Scarlet Gang keeps appearing everywhere you go, who appears to also have a personal stake in finding the necessary answers? He leveled his gaze with Roma's. You've got to ask Juliet for help. Suddenly, Roma held up his finger asking Benedict and Marshall to be patient as he thought it over. When he finally seemed to have ruminated on it for some time, he said, Pass me that bucket over there. Benedict blinked. What? Bucket. Marshall stood and retrieved the bucket. As soon as he brought it under Roma's nose, the brutal air of the white flowers stuck his head within it and wretched as a result of all the violence at his hand. A minute later Roma resurfaced, 
the contents of his stomach emptied. Okay, he said bitterly. I'll ask Juliet alone for her help. 19. I'm worried. Can you blame me? Lady Kai pulled the brush through Juliet's hair, frowning each time she hit a tangle. Juliet was certainly old enough to manage this herself, but her mother insisted. When Juliet was a little girl with hair that grew down to her waist, her mother used to come into her room every night and brush it until all the knots were gone, or until Lady Kai was at least satisfied by the state of her daughter's head, which occasionally included the thoughts within it too. Now that Juliet was back for good, her mother had reinstated the practice. Juliet's parents were busy people. This was her mother's way of still having some role in her life. No matter what it is in this city, there are too many people invested, Lady Kai continued. Too many people with personal stakes. Too many people with too much to lose. Her frown deepened as she spoke, both in accordance with the words coming out from her mouth and in frustration with her task. Juliet's hair was bobbed now, there was not much left to brush, but it was still a struggle to work through all the remnants of product that Juliet heaped on every day to maintain her curls. Mama, you will have more to worry about if, Juliet winced as the brush went through a clump of gel that hadn't washed out, the madness spreads to every corner of this city. Our dwindling numbers are more a cause for concern than the toes I step on while sticking my nose into communist business. Dwindling numbers in the Scarlet Gang. Dwindling numbers in the white flowers. Their blood feud was nothing compared to both gangs dying out, yet Juliet seemed to be the only person who believed this madness potent enough to sweep the rug out from under everyone. Her parents were too proud. They had grown too used to situations they could control, adversaries they could defeat. They did not see this situation as Juliet did. They did not see Elisa Montagova trying to tear out her own throat every time they closed their eyes, as Juliet did now. The girl was so young. How had she gotten caught up in this? Well. Lady Kai sniffed. It is inevitable that you shall step on some toes. It is simply that I would prefer to send men with you while you're doing so. Juliet bristled. At the very least, her parents were taking the madness seriously now. They still did not think it required their personal interference, or rather they did not see how they could possibly be of any help when it came to a disease that had people tearing at their own throats, but they cared enough to officially put Juliet to the task, excusing her from her other duties. No more chasing rent. Juliet was on a one-woman mission for the truth. Please do not assign me an entourage, Juliet said, shuddering. I could outfight them in my sleep. Lady Kai glared at her through the mirror. What? Juliet exclaimed. It is not about the fight, her mother replied firmly. It is about image. It is your people having your back. Oh God. Juliet could immediately sense the incoming lecture. It was an innate ability of hers, like how some people sensed incoming storms by the ache in their bones. Don't forget. Your father has been overthrown once or twice during his time. Juliet closed her eyes, sighing internally before forcing them open again. For years had passed and her mother still delighted in recounting this story, as if it taught the greatest life lesson known to mankind. When that despicable Montagov avenged his father's death by killing your grandfather, her mother said, your father should have been the one to lead next. Lady Kai pulled the brush through another knot. Juliet winced but he was even younger than you are now, so the businessmen removed him and decided one of their own would have the final say. They dismissed him as nothing but a boy and said that if he wanted to lead with no reason save his bloodline, then he should join the monarchy instead of a gang. But then in 1892, Juliet interrupted, taking over the story with theatrics, with the people on the streets of Shanghai directionless and running amok, with both the Scarlet Gang, and the white flowers taken over by irrelevant associates while the rightful young heirs were shoved to the background, they at last revolted. Juliet snapped her mouth shut upon seeing the deathly glower her mother was giving her through the mirror. She grumbled an apology, folding her arms. She admired her father's ability to climb back to the top, just as she could detachedly acknowledge that Lord Montagov, who had also been uprooted when his father died, was intelligent enough to do the same. 
except in this period of time, while both gangs were led by men who cared not for bonds and allegiance, only efficiency and money, the blood feud had been at its quietest. Your father, Lady Kai said sharply, tugging on a strand of hair, reclaimed his rightful title when he was older because he had people who believed in him. He appealed to the common majority, those who you see protecting him now, those who you see willing to give up their lives for him. It is all a matter of pride, Juliet. Lady Kai ducked her head, pressing her face against her daughters until they were both staring ahead into the mirror. He wanted the Scarlet Gang to be a force of nature. He wanted membership to be a badge that declared power. The commoners in the gang could think of nothing else more desirable, and behind him, they toppled the businessmen, who had no choice but to accept their subservience. Juliet raised an eyebrow. In summary, she said, it is a game of numbers. You could say that. Her mother clicked her tongue. So don't start believing that skill is all it takes to stay at the top. Loyalty plays its dirty hand too, and it is a fickle, ever-changing thing. With that Lady Kai set down her brush, squeezed Juliet's shoulder, and said good night. Brisk, quick, and abrupt, that was her mother. She strode out of Juliet's bedroom, and shut the door behind her, leaving Juliet to mull on those parting words. The rest of the world didn't see it, but while Lord Kai was the face of the Scarlet Gang, Lady Kai did just as much work behind the scenes, running her eyes through every piece of paper that passed into the house. It was Lady Kai who had convinced her husband that a daughter would be far more capable of leading the Scarlet Gang next, rather than a male relative. So Juliet had been given the crown, and Lord Kai expected the gang to bend at the knee when Juliet became the head one day, out of expectation, out of blood loyalty. Juliet leaned toward the mirror, touching her fingers to the lines of her face. Was it loyalty that created power? Or was loyalty only a symptom, offered when the circumstances were favorable, and taken away when the tides turned? It helped that Lord Kai and Lord Montagov were men. Juliet wasn't naive. Their every messenger, every errand runner, every lower-tiered but fiercely loyal gangster was male. Most of the Scarlet Gang feared and revered Juliet now, but she was not in control yet. How would they react when Juliet tried to exert true power over them? Would she have to shed all that she was, ditch the glittery dresses, and wear suits to be listened to? Juliet finally pushed away from her vanity table, rubbing at her eyes tiredly. The day had worn on for far too long, yet her body felt restless instead of weary. When she collapsed onto the blankets atop her bed, her nightgown was sticky against her skin. She could hear her heartbeat thudding, and with the longer she lay there in the dark, the thudding only became more intense, until the sound was playing through her eardrums. Wait. Juliet bolted upright. Someone was knocking rhythmically on the glass doors of her second-floor balcony. No, Juliet said aloud dully. The knocking came again, slow, purposeful. No, she repeated. More knocking. Ah. Juliet clambered to her feet and stormed toward the sound, opening the curtains with more force than necessary. As the fabric settled, she found a familiar figure seated casually on the railing of her balcony, his legs swinging and his body backlit by the glow of the crescent moon. She swallowed hard. Really? Juliet demanded through the glass door. You climbed my house. You couldn't have simply thrown a few pebbles. Roma looked down into the gardens below. You don't have any pebbles. Juliet rubbed her eyes again, forcefully this time. Maybe if she rubbed hard enough, she would realize this was all a fever dream, and she'd wake up peacefully alone in her room. She removed her hand from her eyes. Roma was still there. They really needed to upgrade their security. Roma Montagov, this is unacceptable, Juliet declared tightly. This was all too reminiscent, too wistful, too much. Leave before you get shot. Even with his face shrouded in the shadows, Roma managed to convey a frown that reached Juliet with maximum effect. He looked around, seeing no one in the gardens below him. Who will shoot me? I'm going to shoot you, Juliet snapped. No, you're not. Open the door, Dora Gaea. Juliet jerked back, horrified not by the command, 
but by his term of endearment. With delay, Roma seemed to realize too what had slipped out, his eyes widening a fraction, but he didn't fumble or take it back. He merely stared at her in wait, like he hadn't just pulled out a relic from their past, one that they had smashed to pieces. The door stays closed, Juliet said coldly. What do you want? Roma hopped off the railing, his shoes landing on the balcony tiles with a soft sound. When he came up close against the glass, Juliet noted a deep scratch marring his jaw, and she wondered if he'd stumbled here right after a fight. It was almost enough to have her reach for her gun and really send him running, but then, quietly, Roma whispered, I want to save my sister. Something inside of Juliet came loose. Her hard eyes softened the smallest of fractions. How is Elisa? she asked. They've tied her up at the hospital like some asylum patient, Roma replied. His eyes were focused on his hands. He kept flipping them over, palm, back, palm, back, searching for something that wasn't there. She tried to go for her throat again when she regained consciousness, so they're injecting her with something to keep her asleep. They're keeping her asleep until there's some way to cure this madness. Roma looked up. There was a madness, a desperation, in his own eyes. I need your help, Juliet. All the trails from my end have gone cold. There's nothing else I can chase, nowhere I can go, no one I can call. You, however, I know you know something. Juliet didn't immediately respond. She stood there unmoving, wrestling with the pit in her stomach, and realizing she was uncertain if this feeling was still hatred, or fear. Fear that if the madness went on, she too would find herself in Roma's position, watching someone she loved die. Fear that by mere consideration of Roma in such a sympathetic manner, she had crossed the line. The problem with hatred was that when the initial emotion weakened, the responses still remained. The clenched fists and hot veins, the blurred vision and quickened pulse. And in such remains, Juliet was not in control of what they might develop into. Like yearning. You ask me for help. Juliet said quietly, and yet, how much blood is on your hands, Roma? In the time I was gone, how many of my people asked you for help, for mercy, right before you shot them? Roma's eyes were wholly black under the moonlight. I have nothing to say to that, he answered. The blood feud was the blood feud. This is something utterly new in itself. If we don't help each other, we may both die out. I am the one with information. Juliet warned, her skin pricking uncomfortably. Try to refrain from making sweeping generalizations about us both. You have information, but I have the other half of the city, Roma countered. If you act alone, that's half of Shanghai you cannot work with. If I act alone, I cannot enter any scarlet territory. Think, Juliet, when the madness is hitting us both, there is no telling in which territory the answers will be found. A chill swept through her room, bitter and cold and correct. Juliet tried to ignore it. She forced a laugh, the sound hard. As you're proving right now, I don't think a lack of permission is stopping you from prancing into my territory. Juliet. Roma pressed his hands against the glass. His pleading stare was utterly, utterly unguarded. Please, she's my sister. God. Juliet had to look away. She couldn't bear it. The heaviness twisting her heart was undeserved. Any vulnerability that Roma Montagov showed was an act, a carefully constructed facade he would bide his time with until the chance came to strike. She knew this. But perhaps Juliet would never learn. Perhaps her memories of Roma would pull her toward ruin, unless she reached into her own chest and ripped out all remains of softness. For Elisa, Juliet managed roughly finally turning her gaze back, and for all the little girls in this city falling victim to a game they never asked to play, I will help you. But do your part, Roma. I help you and you help me find the solution to this madness as quickly as possible. Roma exhaled, breathing relief and gratitude onto the glass. She watched him carefully, watched the tension drain from his shoulders and the terror in his eyes meld into hope. She wondered how much of it was true and how much of it was for her benefit, so she would think she was making the right decision. Deal. This could ruin her. 
it could ruin everything. But what mattered now was not Juliet, nor her feelings, it was finding a solution. If the possibility of saving her people meant risking her reputation with them, then it was a sacrifice she had to make. Who else would make it? Who else but Juliet? Okay, Juliet conceded quietly. She supposed there was no going back. I have Jean Goutai's home address. My next move was breaking in and rummaging around, but she shrugged, the gesture so forcefully casual on her part that she almost believed it. We can go there together to begin, if you wish. Yes, Roma said. If he nodded any harder, his head might roll right off. Yes. Tomorrow, then, Juliet decided. Suddenly the memories of their past together, the one she had spent four years trying so hard to forget, came barreling into her mind with full force. She had no choice but to invoke them, ignoring the clenching tightness in her lungs. Meet me at the statue. The statue, a small stone rendering of a crying woman, was a forgotten artifact hidden in an unnamed park in the international settlement. For years ago, Roma and Juliet had stumbled upon it by chance and spent an afternoon trying to work out its intentions and origins. Juliet had insisted it was Niobe, the woman in Greek mythology who had cried so much after her children were slain that the gods turned her to stone. Roma had maintained it was La Llorona, the weeping woman in Latin American folklore who cried for the child she had killed. They had never decided on an answer. If Roma was surprised or taken aback by her reference to the statue, he didn't show it. He only asked, when? Sunrise. It was only at that which Roma appeared mildly concerned. Sunrise. That's ambitious. The earlier the better, Juliet insisted. She winced. It reduces our chances of being seen together. This goes without saying, but no one can know we're collaborating. We would. Both be dead if they knew, Roma finished. I know. Until sunrise, then. Juliet watched him swing his legs back over the railing of the balcony, hanging along the elaborate metal designs like another piece of the sculpting. Under the low-hanging light of the moon, Roma was a black and white study of sorrow. Roma paused. Good night, Juliet. Then he was gone, his lithe shadow working quickly down the exterior wall and darting through the gardens. One jump and he was over the gate, off the Scarlet Gang's grounds and on his way back to his own world. Juliet drew her curtains tightly, adjusting the fabric until not a sliver of silver was shining through. Only then did she allow herself to emit a long exhale, pushing the moonlight out of her room and its changing faces out of her heart. 20. At sunrise, it was early enough that the ports were quiet, the waves rocking against the floating boardwalk. It was early enough that the smell of the wind was still sweet, untainted by the smog of morning factories, absent of the aromas that rose from the fried food and sloppy soups cooked in the stalls pushed upon the streets. Unfortunately, it still wasn't early enough to avoid a nationalist rally. Juliet halted in her step, freezing on the pavement underneath a swaying green tree. Tamada, she cursed under her breath. What are? Kuomintang, Roma answered before Juliet could finish the question. Juliet shot him a dirty look when he stopped beside her. Did he think her incapable of spotting the little sons on their hats? It wasn't exactly an obscure logo. The Kuomintang party, and their nationalists, was growing incredibly popular. I know, Juliet said, rolling her eyes. I was going to ask what they're doing. This is my city. I don't need you educating me. Roma cast her a glance ask you. Is it though? He hadn't even put any venom behind his tone, and yet those few words sent a dagger hurtling right through Juliet's heart. Is it though? How many times had she asked herself that question in Manhattan? How many times had she climbed up to her building's rooftop and gazed out on New York's skyline, refusing to let herself love it, because loving one meant losing another, and losing Shanghai meant losing everything. Now what is that supposed to mean, she asked tightly. Roma looked almost amused by the question. He made a vague gesturing motion toward her, indicating her dress, her shoes. Come on, Juliet. I've been here a lot longer than you have. 
you're an American girl at heart. And the implication of the words left unspoken were clear, do us all a favor, and go back. Ah yes, she muttered. The sharpness in her chest only twisted deeper. Me and my American democracy, how am I managing in such a climate? Before Roma could rebut anything further, Juliet started walking again, veering off their intended route. Instead of passing the rally gathered about the wide road, she hurried into a nearby alleyway, barely pausing for Roma to follow after her. He registered the change quickly. Soon the two of them were picking their way through trash bags and overturned food carts, scrunching their noses at stray animals and grimacing at the frequent puddles of blood. While they walked through the city's back roads, they were content to lapse into silence, content to pretend the other was not present. Then Roma whirled around, spinning so fast to face the scene behind them that Juliet immediately assumed they were under attack. What? she snapped, pivoting back too. She grabbed her pistol, then pointed wildly, waiting for something to jump out. What is it? Except Roma remained weaponless. He merely searched the street behind them, his brow scrunched. I thought I heard something, he said. They waited. A bird dived into a garbage can. An exterior pipe gushed dirty water on the streets. I don't see anything, Juliet said quietly, putting her weapon away. Roma frowned. He waited another second, but the scene was still. My mistake. I apologize. He straightened his sleeve cuffs. Let us continue. Hesitantly, Juliet turned and started to walk again. They were not far now from the address that Kathleen had given her. This was a familiar part of the city. The goosebumps, however, remained on her arms. He's only being paranoid, Juliet tried to reassure herself. The fear of being spotted together was already keeping both of them on their toes. Juliet had her coat collar pulled high to shield her face. Roma wore his hat low over his forehead which was a good decision when he presently looked so unkempt that any onlooker on the street might run in the other direction upon sighting him. In the bright daylight, the cuts on his face were stark against his pale skin. Judging by the shadows beneath his eyes, Juliet would not be surprised if he had not slept last night, likely tossing and turning in worry over Elisa. Juliet shook her head. She needed to clear her mind of her assumptions. For all she knew, he could also have been out killing scarlets. It's one of these buildings, Juliet said when they came upon the correct street. The houses here were dilapidated and crowded, the spaces between each building barely wide enough for a child to squeeze through. This area wasn't far from the French concession, yet a tangible line could be drawn as a border between the two districts, and it was clear which half this street fell on. A long rectangular structure lay half crumbled under Juliet's feet. Perhaps a grandiose village gate had stood here once, etched with golden characters to welcome its incomers, but it was gone now, torn apart for cityscapes and depravity. Are you sure this is the right place? Roma asked. Surely a newspaper job pays more than enough to move elsewhere. Of all people, Roma Montagog, Juliet said, you should understand the importance of image. One and the same, with the people, among the people. The communists never stopped preaching such ideals. If the common worker had to suffer, then Jean Gutai must too, else what other basis did he have for their respect? Juliet started toward the building her address indicated. Then two paces away from the main entrance, she abruptly paused. She pointed. Look. Roma stifled his sharp breath. Insects. A collection of their deadened husks lying out in the open by the entrance of this apartment block. If this didn't scream guilty, Juliet didn't know what did. Pulse thudding, she pushed at the apartment building's entry door. The rusty lock came free, and the door swung open. Juliet gestured for Roma to move faster. They worked their way up the stairs, grimacing at the cramped conditions. The stairs staggered up the building along one wall then trickled straight into a parallel hallway with four doors not so far removed from one another. North, then south, north, then south, they trekked up the stairs, passed the doors on the floor, then moved up the next set of stairs, continuing the process in a dizzying sort of pattern. 
Roma was more used to this, Juliet was not. She hadn't lived within the city limits for years, nor felt the shift of the floorboard sigh under her feet as the entire structure seemed to heave. Which apartment is it? Roma asked. He sniffed as they passed a windowsill on the third floor's landing, eyeing the flowerpots pushed right to the edge, one little nudge away from shattering on the pavement below. Juliet only stuck her index finger up at the sky. They kept climbing, up, up, up to the very top, reaching a floor with a sole door waiting right where the stairs ended. They paused. They exchanged a look. He's not home, Juliet assured Roma before he could ask. She bent down on one knee, producing her thin, needle-like dagger from the folds of her dress. I scanned the calendar in his office. Meetings with important people all day today. Only as soon as Juliet inserted the dagger into the lock, her tongue poking out from her mouth in concentration, she heard the very distinct, undeniable echo of footsteps shuffling inside the apartment and toward the front door. Juliet. Roma hissed, rushing forward. Juliet bolted up, stashing the knife into her sleeve. She held her arm out to stop Roma in his tracks, gathering herself just in time before the door flung open, and an old man blinked at them with filmy, squinting eyes. He was surely pushing sixty, frazzled and weary-looking, as if he hadn't gotten enough sleep since he came out from the womb. Hello, the man said, confused. Juliet thought fast. They could salvage this. This wasn't beyond saving. Good morning. We're from the university, she exclaimed, dropping into another dialect, when's Hounese, so promptly that Roma jolted back the smallest inch, unable to conceal his astonishment at her quick switch. Are you well on this fine morning? The man leaned his ear forward, grimacing. In Shanghainese, he replied, speak Bendi Hua, would you, girl? I don't understand. Wenzhou was a city only days of travel to the south of Shanghai, but its local dialect was so incomprehensible to outsiders that Juliet would never have learned it had Nurse not taught her. Nurse used to say that the closest sound resembling Wen's Haunese was not a neighboring tongue like Shanghainese, but the chirping of songbirds. In a city not only bustling with foreigners, but also native Chinese from every corner of the country, most civilians shared a language, but they did not share the same way of speaking it. Two Chinese merchants could carry on an entire conversation with each one speaking his own dialect. They didn't need to meet in the middle. They only needed to understand. Juliet, however, hadn't expected the old man to understand her at all, she had only one goal. Before he could squint closely at her face and recognize her for the heir of the Scarlet Gang, she had to make him think she was a careless immigrant girl from elsewhere. My apologies. Juliet switched to Shanghainese, task accomplished. As I was saying, we're from Shanghai University and terribly excited to see you today. We're hoping to found the first student union club and need some advice. Is Mr. Zhang home to speak? The old man straightened, brushing his hands over his knitted cardigan. Juliet expected him to turn them away, to tell them to come back some other time, so they could skitter out of sight and mark this off as a temporary failure. As long as they didn't raise suspicion, they could come back. As long as this man didn't pay too much attention to their faces and thought them regular university students who weren't worth remembering. She didn't expect the man to clear his throat imperiously and say, I am Mr. Zhang. Roma and Juliet exchanged a perplexed glance. Er, no, you're not. The man's posture sagged. He blew out a breath and abandoned his assuming air. Fine. I am Chi Ren, Mr. Zhang's personal assistant. You may come in. Juliet blinked, first in confusion over this man's peculiarity, then in surprise, that he was inviting them in instead of turning them away. As she stood there, she felt a nudge from Roma, asking why she wasn't moving when Mr. Chi turned on his heel and shuffled away on his hard slippers. This wasn't her original plan, but Juliet was nothing if not adaptable. Come on, she muttered to Roma. They hurried in after Mr. Chi. How shall I address you? Mr. Chi called over his shoulder. Juliet didn't miss a beat. Julia. And this is Mr. Montague. Lovely couches you have. 
she sat down before he could invite her to. Mr. Chi, frowning, moved aside a variety of folders on the nearby table, turning them over so his two-character name and Labor Daily's watermark were face down. Will this take some time? If that works for you, Juliet replied brightly. Mr. Chi sighed. I will go make some tea. As soon as Mr. Chi had moved far enough into the adjoining kitchen, busy with his task of boiling water, Roma turned to Juliet and hissed, Montague. Really? Shut up, Juliet hissed back. I couldn't think of anything else and I didn't want to pause suspiciously. You're fluent in Russian, and that's the best you could come up with? Roma asked, flabbergasted. What is a Montague? It sounds Italian. There are Italian communists. Not in Shanghai. Juliet was prevented from responding when Mr. Chi stuck his head back in and asked what sort of tea they wanted. Once he returned deeper into the kitchen, satisfied with their polite answers that anything would do, Juliet ducked her head and said, Okay, we can still do what we came here to do. You must distract him. Say again? Roma demanded. You're going to leave me here to entertain? Is that a problem? Yes, it's a problem. Roma leaned back in the couch, his hands placed in his lap. How do I know you're going to share whatever information you find if it doesn't benefit you? He was perfectly valid to suspect her, but that didn't mean Juliet liked the insinuation she would sabotage this operation. Stop arguing with me, she replied. Our usual job description is intimidation and gunfire. If we can even pull this off, we should count ourselves lucky. Frankly, that's. Do you wish to save Elisa, or not?